Welcome back. In this class, of course, we're going to continue the solution of Dice Corporation, our statement of cash flows problem. And you remember when we left off, we had begun our analysis by proving out the change in retained earnings because I feel that's the most logical place to start. So we'd proven out the change in retained earnings, so we had x that out. Now we move on to the next step. Once you prove out the change in retained earnings, now you go to the additional information. If you look at the third bullet down, we've already dealt with the first two bullets. The third bullet says equipment costing 400000 having a carrying amount of 150 was sold in year two for $150,000. let us start with an entry. I think it's always good to start with an entry to get you organized. We know that they would have debited cash for what they collected, 150000 we know they would credit equipment for the original cost, 400000 And because they said that the carrying amount of the equipment was 150000 there must have been 250000 of accumulated depreciation on that equipment. So we'll debit accumulated depreciation, 250000 In other words, there was no gain or loss on sale. All right, so you put that entry down. What's the first thing you notice about that? There's cash. Anytime you see cash in an entry, it's got to go somewhere. What kind of cash is that? Is it operating? No. It's happy, isn't it? It's PP and E. It's happy. So you're going to go to your second big T account, which is investing, and you're going to post that $150,000 debit right there. That's cash provided by an investing activity because investing always makes me happy. Buy or sell held to maturity. Buy or sell available for sale. Buy or sell PP and E. Buy or sell equity investments. That's when I go there. Let's post the rest of it. We go to plant and equipment. We post that $400,000 credit. Notice, we have not explained the $700,000 change in that account. Leave it open. And now you go to your T account on accumulated depreciation. You post that debit of $250,000. Notice now we have proven there is some activity in that account. The net change was zero. But once we post that $250,000, to accumulated depreciation, now we know there is some activity in that account. There's going to have to be more activity because the net change was zero. Let's do the next one. A held maturity security was sold for 135000 There were no other transactions affecting held maturity securities. Well, let's do an entry. We know they would have debited cash for the 135000 what would they credit to held to maturity? Well, look at your T account. If you look at your T account on held to maturity, that account during the year went down by 100000 This must have been the transaction because they said there were no other transactions that affected held to maturity. So they would credit held to maturity, we assume, for the 100000 And the point is, there's a $35,000 gain on sale. What's the first thing you notice about that entry? Bob, there's cash. The minute you see cash, it's got to go somewhere. Is it operating cash? No. Is it happy? Is it happy? It is, right? The H in happy is buy or sell held to maturity. It is happy. The H in happy is buy or sell held to maturity. So you're going to go to your second big T account, which is investing activity, and you're going to post that $135,000 Debit right there. That's cash provided by an investing activity. Because investing always makes me happy. Buy or sell held to maturity. Buy or sell available for sale. Buy or sell PP&E. Buy or sell equity investments. That's when I go there. Let's post the rest of it. I go to held to maturity securities. I post that $100,000 credit to that account. We've explained the net change in that account. Exit out. How about the gain? How about the gain? It's operating. That's an operating item. You go to your operating T account and post that $35,000 gain as a credit to operating. Remember, when you put an entry down, everything gets posted somewhere. You can see what cash flows is like. You have to be meticulous. So you put an entry down and everything gets posted somewhere. So that gain is an operating item. Now, that might bother you, but let me just explain what's going on here. Just think for a second why we're doing this. 
you can't show this 35000 as both a gain on your income statement and cash provided by an investing activity. You'd be double counting it. Doesn't that make sense? You, got, you can't show that $35,000 gain on sale of HTM as both $135,000 cash provided by an investing activity and also a $35,000 gain on your income statement. You'd be double counting it. But you don't have to think all that through. Just post it. You post it as a credit to operating. But as I say, when you put an entry down, everything has to be posted somewhere. The final bullet says 10,000 shares of common stock were issued for $22 a share. So we have to assume they would have made their normal entry. They would have debited cash for 10,000 shares at 22, 220,000. They would credit common stock for par value, 10,000 shares at par 10, 100,000, and credit APIC for the rest, 120,000. What's the first thing you notice about that entry? Well, it's cash. It's got to go somewhere. Is it operating? No. Is it happy? No. It's Prince Divots, isn't it? The I and it is issue stock. So you're going to go to your third big T account, which is financing activity, and you're going to post that $220,000 debit where it belongs. Cash provided by a financing activity. Because I'm always financing for Prince Divots. Prince is debt principal. Div, pay dividends. I is issue stock. TS is treasury stock transactions. Let's post the rest of it. We go to common stock. We post that $100,000 credit. We've explained the change in that account. We can exit out. We post the credit to additional paid in capital of $120,000. we have explained the change in that account. Exit out. So now we have dealt with all the additional information. Now, once you have dealt with all the additional information, there's only one step left. Now, before we do this together, let me explain that there are good, solid accounting reasons for everything that we're about to do. And we're not going to spend time going through all the ins and outs of each thing we're about to do because I'm not sure it would be that valuable in the long run. In other words, when we're done with this class, if you end up thinking at the end, if there's a debit here, I credit this. If there's a credit here, I debit that. That's fine. That's deliberate on my part. I want you to know that I have deliberately chosen a method that is somewhat mechanical. Why do you think I did that? Timing. One of my constant worries is that my students could be in the test. They get a simulation on cash flows. They're behind their time, and they have to do this as quickly as possible. So I've deliberately chosen a method that is somewhat mechanical, so you can do it more quickly. So we're not going to get bogged down in all the ins and outs of why we're doing each thing. Let's just do the mechanical approach. At the end, I want you to get mechanical. Let's, let's go to the accounts we have not explained. Remember, once we, once we put an X to every account, we're really basically done. Let's go to the accounts we've not explained. The first one, available for sale securities. That went, that increased by a net debit of 300,000. First of all, let me ask you, is that, that account, is it operating, investing, or financing? It's investing, right? It's the A in happy. Buy or sell, available for sale. So we're talking about an investing item. Now here's, here's the mechanical approach. You say if during the year that increased by a debit of 300,000, then I'll go to investing, do the opposite. I'll credit investing, 300,000. I'm assuming that was 300,000 cash used in an investing activity. See, at the end, just do the opposite. In health, available for sales securities, increased by a debit of 300,000. Then I go to investing, I do the opposite. I credit investing, 300,000. I have to assume that was 300,000 cash used in an investing activity. Let's do another one. There was no net change, two accounts receivable. Here's one, inventory. First of all, operating, investing, or financing. It's an operating item. It has to do with cost of goods sold. So my thinking is what? Inventory increased by a net debit of 80,000. I go to operating, do the opposite, credit operating, 80,000. Held to maturity securities, we took care of that. We've explained the change. Now, here's an interesting one. Here's a little tricky one. Property, plant, and equipment. We know that during the year, plant assets increased by a net debit of 700000 right? That was the net change. But all we saw in our journal entries was a credit of 400000 
Now think this through with me. The only way that plant assets could have increased by a net debit of 700000 we have to infer there must have been another debit net account of one million one. Again, if plant assets increased by a net debit of 700000 and all we saw in our journal entries was a credit of 400000 we have to infer that there must have been, there had to be, another debit net account of a million one. So we debit plant assets a million one, and we credit investing, PP&E. It's happy. We credit investing a million one. I have to assume that was one million one of cash used in an investing activity. Now, if you look at your T account, we actually ha we finally have one. Here's what you have in investing: 150,000 cash provided by selling equipment, 135,000 cash provided by selling HTM, 300,000 cash used to buy available for sale, and a million one cash used to buy property, plant, and equipment. If you if you work it out. Net cash used. How do I know it's used? It's on the credit side. Remember, the debit side is provided. The credit side is used. Net cash used in investing activity, 1,115,000. So we can answer number two. Number two, what was the net cash used in investing activity? The answer is A, 1,115,000. But you see why we're using this technique? Because the exam plays games with you. We didn't know about that million one. We had to find it. There's missing information. And of course, you're not going to get, in your, in your exam, you're not going to get multiple choice this involved. This is more like a simulation where we have to work out operating, investing, and financing. You won't get multiple choice this involved. This is more like a simulation. But as I say, the reason why this technique helps you is that the exam plays games with you. There's missing information. We had to find that million one. All right, let's move on. Here's another interesting one. Accumulated depreciation. First of all, operating, investing, or financing. It's an operating item. We're trying to find the depreciation expense for the year. Now, we know the net change to accumulated depreciation was zero. But in our entries, we had to post a debit of 250000 What is the only way the net change to that account could be zero? We have to infer there must have been another credit in that account. There had to be another credit to accumulated depreciation of 250000 for the net change to be zero. That must have been the depreciation expense for the year. So that was a credit to accumulated depreciation 250. Go to operating, do the opposite. Debit operating, 250000 You had to find the depreciation expense. As I say, this t technique helps you because the exam plays games with you. There's missing information. How about goodwill? Goodwill went from 100000 down to 90. Didn't goodwill decrease by a net credit of 10,000? Why did that? Why did goodwill decrease by 10,000? Amortization? Was there amortization? I hope you're thinking, no, Bob. Goodwill is not amortized. It's tested for impairment, at least annually. So if goodwill went down, there must have been an impairment loss. Again, if goodwill went down, there must have been an impairment loss on the income statement. So it's an operating item. So that went down by a credit of 10. Go to operating, do the opposite, debit operating, 10. Next, accounts payable. What kind of, is it operating, investing, or financing? Operating, again, has to do with cost of goods sold. Now, we know accounts payable increased by a net credit of 105000 Go to operating, do the opposite, debit operating, 105. We've got another one. We can now do operating. Here's what you have in operating. We have the net income 690 on the debit side. On the credit side, we have the $35,000 gain on equipment, the $80,000 increase in inventory. Then on the debit side, we have adding back the depreciation expense of 250, the impairment loss of 10, and the increase in accounts payable 105. Do out the math. Net cash provided by operating activity 940,000. So that gives us number one. Number one, the answer is C. So we've got that one. Now, there's only one account remaining that we have not explained, and that is short-term debt. And you know it must be financing because we've explained operating, we've explained investing, we're done with those. So, Bob, it must be a financing item, and I know you're right, but would you please tell me this? What part of Prince Divots would that be? That's right. It's debt principal. I haven't really seen that yet. If short-term debt went up, they must have 
borrowed debt principles. It's the prints in Prince divots. All right, so short-term debt increased by net credit of 325. Go to financing, do the opposite. Debit financing, 325. Now you have the other one. Net cash provided by financing, 305,000. So the answer to number three is A. And we've answered all three questions. Now, also in your viewer's guide, we gave you the actual statement. I'd like you to look at it. In your viewer's guide, you'll see the actual statement of cash flows for Dice Corporation for the year end of December 31, year two. And I want you to look at it. Notice if you actually had to do the statement, you just pull the information right out of the T accounts. Look at the first, look at the first section. Cash flows from operating activities. We just pulled this right out of the T account. We've got the net income, 690. We took out the gain on HTM. We took out the increase in inventory. We added back the depreciation. We added back the goodwill impairment. And we added back the increase in accounts payable. Net cash provided by operating activity, 940000 Look at cash flows from investing activities. We have proceeds from the sale of equipment, 150. Proceeds from the sale of HTM, 135. Payments to buy available for sale securities, 300000 Payments to purchase property, plant, and equipment, 1 million. One, net cash used in investing activity, 1 million, 115. And then finally, cash flow from financing activities. You have the 240,000 cash used to pay a dividend. Proceeds from the sale of stock, 220. Proceeds from the issue of debt, 325. Net cash provided by financing activities, 305,000. So notice if you have to actually do the statement, you just pull the information right out of the T accounts. And of course, in a case-based simulation, they might have you actually do a statement. You know, they could give you the outline of a statement, have you fill it in, something like that. It's possible. So you have to know how to do the statement. And if you're in a situation where you actually have to do the statement, you just pull the information right out of the, the T accounts. Now you notice, did you notice this? And I bet you did. If I take a $940,000 debit, a $1,115,000 credit, and a $305,000 debit, it all comes out to $130,000 debit. And what was that? That was the increase in cash for the year. We knew when we started that cash increased by $130,000 debit. And notice it does reconcile. If you take a $940,000 debit and a $1,115,000 credit and a $305,000 debit, it does come out to the change in cash, $130,000 increase in cash. And then the way you finish the statement, you show cash and cash equivalents January 1, the 100,000, cash and cash equivalents December 31, 230,000. And that finishes the statement. Now, what you need to do is get some practice on this technique, because it does take practice, but you'll find once you get the technique down, it's, it's not as time consuming as you might think it is either. You get better and better at it. You get faster at it as well. As I say, I wanted, I wanted you to have this technique because of timing. Because that's my main concern. You could be, you could have a simulation on cash flows. It's possible. And you could be behind your time. It's possible. So you want to work quickly. So I want you to get your, I want you to get some practice on this technique. If you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see questions four and five. Car company. Now, what I want you to do is get this set done before the next class, okay? Be don't, don't just go right to the next class and we'll do it together. That, that's not as good for you. What you need to do is use this technique. You know, set up the T accounts, do the journal entries. It's not, it's not as detailed as the set that we just did. But I want you to set up the T accounts, do the journal entries, do the technique, answer four and five before you go to the next class. And then in the next class, we'll go through it together. And I'll see you then. Keep studying. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of cash flows. And you remember that in our last class, I asked you to do the set of questions on Car Inc. before coming to this class. And I hope you really did that. Because you need to practice this technique that we went through together. So if you looked at this set, they want two things. They want the cash used in investing activity 
They want the cash provided by operating activity. So right away, you set down two T accounts. One for investing. Remember, investing makes you happy. Buy or sell, held to maturity. Buy or sell, available for sale. Buy or sell, PP&E. Buy or sell, equity investments. You know that's when you use that section. And then you set up a T account for operating activity. And remember, that's your income statement section. And it starts on the debit side with net income. You got to put that in. The net income for the year, 300000 And we know net income provides cash from operations. It doesn't use it. So we put the net income on the debit side. That's what starts off that section, what starts off that T account. What's the next step? That's what I wanted you to get practice on. So now what do I do? Now you put down a small T account for every account they give you in the balance sheet, except for cash, and put the net change in each one of those accounts. So let's do that. They have equipment. In the last year, equipment increased by a net debit of $25,000. Put that $25,000 debit change in that account and double underline it. Accumulated depreciation increased by a net credit of $40,000. Put that $40,000 net credit increase in that account, double underline that, and notes payable increased by a net credit of $30,000. Put that net credit increase in that account and double underline that. All right, so what so now what do you do? So you get used you have to get used to the flow, the steps. Now what do you do? You put down a journal entry for every transaction they describe. There's two of them. Do the first one. They say during the year, car sold equipment costing twenty five thousand. So we'll start our entry. We know they would have credited equipment twenty five thousand with accumulated depreciation of twelve. So we know they would have debited accumulated depreciation twelve thousand. With a gain of five, we know they would have credited gain five thousand. The point is, it's now a plug. You had to plug the cash. The cash must have been a debit of eighteen thousand. That's why it's hard to beat entries, because this is an exam. They play games with you. There are things that are missing. That's why this approach hopefully will get you to the point where you're being meticulous and you're finding the things you need to find, because it is like a little treasure hunt. There are things missing. They're playing, you know, little mind games with you. They didn't give you the cash. So by putting the entry down, you plug the cash. Now you look at that entry, you say, well, this cash, it's got to be, it's got to go somewhere. What kind of cash is that? It's PP&E. It's happy. So, you know, you're going to go to your second big T account, investing activity, and you're going to post that $18,000 debit right there. That's cash provided by an investing activity. Now let's post the rest of it. We go to equipment. We post that $25,000 credit to equipment. Have we explained the change to equipment? No. Equipment increased by a $25,000 debit. All we've seen is a $25,000 credit. Be careful. We go to accumulated depreciation. We post that $12,000 debit. We have not explained the change in that account. We leave it open. How about the gain? That's an operating item. You post the gain as a credit to operating. Remember, once you put an entry down, everything gets posted to a T account somewhere. Now, there's another transaction. They say, at year end, car purchased equipment costing $50,000 for $30,000 cash and a, for, excuse me, $20,000 cash and a $30,000 note. So you put the entry down. They would have debited equipment for the $50,000. Credit cash, $20,000. Credit, credit notes payable, $30,000. That's the entry. You put the entry down, you say, all oh, this cash. And, of course, it's PP&E. Happy. So you go to your investing activity, post that $20,000 credit. The fact is, that's cash used in an investing activity. So now we have one. Net cash used in investing. You have an $18,000 debit and a $20,000 credit in that T account. So the net cash used. In investing is 2000 So the answer to the first question is A. All right, now we have done the entry. We have to post everything, though. Let's post the debit to equipment. We're going to post that $50,000 debit to equipment. Notice we've now explained the change in that account. You can exit out. We post the $30,000 credit to notes payable. We've explained the change in that account. We X that out. 
So we've done the entries. We posted everything. What's the last step? Well, you circle all the accounts you have not explained. The only account you have not explained is accumulated depreciation. Now, help me analyze this. Don't we know that during the year, accumulated depreciation increased by a net credit of 40000 But all we saw in our journal entries was a debit of 12000 to that account. That's what we posted, a debit of twelve. The only way that accumulated depreciation could have increased by a net credit of 40000 we have to infer there had to be another credit in that account of 52000 That must have been the depreciation expense for the year. So often in the exam, they make you find it. So I'll go over it again. There was a $40,000 net credit change in accumulated depreciation, but all we saw in our journal entries was a debit to accumulated depreciation of 12000 The only way that account could have increased by a net credit of, of 40000 is by having another credit in that account. We have to infer there had to be another credit in that account of 52000 That must have been the depreciation expense for the year. Now, I know they gave it to you. I'm well aware of that. Here they said depreciation expense for the year was 52000 they, they actually mentioned it, but the exam may not. So often, they'll say nothing, and you're, you have to find the depreciation expense. So that was a credit to accumulated depreciation, 52000 We go to operating, do the opposite. Remember, at the end, you do the opposite. We're going to debit operating, 52000 That gives us the other one. Net cash provided by operating activity, 347000 so the answer to the second question is B. Now, let's do some more questions on cash flows. In the viewer's guide for this class, let's go to question number one, tab company. If you go to the bottom, they want to know in tabs year seven, statement of cash flows, what was net cash used in financing activity? So we could put down a T account. You don't have to. Put down a T account for financing activity. And what do we know? We know you're always financing for prints, divots. Prints is debt principal. Div is pay dividends. I is issue stock. GS is treasury stock transactions. So let's go through it. Payment for the early retirement of long-term bonds. You go out and retire bonds. Is that Prince Divot? Sure. You're paying down debt principal. If you retire bonds, bonds are a debt security. So if you retire bonds, you're paying down debt principal. That's the Prince in Prince Divot. Now, what number would we use here? The 740000 or the 750000 Right, 750. We don't care about the carrying value of the bonds. We're analyzing cash here. The cash they paid out to retire the bonds, 750000 So we'll put that in as a credit to our T account, that's cash used in a financing activity because it's Prince, it's debt principal, the Prince in Prince Divot. Now the second one, the dividends, we know that's the div in Divot. Notice that they declared this dividend in year six. We don't care when they declared it. If the cash went out in year seven, that's 62,000 of cash used in year seven for a financing activity. So, they, so put that on the credit side, 62000 What about the carrying amount of convertible preferred stock converted to common stock? Well, if preferred stock, if preferred stock is converted to common stock, that doesn't affect cash. That's a non-cash item, and we'll say more about that in a minute. So that's non-cash. Don't worry about that. Now, the last one, the treasury stock, we know that's the TS on divot. So it is a financing item. Do we, do we use the 95000 or the 86000 That's right, the 95000 We don't care about, we don't know, we don't care about the carrying value of the Treasury shares. We're analyzing cash. So that's 95000 cash provided by selling Treasury stock, the financing activity. You put that on the debit side, now we have the answer. Net cash used in financing activity, 717000 Answer A. Now, I want to go back to the Convertible preferred converted to common. We agree that doesn't affect cash. There's a name for this. These type of transactions are called non-cash investing and financing activities. You're going to have to know these. Non-cash investing and financing activities. There's four big ones. Make sure you know them. The exam hits these a lot. 
Number one, this one. Preferred stock converted to common stock. Preferred stock converted to common stock, that is a non-cash investing and financing activity. Number two, bonds converted to stock. So if you see convertible bonds converted to stock, that is a non-cash investing and financing activity. Number three, if you see a straight exchange of debt to property. In other words, you see a company issue a note in exchange for an asset. If there's a straight exchange of debt for property, a note exchange for an asset, that is a non-cash investing and financing activity. And then finally, a straight exchange of stock for property. You see a company issue its stock for an asset. Just a straight exchange of stock for property. That is a non-cash investing and financing activity. Now let me make a point. Now that you have the list, you've got to know those four. These non-cash investing and financing activities, make sure you know the four. These non-cash investing and financing activities are not in the statement of cash flows. They're not in the body of the statement, but they get footnoted at the bottom of the statement as a supplemental disclosure. That's what these are. These are a supplemental disclosure on the statement of cash flows. Now, there's more. Make sure you remember these. Stock dividends, stock splits, retained earnings appropriations. Again, stock dividends, stock splits, retained earnings appropriations, and sometimes they'll mention cash flow per share. Things like stock dividends, stock splits, retained earnings appropriations. If they mention cash flow per share, these are not in the statement of cash flows, and they're not a supplemental disclosure in the statement of cash flows either. So stock dividends, stock splits, retained earnings appropriations, cash flow per share, they're not in the body of the statement of cash flows, and they're not a supplemental disclosure in the statement of cash flows. Let's do another question. Number two, men. Number two says, men purchased a three-month U.S. Treasury bill. Men's policy is to treat as cash equivalent all highly liquid investments with an original maturity of three months or less when purchased. This is nice of them to remind you of that three-month rule. Remember, highly liquid securities, certificates of deposit, treasury bills, any commercial paper with an original maturity of three months or less, you treat it the same as cash. Just treat it as if it were cash. Those are cash equivalents. They want to know, how would this purchase be reported in the statement of cash flows? I wanted to do this question with you because some students, they get tricked by a question like this, and they'll go for A as cash flows from operating activities because they may remember from class that, well, Bob said if you buy or sell trading securities, that's cash flows from operating activities, and they jump for A. Remember, this is not a trading security. It's a cash equivalent, so don't make that, don't make that jump. They never said it was a trading security. It is true that you buy or sell trading securities, that's cash flows from operating activities. But they never said this was a trading security. It's a cash equivalent. You know what helps with this one? Think of an entry. What journal entry would you make if you go out and you buy a cash equivalent? What's the entry? Debit, cash, credit, cash. It doesn't have to be reported at all, and the answer is D. You're just moving around cash to different places. It's, like, it's no different in effect than moving cash from one bank account to another bank account. If you go out, you purchase a cash equivalent. It's the same concept as moving cash from bank A to bank B. On the statement of cash flows, it's not reported at all. So watch out for that. Let's do three and four. Reed Company. In number three, they want the cash used in investing activities. And in number four, they want the cash provided by financing activities. Now, we have a whole list of items to deal with here. Together, let's just go through the list. Let's label each one. O for operating, I for investing, F for financing. How about the gain on equipment? Of course, that's an operating item. Put an O there. How about the proceeds from the sale of equipment? Well, that's PPE, PP&E. That's happy. We know that's investing. How about the purchase of AS Inc.'s bond? and they're going to be an available for sale security. If you buy an investment in bonds that will be an available for sale security, that's the A in happy. That's investing. How about the amortization of a discount? That's an operating item. 
Now with the dividend, now we now we know that's the div and divots. It's a financing item. Do we care what they declared or what they paid? We don't care about declared. We're analyzing tax. Just put a line through declared. So there's a financing item. And then of course the Treasury stock, that's the TS on divots. We know that's financing. See now you can really now you can answer both questions. We have two investing items. We have ten thousand cash provided by selling equipment, one hundred and eighty thousand cash used to buy available for sale securities, net cash used in investing, one hundred and seventy thousand. So number three is A. And then number four, we have two financing items. We have thirty eight thousand cash used to pay a dividend. We have seventy five thousand cash provided by selling treasury stock, net cash provided by financing activity, 37000 I'm hoping that as long as you remember, investing makes you happy, I'm financing for Prince Divots, you just eat up questions like that. That's what I want, and I know that that's what you want. We'll continue cash flows in our next class. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. I'll see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to finish our discussion of doing a statement of cash flows. And I'm sure you've noticed that up until this point, all we've talked about is how to do a statement of cash flows under the indirect method. And as we've already said in these classes, that's what they test the most. If the exam is silent, you would assume they, that you're going to use the indirect method to break it down because there's really only one way to break down statement of cash flows problems, and that is the indirect method. As I said in our other class, you only worry about the direct method when they specify, and sometimes they do. So let's get into the direct method. A couple of points. First, if you see the direct method in the exam, please remember investing activity is exactly the same. You're still investing to be happy. Buy or sell held to maturity, buy or sell available for sale, buy or sell PP&E, buy or sell equity investments. I want you to know that memory tool will still work for you. Investing activity is exactly the same. Financing activity is exactly the same. You're still financing for Prince Divot. Prince is debt principal, Div is pay dividends, I is issue stock, TS is treasury stock transactions. So all that will still work for you. It's exactly the same. The only difference in the direct method is that under the direct method, we present the operating section differently. It's really just a presentation difference. So that's what I want to go over next. Let's go over how you present the operating section under the direct method. When you do cash flows from operating activity under the direct method, it is still your income statement approach. It is still your income statement section. So when you do the cash flows from operating activities, now you're going to start with cash sales. You're going to start with cash sales, or what they could call cash collected from customers. But that's how you start the section. Cash sales or cash collected from customers. And then you put in four categories of cash expenses. First, there's cash cost of goods sold. Or they could call it cash paid to suppliers. But think of it as cash cost of goods sold, cash paid to suppliers. Then number two, cash selling and administrative expenses, cash selling and admin. What this really amounts to for the most part is salaries and wages. Could be some other things, but for the most part it's salaries and wages. But it's cash for selling and administrative expenses. Then number three, cash paid for interest. And number four, cash paid for taxes and it'll come out the same. You'll get the same answer. That's how you do the operating section under the direct method. You show cash sales and those four categories of cash expenses. Remember earlier, we did that set of questions on Dice Corporation. If you go to your viewer's guide where we have the statement of cash flows under for Dice Corporation, I'd like you to go back to it. So just go back in your viewer's guide to where we had the actual statement of cash flows for Dice Corporation. Take a look at it. Here's my point. You look at that statement. If we had done Dice Corporation under the 
direct method? Just look at the statement. If we had done Dice Corporation under the direct method, first of all, investing activity would be exactly the same. It would still come out to net cash used in investing activity, one million one fifteen. Financing activity would still be exactly the same. So net cash provided by financing activity would still be three oh five. Of course, the net cash, the net change in cash, one hundred and thirty thousand dollar increase would still be the same. So obviously, net the net cash provided by operating activity would have to be the same, nine forty. But listen carefully. If I had done dice under the direct method, we would have to present the operating section this new way. We'd have to show cash collected from customers or cash sales, those four categories of cash expenses, and it would come out the same. Net cash provided by operating activity, nine hundred and forty thousand. But listen carefully. Listen carefully. Again, the, this, this, don't misunderstand me. The section would have to be done differently. We'd have to show cash collected from customers or cash sales, those four categories of cash expenses. We would have to present the first section that way. That's the direct method. And it would come out the same. Net cash provided by operating activity, 940000 But listen carefully. You see where we have in this statement net income, 690 We take out the gain on HTM. We take out the increase in inventory. We add back the depreciation. We add back the goodwill impairment. We add back the increase in payables. You see that calculation. Even in the direct method, that calculation shows up at the bottom of the statement as a supplemental disclosure anyway. You understand what I'm saying? Even though in the direct method you present the operating section differently, that information we have currently has to show up at the bottom of the statement as a supplemental disclosure anyway. When you use the direct method, they want a supplemental disclosure where you reconcile from accrual income to cash income anyway. That's why I say there's really only one method of solving statement of cash flows problem, and that is the indirect method. If they mention the direct method, all it means is the operating section gets presented differently the way that we have said. Now you say, well, Bob, does the CPA exam ever test the direct method? They do. Let me show you what they could do with it. If you look in your viewer's guide, we're going to do Flax Corporation. If you take a look at it, it says Flax Corporation uses the direct method. Now let me, let me stop right there. When is the only time in the CPA exam that you're going to worry about the direct method? When they specify. And here they're specifying. Flax Corporation uses the direct method to prepare its statement of cash flows. December 31, year 2, and year 1, we have comparative trial balances. That's at December 31, year 2, and year 1. We have comparative trial balances. Now, before we start breaking this down, let's back up a step. Remember I said, really, the only difference in the direct method, because investing activity is exactly the same, financing activity is exactly the same, all that's different in the direct method is we present the operating section differently. When we do operating activities, we show cash collected from customers, cash sales, and four categories of cash expenses, right? Well, look at, look at the questions here. What's question number one? Question number one is what? Cash collected from customers. What's question number two? Cash cost of goods sold. What's question number three? Cash paid for interest. What's question number four? Cash paid for taxes. What's question number five? Cash for selling. You know, really, what else can they do with it? That's what's different about the direct method. We show cash sales and those four categories of cash expenses. So this is pretty much how they really could test the direct method. So let's do question number one. How would you figure out cash sales? How do you do that? Well, if you go to the comparative trial balances, go to the debit side, the last debit listed. Notice the sales for year two, 538800 So let's start an entry. You know me, I love journal entries. So if sales for year two were 538800 we know they would have credited sales, 538800 True? Now, let me ask you. If I'm trying to convert sales from accrual to cash, what account comes to mind right away? That's right, accounts receivable. So now go to the debit side, third debit down, find accounts receivable. In the last year, accounts receivable went from 30000 to 33000 So in this entry, we know they debited accounts receivable 3000 because accounts receivable increased during the year from 30000 to 33000 We know in this entry, 
they would have debited accounts receivable for three thousand. The point is, the rest must have been cash. So debit cash, five hundred and thirty-five thousand eight hundred. So the answer to number one is D. Cash sales must have been five hundred and thirty-five thousand eight hundred. That's cash sales or cash collected from customers. All right, now let's do number two. They want cash cost of goods sold. Now, there's a number of ways to do this one. I, I like to emphasize my way is not the only way, but I have to show you what I think is the easiest way to do this. You know what I think works well here? Anytime I want to convert cost of goods sold from accrual to cash, let's find accrual first of all. If you go to the comparative trial balances, go to the debit side, about halfway down, notice cost of goods sold on the accrual basis for year two, 250000 so cost of goods sold on the accrual basis, year two, right off the trial balance, 250000 for year two. Now, as I started to say, anytime I want to convert cost of goods sold from accrual to cash, I always start by figuring out purchases. To me, that's the key. Figure out purchases. Now, stop and think. How do I go from what I sold to what I purchased? I look at what? Change in inventory. Go to the debit side, find inventory, the fourth asset down. In the last year, inventory went from 47,000 down to 31,000. Inventory went down 16,000. So think about it. Did I purchase all the goods I sold? No. I took 16,000 out of my inventory. Inventory went down. So I didn't purchase all the goods I sold. I must have taken 16,000 out of my inventory. So I subtract that. Then I must have purchased the rest. Purchases must have been 234,000. I hope that makes sense to you. I didn't purchase all the goods I sold. I took 16000 out of my inventory, so I must have purchased the rest, 234000 Now, why do I like to go from what I sold to what I purchased? Because once I have purchases, I can just do an entry. You know me. I love entries because, they're, because it really s simply breaks it down. If I know they debited purchases, 234000 now that I know that, was all of it cash? No. What do I have to look out for? Go to the credit side and find trade accounts payable. In the last year, trade accounts payable went from 17500 up to 25000 So in this entry, they must have credited accounts payable 7500 If accounts payable during the year went from 17500 up to 25000 trade accounts payable increased. By 7,500. In this entry, I must have credited accounts payable 7,500. The point is the rest must be cash. Credit cash, 226,500. That's the cash paid to suppliers, cash cost of goods sold. And the answer number two is D. Question number three What was the cash paid for interest? Well, again, you go to the debit side, about halfway down. No, it's just towards the bottom just above income tax expense. Notice, in, notice interest expense for year two, 4,300. So I know they would have debited interest expense, 4,300, right? We know that. They would have debited for year two, interest expense, 4,300. Now the question is, is all of that cash? What do, you, what do you think of right away? Is there any what? Interest payable. If you thought of interest payable, give yourself a gold star. Because that's what you normally think about. Hey, is that all cash? What's the balance in interest payable? If you looked at the trial balances, there's no interest payable. So if there's no interest payable, is it all cash? No. Got to look at everything they give you. On the debit side, about halfway down, notice they had an unamortized bond discount that went from 5000 a year ago down to 4500 Well, if unamortized bond discount has gone from 5000 down to 4500 in this entry, they must have credited discount 500 and the rest must have been cash must have been cash credit cash 3800 the answer is c 3800 because there's no interest payable so the rest must have just been cash 3800 answer c how about question 4 cash paid for taxes well again if you go to the debit side at the bottom the last Debit listed on the debit side, income tax expense for year two, 
20400 So we know they would have debited income tax expense 20400 Now the question is, is it all cash? No. Look at the credit side. You see they had a deferred tax liability that went from 4600 a year ago up to 5300 So in this entry, they must have credited deferred tax liability 700 I hope you see my point. They had a deferred tax liability a year ago with a balance of 4600 It's gone up to 5300 So in this entry, they must have credited deferred tax liability 700 Anything else? Sure. How about income tax payable? Notice income tax payable went from 27100 a year ago down to 21000 So in this entry, they must have debited income tax payable 6100 and now you need to credit the balance of the whole entry out of 25800 That must have been cash. The rest must have been cash. And the answer is A. Notice how entries help you. Entries clarify. If you have scrap paper in the exam, they might be a little stingy about it. But if you can get scrap paper in the exam, use it. You know, you're supposed to do an analysis with a question like this. And, and you start with an entry. Entries are, are really powerful. That's why I like you to start thinking in terms of entries like this. Now, one more question. Cash for selling. Well, if you go to the debit side, three quarters of the way down, the selling expense for year two, 141.5. So we know they would have debited selling expense, 141,500. Debit selling expense, 141,500. Now, the question is, is it all cash? Well, as I said earlier, the cash paid for selling and administrative expenses is primarily salaries and wages. So give yourself a gold star if you thought of wages payable. There isn't any. But that's what you'd normally look for. Any wages payable related to selling, there isn't any. So is it all cash? No, because you've got to read everything. Notice there's a little additional information here. Second bullet says, flax allocates one-third of their depreciation to selling. Well, if they allocate one-third of their depreciation to selling, depreciation is a non-cash expense. It's an expense that does not require the outlay of cash. You know that. You know when you debit depreciation expense, you don't credit cash, you credit accumulated depreciation, right? Depreciation is an expense that does not require the outlay of cash, and they're allocating one-third of their depreciation to selling. That's a non-cash expense. So the question is, do we know the depreciation expense for the year? No, but we can figure it out. Go to the credit side, find accumulated depreciation. In the last year, accumulated depreciation went from 15000 to 165. We have to infer that the depreciation expense for the year must have been 1500 Since one-third went to selling, in our entry, we would credit accumulated depreciation for 500 Again, one-third of, one of the depreciation related to selling. One third of fifteen hundred. So in our entry, they would have credited accumulated depreciation five hundred, and the rest must have been cash. Credit cash one hundred and forty-one thousand. The answer to number five is C, because there's no wages payable. So the rest must have been cash. So just to reiterate, the exam hits the indirect method far more often, much more heavily, but. You're going to be concerned about the direct method if they specify. And again, that's pretty much what they do with it. They can ask you cash sales, cash cost of goods sold, cash for selling, cash for interest, cash for taxes. That's why that's a good set of questions to study on the direct method because that's pretty much what they could ask. Keep up with your studying. Don't fall behind. Keep working on problems. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion of a very important topic, a very heavily tested topic, and that is the accounting issues that are raised when one company, called the parent company, acquires the outstanding voting common stock of another company, called the subsidiary company. And if a parent company acquires more than 50%, now, that's key criteria. 
more than 50% of a sub's outstanding voting shares, that represents control. And here's the point. When a parent company has control over a subsidiary company, that parent and that subsidiary company are required to consolidate their financial statements. So that's the basic criteria that you work with. When a parent company owns more than 50%, and I should warn you that I always have some students that talk as if it's 50% or more. I hear that a lot from my students. It's not 50% or more. I try to choose my words very carefully. It's more than 50% of a sub's voting shares. Well, that represents a controlling interest. And when a parent company has a controlling interest in the subsidiary company, now the parent controls the assets of the sub, the operations of the sub, the financial policies of the sub. When a parent has control over a subsidiary company, that parent and that subsidiary company are required to consolidate their financial statements. Now, why is consolidated? Why is consolidation required? Why are consolidated statements required? Because we always work under a presumption that consolidated statements are more meaningful. More meaningful than what? More meaningful than if the parent and subsidiary companies were to continue to issue separate statements. That's our basic premise, that consolidated statements are more meaningful to creditors, shareholders, other interested parties than if the parent and sub were to continue to issue separate statements. Now, eventually, in these classes, we are going to get into how you actually prepare consolidated financial statements. So we are going to get into that, but not quite yet. Before we get into that, there's something else we have to cover first. In this class, we're going to look at the type of problems that come up in the exam where the parent company owns 50% or less of the subsidiary's outstanding voting common stock. 50% or less. Now, you know, if a parent company owns 50% or less of a sub's voting shares, there's no consolidation, right? Forget consolidated statements because the parent does not have control over the sub, and you know how control is defined as the parent owning more than 50% of the sub's outstanding voting shares. So let me make my point. If a parent company owns 50% or less of a sub's voting shares, and we agree, there's no consolidation because there's no control, now the sub is just another investment on the parent's balance sheet. I hope you see that, that connection. When there's no consolidation because there's no control, now the sub would just be another investment on the parent's balance sheet. So that's going to be our focus. What we're going to zero in on is what is the proper way for the parent to account for the investment in the subsidiary? That is the question in this class. Now, as you may know, there are two acceptable methods of accounting for investments in common stock. There is the cost method and there is the equity method. So let's get to the bottom line. Here is the criteria that you have to know. If a parent company has significant influence over a subsidiary company, the equity method is required. Let's go over that again. If a parent company has significant influence, that's a key phrase here. And notice, not just any influence. No, the parent has to have a significant amount of influence over a subsidiary company. The equity method is required. And let's cover all possibilities. If a parent company does not have significant influence over a subsidiary company, cost method is required. So that is the basic criteria that you work with. If a parent company has significant influence over the sub, equity is required. If the parent company does not have significant influence over the sub, cost method is required. Now, obviously... What this criteria all comes down to is what we mean by significant influence. In other words, how are we out in practice supposed to know how much influence is a lot of influence? How much influence is a significant amount? Well, here's what we have to go through. First, we look for evidence. Now, listen carefully now. First, we look for evidence. Is there any clear evidence 
that the parent has a lot of influence over the sub. Examples, if the parents on the sub's board of directors, that would be evidence of significant influence. Another one, if the parent makes policy making decisions for the sub, well, that would be evidence of significant influence. If the parent is the largest single shareholder in the sub, that would be evidence of significant influence. So you see the way we have to proceed here. First, we look for evidence. Is there any clear evidence that the parent has a lot of influence over the sub? If the parent's on the sub's board of directors, well, that's evidence of significant influence. Parent makes all the policy-making decisions for the sub, well, that's evidence of significant influence. Parent is the largest single shareholder in the sub, well, that's evidence of significant influence. You see, this would make a great written communication, wouldn't it? So first, we look to see if there's any clear evidence that the parent has a lot of influence over the sub. Well, what if there is no evidence? What if there is no clear evidence that the parent has a lot of influence over the sub? Well, there's a guideline, and you have to know it. If the parent company owns 20% or more, notice I didn't say more than 20%, I said 20% or more of a sub's outstanding voting shares, well, then you just assume significant influence. Equity must be used. You have to know that criteria. So you see the way it works. First, we look for evidence. But if there is no clear evidence, we have that guideline. If the parent owns 20% or more of the sub's outstanding voting shares, well, then we just assume significant influence. Equity must be used. Let me ask you a question. Could a parent own 3% of a sub stock and have significant influence? Sure, because there could be evidence. Remember, the 20% is just a guideline if there is no evidence, but evidence comes first. In other words, if you're in the exam and they say, Manette, oh, they don't use my name a lot, but you never know. Manette owns 3% of Jones stock, but Manette is on Jones board of directors. Manette makes all the policy making decisions for Jones. When there's evidence of significant influence, equity is required. It doesn't matter what percent of the stock you own. That's an equity question. Let me ask you this. Could a parent own 42% of a sub shares and not have significant influence? Sure, it's possible, theoretically, because another company could hold the 58% and control everything. It's possible. And I'm not just trying to drive you crazy. The exam can play games with this. The people that write this exam know what I know. They know that a lot of people take the exam. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about my students. But a lot of people take the exam, and all they know about equity is that 20%. Hey, 20% or more equity under 20% cost. So the exam can try to play games with it. They'll say, you know, Jones owns 4% of Smith stock. Jones is on Smith's board of directors. Jones make all, makes all the policy for Smith. That's an equity question. Or they could go the other way. Jones owns, you know, 48% of Smith stock, but does not have significant influence. Oh, that's a cost question. So be careful. Remember, the criteria is significant influence. And as I say, the 20%, it's just a guideline that there's no evidence to go by. And I'm not minimizing how important the guideline is. You have to know it. So I hope you're with me on how we're going to know in the exam we have an equity question. Now, what I want to get into next is how we approach each method. And I, you know me, I like journal entries, and I think that's the way to study this. I think if you know the journal entries for each approach, you can answer whatever they come up with. Let's start with the cost method. Let's go over the journal entries on the cost method. In your viewer's guide, you'll see an illustrated problem on the cost method. Parent purchased 1,000 shares of a subsidiary's outstanding voting common stock for $10 a share on January 1, year 1. The 1,000 shares represent 2% of the voting shares of the sub, so you're below 20%, so you're thinking... There's no significant influence, but is there any evidence? Then it says the parent does not have significant influence over the sub, so we know it is the cost method. So let's apply the cost method here. First of all, on January 1, on the date of acquisition, the parent is going to debit investment in sub for the cost of the shares. A thousand shares at $10 a share, so the parent's going to debit investment in sub $10,000 and credit cash, $10,000. So notice, on the day of acquisition, on the day the parent acquires an investment, the parent establishes 
the initial carrying value of the investment at the cost of the shares. That's why they call it the cost method. On the day of acquisition, on the day you acquire an investment, you establish the carrying value of the investment at the cost of the shares. Now they say that a year goes by and the sub reports 20,000 of income. The question is, what entry would the parent make on its books? Remember, we're looking at this from the parent's point of view. What entry would the parent make on its books under the cost method to reflect the fact the sub has reported income? And I think you know no entry. The parent makes no entry on its books under the cost method to reflect the fact the sub has reported income. Let's go ahead another year. Now it's December 31, year two, and the sub has reported a $10,000 loss. Same question. What entry would the parent make on its books under the cost method? To reflect the fact, the sub has reported a loss. Again, no entry. So notice this. Under the cost method, the parent makes no entry on their books to reflect the fact the sub has reported income or losses. Parent makes no entry on its books under the cost method to reflect the fact that the sub has reported income or loss. One more thing. What if the sub sends the parent a dividend? Notice the sub pays a dividend of $500 to the parent. What's the parent going to do? Well, you know the parent's going to debit cash for what they collected, 500 and this is very important. The parent credits dividend income. Notice under the cost method, the parent treats dividends from the sub as dividend income. One more point. When a parent has an investment in a subsidiary company being accounted for under the cost method, that investment will just be carried on the parent's balance sheet as one of their available for sale securities. And if they need cash, they'll sell it. That's how to look at this. That when a parent has an investment in a subsidiary company being accounted for under the cost method, that investment will just be on the parent's balance sheet as one of their available for sale securities. And if they need cash, they'll sell it. Now, as you can already see, the cost method is a very simple method. You establish the carrying value of the investment at the cost of the shares. If the sub reports income, no entry in the parent's books. If the sub reports a loss, no entry in the parent's books. And if the sub pays the parent a dividend, the parent treats that dividend as income. It's a very simple method. There is, though, one little complication that could come up in a cost problem. And I want to show you this because, you know, if you're in the exam and you get a problem that on the surface looks like a simple little cost problem, I'd be suspicious. I don't think it's likely the exam would have just a, a simple question on the cost method, although they could. But if you see a problem on the cost method, I would always check to see if there's a liquidating dividend. I mention a liquidating dividend because it's the one little complication they can put into a problem that on the surface looks like a simple little cost problem. Let me show you what I mean. In your viewer's guide, the next cost problem. On January 1, year 1, parent purchases 5% of a sub stock. And they are using the cost method. They're below 20%. We have no evidence to go by. We assume there's no significant influence. They're on the cost method. A year later, December 31, the sub reports 100,000 of income. And notice now at December 31, year one, the sub sends the parent a $7,000 dividend. Well, let's think what's going to happen here. If the sub sends the parent a $7,000 dividend, we know that the sub is going to debit, excuse me, we know the parent is going to debit cash 7000 If the sub sends the parent a $7,000 dividend, parent's going to debit cash for what they collected, 7000 Now, what's the tempting thing here? The tempting thing is to just credit dividend income, 7000 In other words, people sit in the exam and say, well, it's the cost method. Parent treats dividends from the sub as dividend income. So the tempting thing is to credit dividend income, 7000 But you can't. Do you see why? In this problem, what percent of the sub stock does the parent own? 5%. If the parent owns 5% of the sub stock, what is the most the parent could possibly participate? in the current income of the sub, up to 5%, up to 5,000. That's the dividend income. So we're going to credit dividend income, 5,000. In this problem, the parent owns 5% of the sub's voting shares. So the most the parent could possibly participate in the current income of the sub is up to 5%, up to 5,000. That's the dividend income. Now, if the parent 
is sent a check for 7,000, what is that other 2,000? It must be a return of capital. So for the other 2,000, we credit investment and sub. That's a return of capital. And that 2,000 that we credit to investment and sub, that's what the exam would mean by a liquidating dividend. And again, I show you this because it's the one way they can complicate a problem that on the surface looks like a simple little cost problem. Let's do a question. Look at question number one. It says an investor uses the cost method to account for an investment in common stock classified as available for sale. That makes sense. Then look at the wording here. Dividends received this year exceeded the investor's share of investees' undistributed earnings since the date of the investment. At the bottom, it says the amount of dividend revenue. They're very precise here. What is dividend revenue that would be reported in the investor? That, in other words, the parent's income statement would be what? Now look at that wording again. Dividends received this year exceeded the investor's share, the parent's share of sub-income. And they want to know what would you report as dividend revenue? Is it A? Would dividend revenue be A, the portion of dividends received this year that were in excess of the parent share? No. Anything you receive in excess of your share, anything you receive in excess of your 5% is a return of capital. That goes to the investment account. How about B? Would dividend revenue be the portion of dividends received this year that were not in excess of the parent share? That's right. Anything you receive this year that's not in excess of your 5% would be dividend revenue. It's the one way they can complicate the cost method. In the next class, we'll get into the equity method, and I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on how a parent company should account for the investment in the common stock of a subsidiary company. And in our last class, we went through the cost method. In this class, let's go through the equity method. And remember, the parent is required to use the equity method when the parent company has significant influence over the subsidiary company. And once again, I think the best way to study this and master it is to know the journal entries that you would make under the equity method. So let's go to a problem. You'll see an illustrative problem in your viewer's guide. It says, on January 1, a parent company purchased 20% of a sub's outstanding voting common stock for $280,000. Now, I want to make this clear. You're in the exam. What's your thought process? Well, the parent owns 20%, 20% or more. I've got no evidence to go, to go by, so I assume significant influence. Equity is going to have to be used here. Then they say the fair market value of the sub's net assets on January 1, totaled a million. During the year, the sub paid 12000 in dividends, and at December 31, the sub reports 60000 of income. Let's apply the equity method to these facts. On January 1, when the parent acquires the investment, the parent's going to debit investment in sub for the cost of the shares, $280,000, and credit cash, 280000 So notice once again, on the day of acquisition, we establish the initial carrying value of the investment at the cost of the shares. And I know that you've noticed right off the bat that on the day of acquisition, on the day of acquisition, the cost and equity method are identical. No difference there. Now, they say during the year, the sub pays 12000 in dividends. Well, you have to assume that if the parent owns 20% of the sub's voting shares, the parent would have received 20% of that dividend or $2,400. So what's the entry? Well, they're going to debit cash, of course, for what they collected, $2,400. And this is extremely important. Notice the parent credits investment in sub, $2,400. Why? Because under the equity method, parent treats dividends from the sub as a return of capital. I'll say it again. Under the equity method, Parent treats any dividends from the sub as a return of capital. Notice it's a credit to investment in sub, 2400 Under the cost method, parent treats dividends from the sub as income. But under the equity method, parent treats dividends from the sub as a return of capital. It's a huge difference. Now, at December 31, the sub reports 60000 of income. And this is another major difference in the equity method because under the equity method, when 
the sub reports income like this, the parent automatically picks up their share of that income. And I know you've seen this thinking before because the parent owns 20% of the sub's outstanding voting shares. The parent will automatically pick up 20% of that income or 12,000. What's the entry? Parents going to debit investment in sub 12,000. Notice the carrying value of the investment rises by 12,000. And what's the credit? It's an account name you have to get used to. Equity in the earnings of a subsidiary, 12,000. You know what that really represents? Investment income. That's investment income for the parent. It's going to be on the parent's income statement for the year. But don't call it investment income. The account name the exam likes is equity in the earnings of a subsidiary company. So you have to remember this. Under the equity method, the parent company automatically, automatically picks up their share of the reported net income or loss or loss of a subsidiary company. Under the equity method, the parent automatically picks up their share of the reported net income or loss of a subsidiary company. Now, we have the three entries that would be made under the equity method. We have those now. And what I want to do next is set up a T account because I want to show you something. Let's set up a T account for investment and sub and let's post the entries that we just went through to the T account. Well, we know on January 1, the parent debited investment and sub 280000 and credited cash 280000 So we'll put that debit in that account. When the dividend came in, they debited cash 2400 and they credited the investment account 2400 So we'll put that on the credit side. It was, it was a return of capital. And then on December 31, the parent picked up their share of sub-income, so we debited investment in sub for another 12000 credit equity and sub-earnings 12000 But here's my point. If you add it all up, right now, the balance in that T account, right now the balance in investment and sub is 289600 In other words, if you were to look on the parent's balance sheet, you would see investment and sub at 289600 That is generally accepted accounting principles, 289 six. Now, we have that balance, and now let's do a goodwill calculation, because you're going to have to know how to do this. Let's do a goodwill calculation. The key to a goodwill calculation is when they said that the fair market value, the fair market value of the sub's net assets on January 1, the date of acquisition, totaled a million. So we'll put that down. We know the fair market value of the sub's net assets on the date of acquisition totaled a million. Now you stop and think, what percent of those net assets did the parent purchase? 20%. If you take 20% of a million, that's worth... 200,000. What did they pay for the stock? 280,000. There is 80,000 of goodwill in that investment. Now, don't misunderstand. There's no goodwill account. The parent's not going to have a goodwill account on the parent's balance sheet. That 80,000 goodwill is in the 289.6, but the exam could ask you that. They could ask you in the exam, you know, how much of the investment represents goodwill? They could ask you that. And 80,000 of that 289.6, we have investment in sub on the parent's balance sheet now at 289.6, and 80,000 of that is goodwill. Now, do you amortize that goodwill? Of course not. We know goodwill is not amortized. It's tested for impairment, at least annually. So I want to ask you this. How do you test this goodwill for impairment? Well, this is actually a fairly simple test. If you want to test this goodwill, this $80,000 goodwill that's in the 289.6, if you want to test it for impairment, it is simply this. If there's ever a permanent decline in market, if there's ever a permanent decline in market for that investment, not temporary now. Look, every day the stock market goes up, it goes down. It's not what I'm talking about. But if there's ever a permanent decline in market for this investment in sub, you would debit a loss, take a loss to the income statement, and credit investment in sub. You'd write it down to market. That's the impairment test. If there's ever a permanent decline in market, you debit a loss, take it to the income statement, and credit investment in sub, you write it down to market. Now, another point. We agree that investment in sub is on the parent's balance sheet right now at 289600 What What kind of investment is this? Is it a trading security? No, it's not. Is it a 
Is it an available for sale security? No, it's not. Is it a held to maturity security? Well, you know it's not because it's not a debt security. Held to maturity is just debt. Please remember that equity investments are carried separately on the parent's balance sheet. Equity investments are not trading. They're not available for sale. They're certainly not held to maturity. No equity investments would be carried separately on the parent's balance sheet. Let's do a couple of problems. Number one, it says on January 2nd of the current year, Well purchased 10% of Ray's outstanding shares for 400000 Well is the largest single shareholder in Ray, and Well's officers are a majority on Ray's board of directors. The sub Ray reported net income of 500000 for the year, paid dividends of 150000 In the December 31 current year balance sheet, at what amount would Well report this investment in Ray? Now, I know you wouldn't fall for this. We just talked about this, but a lot of people in the exam would go for C. Do you see why? Because a lot of people sit in the exam and they say, well, Well owns less than 20% of Ray's stock. Well only owns 10% of Ray's stock. They're below 20%. There's no significant influence. We would just keep the investment at cost. We'd use the cost method. And that's why answer C is there. But we know it's more complicated than that. When there's evidence of significant influence, it doesn't matter what percent of the stock you own, equity is required, and there's evidence here. Well is the largest single shareholder in Ray. Well's officers are a majority on Ray's board of directors. When there's evidence of significant influence, equity is required. It doesn't matter what percent of the stock you own. So let's apply the equity method. During the year, the sub paid 150000 in dividends. Well, you've got to assume that if Well owns 10% of Ray's shares, Well would have gotten 10% of those dividends, or 15000 So what entry would they make? They would debit cash 15000 credit the investment 15000 It's a return of capital. Also, Well would automatically pick up their share of Ray's income. Ray's income for the year, 500000 Well would pick up their share 10%. So debit investment in Ray, 50000 Credit equity and sub-earnings or investment income, 50000 So when they ask us at the bottom, at what amount would Well report this investment in Ray? Well, it started at 400000 It went up 50000 because of the income, down 15000 because of the dividend. It was return of capital. The answer is B. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you had to do entries. We showed you entries just to make the thinking as clear as possible. But you can get comfortable enough with this. We just would look at it and go, well, it's the... It's the 400 plus the 50 minus the 15. That's fine. Just showing you my entries, hoping to make it as clear as possible. But the main point is, when there's evidence of significant influence, it doesn't matter what percent of the stock you own. Equity is required. Let's do number two. Burke purchased 30% of SLED's outstanding stock, December 31 of the current year, for 200000 Now, again, you have to assume it's the equity method right? It's 20% or more. I've got no evidence to go by. I assume there is significant influence. Equity would be required. On that date, the sub stockholders equity totals 500,000. The fair value of the net assets, 600,000. At the bottom, they say December 31, what amount of goodwill would you attribute to this investment? What amount of goodwill would you attribute to this acquisition? This is why you have to know how to do a goodwill calculation because the exam can ask for goodwill. Now, let me ask you this. What's my starting point? If I'm going to figure out goodwill, would I start with the value of stockholders' equity, the book value of net assets, 500000 or the fair value of net assets, 600000 fair value? Remember, goodwill, by definition, is what someone's willing to pay over fair value for net assets. So we're going to, we're going to say that, hey, the fair value of the sub's net assets on the day of acquisition totals 600000 What percent of those net assets did the parent acquire? 30%. If you take 30% of 600,000, it's worth 180,000. What they pay for that stock? 200,000. There is 20,000 of goodwill here. And the answer is B. Make sure you know how to do a goodwill calculation. Question number three. On July 1 of the current year, Denver purchased 3,000 shares of Eagle's 10,000 outstanding stock for $20 a share. On December 15th, the sub-Eagle paid 40000 in dividends to the common stockholders. Eagle's net income for the year ended December 31 was 120000 earned evenly through the year. In the year-end income statement, 
what amount of income from this investment would Denver report? I want to ask you a question. You're in the exam. You have this question. How do you know it's an equity question? I'm asking because they never said the word equity in this, in this question. The word equity is nowhere mentioned. So how do you know it's an equity question? Because of the guideline. All you know is that Denver owns 3,000 of Eagle's 10,000 outstanding shares. It's 30%. I've got no evidence to go by. 20% or more, I assume significant influence. Equity is required. I'm not minimizing how important that guideline is. You use it a lot. But notice I, ha I have to use it here. They don't say the word equity, but I know it is an equity question because of the guideline. All right, now we know that during the year, the sub paid 40000 in dividends on the common stock. On the common stock. Well, if Denver owns 30% of Eagle shares, Denver would have got 30% of that dividend or 12000 So we know Denver would have debited cash 12000 Now, at the bottom, they said, in the year-end income statement, what amount of income from this investment would Denver report? You know what I'm asking? Is it C? Is it answer C? No, because that's a return of capital. We're going to credit not income. We're going to credit the investment account. So you're not going to fall for that, right? It's not answer C. That's not income. Parent treats dividends from the sub under the equity method as a return of capital, not income. But we do know that under the equity method, Denver will automatically pick up their share of Eagle's income. Eagle's income for the year is 120000 Denver picks up their share 30%. That's 36000 Hell, low A. A is wrong. But A is tempting, isn't it? They really want you to go for A. Why isn't it A? Well, there's a real lesson in this question, and I know you're going to remember it. You know, once you see it, if you haven't yet, once you see it, I think you never forget it. What day did Denver acquire Eagle shares? July 1. Oh, July 1. Remember, under the equity method, the parent company picks up their share of sub-income since the acquisition. In other words, the parent is entitled to pick up their share of Eagle's income since July 1, not for all time. Did you notice they said that Eagle's net income for the year, 120000 was earned evenly? Well, if it was earned evenly, that must have been 60000 in the first half of the year, 60000 in the last half of the year. So for the 60000 of income, the sub-earned in the last half of the year, Denver can pick up 30% or 18000 And the answer is B. So Denver's going to debit investment in sub, 18000 Carrying value of the investment rises by 18000 Credit equity and sub earnings or investment income, 18000 The answer is B. So you have to remember that lesson, that under the equity method, the parent is entitled to pick up their share of sub-income since the acquisition, not for all time. So dates matter in an equity question. You have to be right on top of that. Let me ask you this. What if they didn't say it was earned evenly? You know, here they said it was earned evenly. That was nice. What if they didn't say it? You'd have to assume it. You have to assume it. I can't solve this question if I don't know the sub's income for the last six months. So if they hadn't said that, I'd have to assume it. I'll, I've always believed, just a personal opinion now, I've always believed that in a well-written exam, a student should never have to make an assumption. That's just a personal opinion. I think in a well-crafted, well-written test, a student should never have to make an assumption. That's my opinion. And I will say that the CPA exam is very good about that. But this is one of those rare cases where sometimes in the exam, you have to make an assumption. Because if they said nothing, I'd have to assume they earn it evenly. 60000 the first half of the year, 60000 the last half of the year, because I can't solve this question if I don't know Eagle's income for the last six months. So you might have to assume it. Let's look at number four. Green owns... 30% of the outstanding stock and 100% of the outstanding non-cumulative, non-voting preferred stock of Axel. In the current year, the sub-Axel declared dividends of 100000 on the common and 60000 on the preferred. Green does exercise significant influence over Axel. We know it's an equity question. And here again, the word equity is never mentioned. But I know it's an equity question because... Green owns 30% of actual shares. It's in the guideline, 20% or more. And they say it. Green does have significant influence over Axel. I know it's equity. What amount of dividend revenue? They're very precise here. What amount of dividend revenue would Green report on its income statement for the current year, end of December 31? 
Well, in this problem, the subaxle paid 100,000 of dividends on the common. You have to assume if Green owns 30% of Axel's common shares, Green would have got 30% of that 100,000. So Green would have debited cash, 30,000, right? And when they ask you at the bottom, what is dividend revenue? Is it B? Is it answer B? Of course it's not B. Because that would be, a, that would not be a credit to dividend revenue. That would be a credit to investment and in sub. It's a return of capital. You're not going to fall for that. It's not B. Now there's also a $60,000 dividend on the preferred. What percent of that would Green collect? All of it. Green owns 100% of the preferred. So Green's going to debit cash 60,000. Now let's agree that if it's not B, it can't be D because D is the 60 plus the 30, and we already know the 30,000 doesn't work. So if it's not B, it can't be D. So we're down to A versus C. Is it A or C? It is C. You would credit dividend revenue here for 60,000. Why? Because investments in preferred are always accounted for under the cost method. Remember, equity method is for investments in common. I want you to remember that. Equity method is for investments in common, not for investments in preferred. And I know you know this. You can't really exercise significant influence over another company by holding their preferred stock. Why? Because there's no voting rights. You can't really exercise significant influence over another company by holding their preferred stock because there's, there's no voting rights. So remember, equity method is for investments in common. Investments in preferred are always accounted for under the cost method. So yes, for the dividend on preferred, green would debit cash 60000 and credit dividend revenue 60000 And the answer is C. We'll do more on the equity method in the next class. I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to do more problems on the equity method because there's so much the exam can do with the equity method. The first three questions in your viewer's guide are a set about Grant and South. It says Grant acquired 30% of South's voting stock for 200,000 January 2nd, year three. Grant's 30% interest in South gave Grant the ability to exercise significant influence over South's operating and financial policy. So we know it's equity. They never said the word equity, but they're in the guideline, 20% or more. They've got significant influence. Equity is required. It says, during year three, the sub earned 80000 of income and paid 50000 in dividends. And then we get into year four. Now, before we get into year four, the first two questions are about year three. Now, because they're asking about the carrying value, the investment, let's set up a T account. If we set up a T account for investment in South, we know on January 2nd, when Grant bought the shares, they would have debited investment in South for the cost of the shares, 200000 and credit cash, 200000 So we'll put that in the T account. And we know... Equity is required here because they're in the guideline. They own 30% of the shares. They even said they had significant influence. Equity is required. So under the equity method, how are we going to handle that dividend? Well, if during year three, the sub paid 50000 in dividends, we have to assume if Grant owns 30% of South shares, Grant received 30% of those dividends or 15000 And you know the entry. Grant would debit cash 15000 and credit the investment account 15000 It's a return of capital. So let's put that in the T account as a credit of 15000 Also, we know Grant would automatically pick up their share of South's income. South's income for the year 80000 Grant would pick up 30%, their share, automatically, 24000 And you know the entry. You would debit investment in South, 24000 Put that in the T account. The credit is to equity and sub earnings or investment income. Goes to the parent's income statement. So let's look at the first question. Before taxes, what amount would Grant include in their year three income statement as a result of this investment? What's on the income statement? A or B? Is it A or B? It's B, of course. The 15000 is a return of capital. The 24000 is on Grant's income statement as equity and sub earnings, investment income, answer B. The second question, in Grant's December 31 year three balance sheet, what would be the carrying amount of the investment? Well, we have the T account. 
it's going to be the 200 minus the 15 plus the 24. Answer B again, 209,000. Now, the real reason I wanted us to do this set is the third question. They say in the third question, in the year four income statement, what amount would Grant report as the gain from the sale of half the investment? They tell us that South reported earnings of 100000 for the six months ended June 30, year four, 200000 for the year ended December 31, year four, and on July 1, year four, Grant sold half their shares in South for 150000 cash. The sub also paid dividends of eighty of sixty thousand on October one of year four. So what's happening is on July one year four, Grant sells half the shares for one hundred and fifty thousand, and we work, we have to work out the gain on sale. The reason I wanted us to do this set together is to mention a very important concept. If you sell off an investment that's been accounted for under the equity method, you must apply the equity method up to the date of sale. I'll say it again. If you sell off an investment that's been accounted for under the equity method, you must apply the equity method up to the date of sale. If you don't, you don't have the proper carrying value. You won't get the proper gain or loss on sale. So our job here is to apply the equity method up to the date of sale, which was July 1. Now, the, we know the income for the whole year of year four was 200000 but they did break it out. They said the income was 100000 for the six months ended June 30th. So for the six months ended June 30th, the sub reports income of 100,000. Grant would pick up their share 30, 30%, so let's put that in. There would be a debit to investment in South for the 30,000. Credit equity and sub earnings or investment income, 30,000, right? That's what would happen in year four. So let's go back to our T account. Let's go back to our T account. When we left off at December 31, at the end of year three, the balance in investment in sub was 209000 Wouldn't that be the balance in investment in sub when I begin year four? And then July, then July one, year four, Grant would pick up their share of sub income up to that point, 30000 So we'll put that in. Debit investment in sub, 30000 And again, the credit would be equity and sub earnings, 30000 The point is, the balance in investment in sub on the date of sale is 239,000. You have to apply the equity method up to the date of sale. If you don't, you don't, you will not have the proper carrying value. You won't get the proper gain or loss on sale. So now we know that the proper carrying value of investment in sub on the date of sale, July 1, was 239,000. Why don't I have to worry about the dividend? Because that didn't occur until after the sale in October. But now let's handle the sale. If you grant, you go out and you sell half the shares for 150,000. So you're going to debit cash. For 150,000. Credit investment in South for what? Half of 239,000. 1195. Remember, you sold half the shares. So you're going to credit investment in South for half of the carrying value. Half of 239,000 or 119,500. And you would credit gain on sale. 30,500. And the answer is B again. Let's do another problem. Number four, they say Sage bought 40% of Adams' outstanding stock January 2nd for 400000 Now, you, you read that first sentence, you're already thinking equity because it is 40%. So far, I've got no evidence to go by. But right now, I'm assuming significant influence. It's got to be an equity question. Let's read on. It says the carrying amount of Adams, the subs, net assets on the purchase date totaled 900000 Fair values and carrying amounts were the same for all items except for the plant and inventory for which fair values exceeded carrying amounts by 90000 and 10000 respectively. The plant has an 18-year life. All inventory was sold during the year. During the year, the sub-Adams reported net income of 120000 and paid 20000 in dividends. What amount would Sage, the parent, report on its income statement from this investment in Adams for the current year ended December 31. Well, when you look at this problem, the first thing we're going to do is an excess calculation. Let's do an excess calculation. 
we know that the they said that the carrying amount of Adams net assets on the purchase date totaled 900,000. So we'll start with that. We know that the book value, the carrying value of the subs net assets on the purchase date totaled 900,000. Now you think what percent of those net assets did Sage purchase? 40%. If you take 40% of 900,000, it comes out to 360,000. What did Sage pay for the stock? 400,000. So there is a $40,000 excess here. I want you to notice that. Is that goodwill? No. Be careful. Goodwill, by definition, is what a company is willing to pay over fair value for net assets. This 40000 is what the parent was willing to pay over book value for net assets. Do you see the difference? Goodwill is an excess of cost over fair value for net assets. This is an excess of cost over book value. Now, you have to think here. Why? Why was Sage, why was the parent, willing to pay a premium over book value to acquire these net assets. Because two assets, the plant and the inventory, have fair values much higher than book values. See, what you have here are some undervalued assets. The plant and the inventory have fair values much higher than book values. So what you have here are some undervalued assets. Now, Let's break this down. They said that the plant has a fair value 90,000 higher than book value. Isn't that true? The plant has a fair va- the plant is undervalued on the books. The plant has a fair value 90,000 higher than carrying amount. And think about it. If I buy 40% of your net assets, I just bought 40%, I just bought a 40% interest in that plant. So take 40% of 90,000, let's agree that 36,000 of the 40,000 excess is traceable to the plant. Let's talk about the inventory. The inventory is undervalued. The inventory has a fair value 10,000 higher than carrying amount on the books. And if I buy 40% of Adam's net assets, I just bought a 40% interest in that inventory. So 4,000 of the 40,000 excess is traceable to the inventory. I want you to see how you can trace the excess to undervalued assets. 36,000 of the excess is traceable to the plant. 4,000 of the excess is traceable to the inventory. I want you to remember this basic split. Listen carefully. Remember this basic difference. If there's an excess of cost over fair value of net assets, we call that goodwill, right? Anytime there's an excess of cost over fair value of net assets, we call that goodwill. It's not amortized. It's tested for impairment, at least annually. But if there's an excess of cost over book value of net assets, you've got to trace that excess to undervalued assets. Remember that basic difference. If there's an excess of cost over fair value, we call that goodwill. We don't amortize it. We test it for impairment, at least annually. But if there's an excess of cost over book value, you've got to trace that excess to undervalued assets. By the way, this is a very difficult problem. In my opinion, this is about as difficult as a problem on the equity method would ever be in the exam. But they like this. Don't think they'd never ask. They do like this. This tracing the excess to undervalued assets. Now, here's the point. Now, listen carefully. When you can trace your excess to undervalued assets, this excess is amortized over the remaining useful life of these assets. Do you see the difference? When you can trace your excess to undervalued assets, this excess is amortized over the remaining useful life of these assets. So let's do it. Let's let's figure it, this whole thing out. We know that Adam's net income, the sub's net income for the year was 120,000, right? We know under the equity method, Sage would automatically pick up their share of that income, right? Sage would automatically pick up 40% of that income of 48,000. And we know the entry. Sage would debit investment in sub, 48,000. The carrying value of the investment would rise by 48,000. Sage would credit equity and sub, sub earnings or investment income, 48,000. And by the way, notice that's the answer A. It's not that simple. But Sage would pick up their share of Adam's income, 48,000. But now we're going to have to make some adjustments because when you can trace your excess to undervalued assets, this excess is amortized over the remaining useful life of these assets. So let's do it. I'm going to take the 
36,000 of excess that I trace to the plant, and I'm going to amortize it over 18 straight line years, the remaining useful life of the plant. So I take the 36,000 of excess that I trace to the plant over 18 straight line years, I'm going to take 2,000 of amortization. But notice the entry. Don't debit amortization expense. That's just going to get you messed up. In the CPA exam, they would always take this amortization as a direct reduction of equity and sub income. So I'm going to debit equity and sub earnings or equity and sub income for 2000 and credit the investment account 2000 One more time, don't debit amortization expense. It's going to get you messed up. In the CPA exam, they'd always take this amortization as a direct reduction of equity and sub income, equity and sub earnings, investment income. So I took the 36000 of excess that I traced to the plant, divide by 18 straight line years, the remaining life of the plant, and I'm going to debit equity and sub earnings, 2000 and credit the investment account, 2000 How about the 4000 of excess that I traced to inventory? How much of that should I amortize? All of it, because they sold it all. If they sold half, I'd amortize half. If they sold a quarter, I'd amortize a quarter. But here they sold it all, so I'm going to amortize it all. And again, I'm going to debit equity and sub-earnings, 4000 and credit the investment account, 4000 I take this amortization as a direct reduction of equity and sub-earnings. So now let's answer the question. They want to know what would be on the income statement as a result of this investment for the current year. Well, I started at 48000 equity and sub-earnings of 48000 But I make my adjustments. I lowered it by two because of the plant. I lowered it by four because of the inventory. And the answer is B. The answer is B. Why don't I worry about the dividend? How about that 20000 of dividend? Why didn't I worry about that? Because that's a return of capital. It's the equity method here. That's a return of capital that wouldn't affect what's on the income statement. So we didn't have to worry about that. Let's do another one like that. Because as I say, the exam likes these. So let's do another one like that. Number five says, on January 2nd, Keene purchased a 30% interest in pod for 250,000. On that date, pod stockholders equity was 500,000. The carrying amount of pods identifiable net assets approximated the fair values except for the plant and the equipment, whose fair values exceeded carrying amount by 200,000. The plant and equipment has a remaining useful life of 10 years. Pod reported net income of 100,000 for the year and paid no dividends. So the subreported income of 100000 for the year. There's no dividends. Keen accounts for this investment under the equity method. So here they say it's the equity method. We were thinking it anyway because it was 30%. There's no evidence. We'd have to assume significant influence. It is an equity question. In the December 31 balance sheet, at what amount would Keen report this investment in sub? Well, because they're asking for the carrying value of the investment, you know I like a T account. So let's set up a T account for investment in pod. We know how it started on January 2nd. When Keen acquired the investment, Keen would have debited investment in pod for 250000 credit cash 250000 So they will put that 250000 as a debit in that T account. We know that Keen would automatically pick up their share of pod's income. Pod's income for the year was 100000 Keen would pick up their share 30%. So you would debit investment in pod 30000 credit equity and sub earnings, investment income 30000 So put another $30,000 debit in that account. Now I can't stop there, can I? Because I've got some undervalued assets. Let's do a, let's do an excess calculation. We know that the book value, the carrying amount of stockholders' equity on the day of acquisition totaled 500,000. What percent of those net assets did Keen purchase? 30%. If you take a 30% interest in 500,000, it comes out to 150,000, but they paid 250,000 for the stock. There is 100,000 excess here. But that's not goodwill. Goodwill is an excess of cost over fair value. This 100000 represents an excess of cost over book value. Why were they willing to pay a premium over book value? Because we have some undervalued assets, the plant and equipment. Let's work on it. The plant and equipment have fair values, 200000 higher than book value. And if I buy 30% of Adam's net assets, excuse me, if I buy 30% of pods net assets, I just bought a 30% interest in that plant and equipment. So take 30% of 200,000, 60,000 of the 100,000 excess is traceable to that plant and equipment. 
If I buy 30% of Pods Net assets, I just bought a 30% interest in that plant and equipment. So 60,000, 30% of 200,000, 60,000 of my 100,000 excess is traceable to that plant and equipment. What's the other 40,000 of excess? Must be goodwill because there are no other undervalued assets. So the other 40,000 of excess must be what I paid over fair value for net assets. So the other 40,000 is goodwill. Now we know we don't amortize the goodwill, the 40,000. That's tested for impairment. But the 60,000 of excess that I trace to plant and equipment, we amortize that over the remaining useful life of the plant and equipment, and that's 10 years. So I'm gonna take the 60,000 of excess that I trace to the plant and equipment over 10 straight line years. I'm gonna take 6,000 of amortization on that. And you know the entry. I'm gonna debit equity and sub earnings, 6,000. I take the amortization as a direct reduction of equity and sub earnings, 6,000, and credit the investment account, 6,000. And when I put that in the T account, when I put a credit to investment in pod of 6,000, now my carrying value for the investment is what? It's the 250 plus the 30 minus the six, 274,000, answer D. Watch out for undervalued assets. As I say, they like that. We'll do more on the equity method in the next class, and I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this last class on the equity method, we have to cover one more issue, and that is a step-by-step -step acquisition. Let me define that. What you're looking for in the exam is a problem where it takes more than one purchase of stock to acquire significant influence over the subsidiary company. That is a step-by-step -step acquisition. It's a problem where it takes more than one purchase of stock to acquire significant influence over the subsidiary company. Let's go over an example. If you look in your viewer's guide, we have a problem where on January 1st, 2011, parent purchased 8% of a subsidiary stock. What would be your assumption? Well, they own 8%, they're below 20%, I've got no evidence to go by, so I have to assume below 20%, there is no significant influence. Cost method would have to be used. So I'm assuming that in year 11, they're using the cost method. Then notice some time goes by, and on July 1st, 2012, parent purchases an additional 6% of, of the sub stock. So as of July 1st, 2012, now the parent owns 8 plus 6, 14% of the sub stock. They're still below 20%, so as far as I know, they would still be under the cost method. As far as I know, there's no significant influence, so they'd still be using the cost method. And then some time goes by, and then finally on July 1st, 2013, the parent purchases an additional 11% of the sub's voting shares. So as of July 1st, 2013, now the parent owns 8 plus 6 plus 11, 25% of the sub's voting shares. I would have to assume now they do have significant influence over the sub and they would switch over to the equity method. This is a step-by-step -step acquisition. It is a problem where it takes more than one purchase of stock to acquire significant influence over the subsidiary company. Well, as you can imagine, the exam likes this because it's a complication. And here's the point. In a step-by-step -step acquisition, once you determine that the parent does have significant influence over the sub, I'll say it again, in a step-by-step -step acquisition, once you determine that the parent does have significant influence over the subsidiary company, you must retroactively apply the equity method all the way back to the first purchase of shares. That's what you're up against in a problem like this because in a step-by-step -step acquisition, once you determine that the parent does have significant influence, you must retroactively apply the equity method all the way back to the first purchase of stock. So that's what we're gonna have to do here. We're gonna have to go back in time and retroactively apply equity all the, all the way back to January 1st, 2011. Now, 
I don't know if you already see the complication, but there's something that bothers students here. Just think about this for a minute. If we're going to retroactively apply equity all the way back to January 1st, 2011, you know that the parent now has to pick up their share of sub income. But here's the question. What percent of the sub's income should the parent pick up? 8 8%, 6%, 11%, 17%, 19%, 25%, 14%. I just want you to recognize that there's all these percentages floating around in this problem. And a lot of students freeze right here. So what I want to give you is my rule. And I always tell my students, if you can just remember this rule, it'll just take you through any step by step. Here's the rule. The rule is this. When you retroactively apply equity, you always make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. That's the rule. Let me say it again. When you retroactively apply equity, anytime you are retroactively applying equity, you will always make your adjustments, always make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. You make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. So let's apply the rule. Let's go back to 2011. I ask you, what percent of the substock did the parent own all through 2011? 8%. So the parent would be entitled to pick up their share, 8% of the sub's income for year 11. That's how the rule works. Since the parent owned 8% of the sub shares while the sub was earning the year 11 income, parent is entitled to pick up their share, 8% of the year 11 income. Let me ask you, what percent of the sub stock did the parent own for the first six months of year 12? It was still 8%. Remember, the ownership interest didn't change until July 1st. And of course, this is what the exam will likely do to you. It'll be a little, it'll be a little test on, on being careful with dates. They'll have the ownership percentage change during the year. Notice in this case, the parent still owned 8% of the sub stock for the first six months of year 12. So the parent would be entitled to pick up their share, 8% of the sub's first six months year 12 income. What percent of the sub stock did the parent own for the last six months of year 12? 14%. So the parent's entitled to pick up 14% of the sub's last six months income. You make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. Let's go to 2013. What percent of the sub stock did the parent own for the first six months of year 13? It was still 14%. So the parent would be entitled to pick up their share, 14% of the sub's first six months year 13 income. See, that's the thought process. Since the parent owned 14% of the sub stock while the sub was earning their first six months year 13 income, parents entitled to pick up their share, 14% of the sub's first six months year 13 income. What percent of the sub stock did the parent own for the last six months of year 13? 25%. So the parent is entitled to pick up their share, 25% of the sub's last six months of year 13 income. You make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. I want you to remember that rule. Let's look at a multiple choice on this. On January 1, Point purchased 10% of Iona Company's common stock. Stop right there. You're in the exam, what are you thinking? Well, you don't have any evidence or anything yet, but you're below 20%. So if there's no evidence to go by, I've got to, get my, got to use my guideline. I have to assume that they're below 20% as of January 1. They do not have significant influence. I would have to assume that right now the parent's using the cost method. And then they say the parent purchased additional shares, bringing its ownership percentage up to 40% of Iona's common stock on, on August 1st. So now let's just stop there. When they purchase more shares and their ownership level goes up to 40% on August 1st. Well, now they're 20% or more. I've got no evidence to go by. I have to assume they have significant influence. So what am I required to do? I must retroactively apply equity all the way back to January 1, the first purchase of shares. In October, 
the sub declared and paid a cash dividend on all its shares. How much income from this IONA investment would be in the parent's year-end income statement? Well, you know the answer is A, because you make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. So since the parent owned 10% of IONA's shares from January 1 to July 31, the parent's entitled to pick up 10% of the sub's income in that period. Since the parent owned 10% of the sub stock, while the sub was earning their income from January 1st to July 31, parents entitled to pick up their share, 10% of the income for that period. And since the parent owned 40% of the sub stock from August 1st on, parents entitled to pick up 40% of the sub's income from August 1st on. You make your adjustments based on the ownership percentage that existed at the time the income was earned. As we've already said in these classes, there's just so much the exam can do with the equity method. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion on how you prepare consolidated financial statements. And I want to begin by going over some concepts that we've talked about in other classes. Now, assuming that we have no other evidence to go by, no other evidence to go by, these are our basic guidelines. We know that if a parent owns less than 20%, less than 20% of a sub's voting shares, we assume that the parent does not have significant influence over the subsidiary company and the cost method would have to be used. The parent would have to use the cost method to account for that investment. And if a parent owns between 20 and 50%, between 20 and 50% of the sub's voting shares, what do we assume? We assume that the parent does have significant influence over the sub, so the equity method would be required. But I want to remind you that once you cross that 50% threshold, now we're no longer talking about significant influence. We're talking about control. When a parent owns more than 50%, more than 50% of a sub's voting shares, now the parent has control over the subsidiary company. And when a parent company has control over a subsidiary company, that parent and that sub are required to prepare consolidated statements. Now, there is only one acceptable method of preparing consolidated financial statements. It's called the acquisition method. That's what we're going to be going over in these classes, the acquisition method. And I want you to know that when we prepare consolidated statements under the acquisition method, our goal, and it's important never to lose sight of this, our goal is to present the parent and the subsidiary companies as if they were one company. Try to never forget that. That is your goal in the acquisition method, to present the parent and the subsidiary companies as if they are one company. Why? Because the argument is that theoretically they are one company. Once a parent has control over a subsidiary company, once a parent controls the assets of the sub, the actions of the sub, the financial policies of the sub, the operations of the sub, once the parent controls everything that the subsidiary company is doing, who are we kidding? In legal form, there are, are still two companies, of course. Legally, there are still two companies. But in substance, in substance, there is now only one economic entity. In substance, there is only one company. And I want you to know that the exam refers to the concept that we just went through as the single entity concept. That's what this is known as, the single entity concept, that in legal form, there are still two companies, parent and sub. But in substance, there is only one company. And I think you know where all of this is leading. If in substance, there's only one economic entity, if in substance, there's only one company, how do intercompany transactions make any sense at all? How could the parent sell something to the sub and make a profit? In substance, this entity just made a profit with itself. How can there be intercompany payables, intercompany receivables, intercompany dividends, intercompany sales? intercompany profits, intercompany losses, intercompany bonds. It's all ridiculous if you buy the original premise that 
once a parent has control over a sub, in substance, there's only one company. In substance, there's only one economic entity. So the bottom line is this. Your job in a consolidation, whether it's a multiple choice, whether it's a simulation, really what they're testing you on is your objective, your job, is to eliminate all this intercompany activity. So that's what we're going to be going over in these classes. We're going to be going over the different elimination entries that you make in a consolidation. And we're going to start with the most important elimination entry of them all. Let me give you an example. Let's say on January 2nd, a parent company purchased 80% of a sub's voting shares for $880,000. So on January 2nd, a parent company has purchased 80% of the sub's voting common stock for $880,000. So we know the entry the parent would have made. The parent would have debited investment in sub for $880,000 and credit cash $880,000. And as you know, the parent-sub relationship begins with that entry. Now, I want you to imagine that when you sit down to do a consolidation, what you're going to be given is the trial balance of the parent and the trial balance of the subsidiary company. Just kind of picture this. You're sitting down to do a consolidation, and what you have is the trial balance of the parent and the trial balance of the subsidiary company. And when you look on the trial balance of the parent company, you're going to see investment in sub at $880,000. And I bring this up because the main elimination entry that you make in any consolidation is to eliminate that investment account. This is really the center of the problem because it is the main elimination entry that we make. We have to eliminate that investment account. Now, also, when you look on your spreadsheet, again, just picture that you've got the trial balance of the parent and the trial balance of the sub. If you look at the trial balance of the sub and you go down to the sub's capital structure, here's what the sub is showing. The sub is showing common stock, 300000 additional paid in capital, 100000 and retained earnings, 400000 So on January 2nd, the day of purchase, the net assets of the sub add up to what? 300000 plus 100000 plus 400000 800000 Now we're also told this. We're told that the carrying value of the sub's net asset, 800000 3 plus 1 plus 4, is the same as the fair value, except for land. The sub's land has a fair value 100,000 greater than carrying amount. So in other words, the land on the sub's books is undervalued because the land has a fair value 100,000 greater than carrying amount. These are the facts we're told. Now, as I said, the main elimination entry that we make in any consolidation problem is to eliminate this investment account. And that's the, that's going to be our objective, and that's what we're going to be going through. Now, before we start our elimination entries, I want to do some preliminary calculations. Don't we know that the parent bought 80% of the sub stock for $880,000? So we're going to set up an equation. 80% of X, the total value of 100% of the sub stock, equals $880,000. So now, of course, whatever I do to one side of an equation, I do to the other, I'm going to divide both sides by 80%. And what we end up with is this, that X, the total value of 100% of the sub stock, equals that 880,000 divided by 80%. So X, the total value of 100% of the sub stock, equals 1,100,000. That's what we know going in, that we have inferred that the total value of 100% of the sub stock is worth 1,100,000. So if somebody purchased 100% of the subshares, they'd have to pay $1,100,000. What are they getting for net assets? Well, we know the book value, the carrying value of the net assets, 300000 plus 100000 plus 400000 is 800000 Is that the fair value? No, because the fair value of the sub's land is 100000 greater than carrying amount. So isn't the fair value of the sub's net assets 900000 So let me summarize. If somebody purchased 100% of the stock, they'd have to pay $1,100,000 for net assets that have a fair value of $900,000. So what that means is total goodwill related to this acquisition is $200,000. So we know going in 
but there's 200,000 of goodwill. We also know that if the parent owns 80% of the sub shares, then the other 20% of the capital stock of the sub, the other 20% of the net assets of the sub is owned by the minority interest shareholder or what is called the non-controlling interest. So the non-controlling interest owns the other 20%. So if the total fair value of all the sub stock is 1,100,000 times 20%, we know as of January 2nd, the day of purchase, the non-controlling interest has a total fair value of 220,000. One of the objectives of the acquisition method is to value the non-controlling interest at its full fair value. And as of January 2nd, that would be 220,000. So with those preliminary calculations in mind, now let's get to the main elimination entry that we have to make. As I say, we have to eliminate that investment account. We look at the trial balance of the parent, and there it is, big as life, investment in sub, 880,000. There's no way we can carry that investment over to the consolidated balance sheet. Why? Because there is no sub. Remember, the sub has been consumed by the parent. The sub is gone. How many entities are there? One. Who's the entity? The parent. The parent is the surviving entity. The sub is gone. So we know we have to eliminate the investment account. Now, I have a checklist for you. It's going to take three steps, three entries, to eliminate this investment account. Let me give you the checklist. To eliminate the investment account, you're going to have to do three things. Number one, you're going to have to record the goodwill. Number two, you're going to have to write the sub's net assets to fair value. And then step three, you're going to have to eliminate the capital structure of the sub. If you do those three things, you will eliminate the investment account. If you record the goodwill, if you write the sub's net assets to fair value, and you eliminate the capital structure of the sub, you will have eliminated the investment account. So let's do these three things. Don't we know that the total goodwill as of January 2nd comes out to 200000 So my first entry, I'm going to debit goodwill, 220000 We're going to record the goodwill in the purchase at 200000 And that's goodwill. That, that is going to be carried over to the consolidated balance sheet, shown as goodwill in the consolidated balance sheet. So I debit goodwill, 200000 I'm going to credit the investment account for 80% of that goodwill or 160,000 and I'm going to credit the non-controlling interest for 20 percent of that goodwill or 40,000. That's my first entry. So I've, cre I've already credited the investment account for 160,000. That's what the parent paid for their share of goodwill. So we credit the investment account 160,000 and we're, we're starting to build our non-controlling interest account. We're going to credit non-controlling interest for 20 percent of the goodwill for 40,000. Let's get to step two. Now I have to write the sub's net assets to fair value. This is an adjustment you have to make in the acquisition method. The sub's net assets are written to fair value. It's a big part of a consolidation. Now, for the most part, the fair value of the sub's net assets equals the carrying amount except for that land. The land has a fair value 100,000 greater than carrying amount. So we're going to debit land for 100,000. Notice in consolidation under the acquisition method, we actually write the sub's land to fair value. So we're going to debit land 100000 We're going we're to credit the investment account for 80% for the parent share, or 80000 and we're going to credit the non-controlling interest for 20%, or 20000 Now our third and final entry, our third and final step to getting rid of the investment account. We have to eliminate the capital structure of the subsidiary. So when we look at the sub's trial balance, in the sub's trial balance, they're showing capital stock 300000 additional paid in capital 100000 retained earnings 400000 So let's do our third entry. I'm going to debit the sub's common stock 300000 I'm going to debit the sub's APIC 100000 I'm going to debit the sub's retained earnings 400000 I always eliminate 100% of the capital structure of the sub. Why? There is no sub. It doesn't exist. The sub has been consumed by the parent. I'll put it another way. There's only one capital structure that you'd ever carry over to the consolidated balance sheet, and that's the capital structure of the parent. The parent is the surviving entity. So suffice it to say, 
that the capital structure of the subsidiary has to be eliminated. So I debit the subs common stock, 300,000. I debit the subs APIC, 100,000. I debit the subs retained earnings, 400,000. Now I'm going to credit the investment account to 80% of those net assets, 640,000. And I'm going to credit the non-controlling interest to 20% of those net assets, or 160,000. Those are the three entries that it takes to eliminate the investment account. Now let's reconcile. Look at the three credits that, that we, in our three entries, the three credits we just put to investment and subs. When I reported the, put the goodwill, didn't I credit investment and subs for 160,000? When I wrote the land to fair value, didn't I credit investment and subs for 80,000? And when I eliminated the capital structure of the subsidiary, didn't I credit the investment account 640,000? If you add up 160,000 plus 80,000 plus 640,000, haven't I credited investment and subs for 880,000? That account has been brought to zero. Why did it get brought to zero? Because there is no sub. How many entities are there? One. So if you publish this account, you'd be saying you invested in yourself. There's only one entity. There is no sub. That investment account has to be brought to zero, and we've done that. All right, look at the non-controlling interest. Look at my three credits to non-controlling interest. Didn't I credit non-controlling interest for 40000 when I reported the goodwill? Didn't I credit non-controlling interest for 20000 when I wrote the land to fair value? And didn't I credit non-controlling interest for 160000 when I eliminated the capital structure of the sub. And if you add up 40,000 plus 20,000 plus 160,000, haven't I established my non-controlling interest account at 220,000? And doesn't that make sense? Because the non-controlling interest owns 20% of the capital stock of the sub. 100% of the stock of the sub is worth fair value 1 million one times 20%. It should come out to 220,000. So we've established our non-controlling interest account at 220,000. Is that carried over to the consolidated balance sheet? It is. That non-controlling interest will be carried over to the consolidated balance sheet. It'll be reported in stockholders' equity in the consolidated balance sheet. In other words, down in the when you when you look at the consolidated balance sheet, you're going to see down in stockholders' equity, common stock, additional paid in capital, retained earnings, and non-controlling interest, valued at two hundred and twenty thousand as of January second the day of purchase. As I say, eliminating the investment account is the most important elimination entry of them all. There is not another elimination entry that you make in consolidation that's even a close second. And you know me well enough to know that we're not going to just do this sequence of entries one time. We'll certainly be going through it again. But make sure you study the sequence of entries. And in our next class, we'll continue talking about other elimination entries that you have to make in consolidation because once you've eliminated the investment account, then what you have to do is eliminate any intercompany transactions between the parent and sub, and we'll get to that in our next class. I look to see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on the elimination entries that you make in a consolidation. And you know that the main elimination entry that you make in any consolidation is to eliminate the investment account. And we've seen the different things the exam can do with that. And as you know, the main elimination entry can be tested in multiple choice, as you've seen. And of course, if you get a simulation on consolidation with a spreadsheet, you know, with a worksheet, that's going to be the center of the simulation, getting that main elimination entry down. And my point is, once you get that main elimination entry down, really what's left in terms of testing is eliminating intercompany activity. And in multiple choice and in simulations, there are three situations of intercompany activity the exam loves. Intercompany sales with profits, intercompany sales of fixed assets, and intercompany bonds. You got to be ready for those three intercompany situations. Intercompany sales with profits, intercompany sales of fixed assets, and intercompany bonds. Let's start with intercompany sales with profits. Look at illustrative problem number one. During the year, the parent sold 
100,000 of merchandise to the subsidiary. And of course, the basic problem is parent and sub are one economic entity. Really, you're selling merchandise to yourself. That's the basic problem. Parents sold 100,000 of merchandise to the subsidiary. Parent, the sub, excuse me, has not paid the parent for the merchandise as of December 31. So the sub has not paid for the merchandise as of December 31. The parent's gross profit on the sale, 20,000. And notice half the merchandise is still in the sub's inventory. All right, now I have a little checklist for you. Now listen carefully. I don't care whether the parent sells merchandise to the sub or the sub sells merchandise to the parent, because students get all hung up on that. It does not matter whether the parent sells merchandise to the sub or the sub sells merchandise to the parent. When you see this, you got to do three things. Let's, let's go down the three things you have to do. Number one, you have to eliminate the intercompany sales themselves. That's number one. You have to eliminate the intercompany sales themselves. Number two, you have to eliminate any intercompany accounts payable accounts receivable. That's number two. You have to eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. Remember, only eliminate intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. And of course, I would memorize a checklist, checklist like that because it gets you organized. You see intercompany sales with profits. All right, there's three potential things I have to do here. Eliminate the intercompany sales. Eliminate intercompany accounts, payable accounts, receivable. Eliminate the intercompany profit if it's still an inventory. So let's apply the checklist to this problem. The first thing we have to eliminate is the intercompany sales. So if I were consolidating parent and sub here, if I had a spreadsheet where I were consolidating parent and sub, the first adjustment I'd make, I would debit sales, 100000 And I would credit cost of goods sold, 100000 Why? Because you can't have sales with yourself. See, sales are overstated on the parent's books. Purchases, therefore cost of goods sold, is overstated on the sub's books. But none of this can happen because it's all one company. So the first adjustment I would make, I would debit sales 100000 and I would credit cost of goods sold 100000 making the point that this entity cannot have sales with itself. There's no other company to have sales with. The sub has been consumed by the parent. What it comes down to is you're not allowed to have sales with yourself. So debit sales 100000 credit cost of goods sold 100000 and that'll take care of the first thing. Now, the next thing you take care of, you have to eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. They said the sub has not paid the parent for this merchandise as of December 31. Well, if that's true, isn't there a $100,000 accounts payable on the sub's books? Isn't there a $100,000 accounts receivable on the parent's books? So my second entry, debit accounts payable, 100000 Wipe that out. Wipe out the payable on the sub's books. Credit accounts receivable, 100000 Wipe out the receivable on the parents' books. Why? Because you cannot have payables and receivables with yourself. It's all one company now. All right, so the first thing we eliminate is the intercompany sales. Debit sales, 100000 Credit cost of goods sold, 100000 Next thing we eliminate, intercompany accounts, payable accounts, receivable. Debit accounts payable, 100000 Credit accounts receivable, 100000 Now, the third thing you eliminate is any intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. Now, remember that. Don't eliminate all the profit. You only eliminate profit if it's still in inventory. Now, the parent made $20,000 of gross profit on these sales with the sub. They say half the merchandise is still in the sub's inventory. If half the merchandise is still in the sub's inventory, we're going to have to eliminate half the profit or 10000 Only eliminate the profit if it's still in inventory. So if half the merchandise is on hand, we have to eliminate half the profit or 10000 But what's the entry? Well, look at the credit. The credit will make sense. We have to credit inventory, 10000 I hope that makes sense. Our job is to get that intercompany profit out of inventory. So credit inventory, 10000 Now, what do you debit? Well, if ending inventory is overstated by that profit, cost of goods sold is understated by that profit. Again, if ending inventory is overstated by that profit, cost of goods sold is understated by the profit. So debit cost of goods sold, 10000 those are the three things you have to do if you see intercompany sales with profits. And as I say, I'd memorize that checklist because you get you organized. Hey, this intercompany sale, the exam loves it. You'll see when you do your homework, a lot of the multiple choice are about intercompany sales with profits. If you get a simulation on consolidation, I guarantee you 
they'll have intercompany sales with profits in there. So you want to be ready for them. And those are the three things you do. Eliminate the intercompany sales. Eliminate intercompany accounts, payable accounts, receivable, and eliminate the intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. All right, now let's talk about intercompany sales of fixed assets. If you go to illustrator problem number two. On July 1, the parent sold equipment with a $16,000 book value to the sub for 12000 So on July 1, the parent sold equipment with a $16,000 book value and the sub only paid $12,000. is not there a $4,000 loss in that sale? If the parent takes a piece of equipment on their books that costs $16,000, and they sell it to the sub for $12,000. There's a $4,000 loss on sale. The depreciation method is straight line. And the remaining life is five years. Now, once again, let me, let me give you a checklist. I don't care whether the parent sells fixed assets to the sub or the sub sells fixed assets to the parent. Doesn't Because again, some students get hung up on that. It doesn't matter. I don't care whether the parent sells fixed assets to the sub, the sub sells fixed assets to the parent. When you see this item, you got to do three things. I'm in love with threes here. Got three things you have to do. Number one, you have to eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. Number one, you're going to have to eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. Number two, you have to adjust the asset. It's either over or understated. It's either over or understated. And then number three, you have to adjust depreciation. Now here again, I'd memorize that checklist because it gets you organized. You see intercompany sales of fixed assets, you know there's three things you got to look for. You have to eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. You have to adjust the asset. It's either over or understated and you have to adjust depreciation. All right, let's go to this problem. Is there an intercompany gain or loss? There's a loss, right? Didn't the parent take a piece of equipment on its books that cost 16000 sell it to the sub for 12000 There's a $4,000 loss in that transaction. So there is an intercompany loss. Now the question is, next point, is the asset over or understated? Let me ask you a question. Who owns this equipment? The parent or the sub? The parent does. There is no sub. Remember, the sub has been consumed by the parent. Sub is gone. Sub doesn't exist. And if the parent still owns the equipment, theoretically, what's the proper carrying value to the parent? Their cost, 16000 But the sub has possession. The sub has it on the books at 12, so it's understated. You see the problem. Who owns the equipment? The parent does. There is no sub. And if the parent owns the equipment, this should, this should be on the parent's books at their original, this should be on the parent's books at its true original cost, 16,000. But the sub has possession. The sub has it on the books at 12. It's understated. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make one very quick entry that'll solve those first two problems. See if it makes sense. Our first adjustment, it'll take care of the first two problems. I'm going to debit plant and equipment, 4000 Why am I debiting? You know, this is, this is an adjustment we make. In, it's a consolidating adjustment. We're going to debit plant and equipment, 4000 Why? To bring the equipment from 12000 on the subs books back up to 16000 the true carrying value for the entity. What do I credit? Well, if you, have a tri- if you have a trial balance on your spreadsheet, you'll see on that trial balance, loss on sale of equipment, 4000 And you'll credit loss on sale of equipment, 4000 Why? Because you can't incur a loss with yourself. It's all one company. There can't be intercompany gains and losses. There's no other company to incur a loss with. The sub has been consumed by the parent. So look at that entry. Doesn't that solve the first two problems? If I debit plant and equipment, 4,000, that brings the carrying value from 12,000 on the sub's books back up to 16,000, the true carrying value for the entity. And if I credit loss on sale of equipment, that intercompany loss is eliminated. Now, the last thing you do is adjust the depreciation. And I think that'll make sense to you too. It gets back to the question, who owns the equipment? Parent or sub? Parent does. There is no sub. And if the parent owns the equipment, the parent should have taken depreciation for the last six months from July on based on their cost, 16,000. But the sub had possession, the sub-based depreciation for the last six months on 12,000. They didn't know any better. We're consolidating the entity. We have to make corrections here. Like I say, the sub had possession. The sub would have based depreciation from July 1st on based on 12000 Nobody has depreciated that $4,000 segment from July on. If we do that, we've got it. So let's do it. I'm going to take that $4,000 loss, divide by five straight line years. That's what? 
$800 depreciation for a full year, but I don't want a full year. I want a half year, July 1st on. It's a $400 adjustment. So what is my adjustment? Debit depreciation expense, 400. They didn't take enough. The sub, has, the sub is ignorant. The sub based depreciation on 12,000. They don't know. We consolidated the entity and say, no, depreciation should be based on 16,000. They didn't take enough. So we're going to debit depreciation expense, 4,000. And we're going to, excuse me, 400. And we're going to credit accumulated depreciation, 400. That takes care of everything you have to take care of in that problem. Now, I'm not going to make you do this, but what if it was a gain? What if instead you had an intercompany gain? Just reverse everything. Now you would debit gain 4,000, credit plant and equipment 4,000, debit accumulated depreciation 400, credit depreciation expense 400. I hope that makes sense to you. If it was an intercompany gain, just reverse everything. If you saw an intercompany gain here, you would debit gain 4,000, credit plant and equipment 4,000, debit accumulated depreciation 400, credit depreciation expense 400. So everything just gets reversed. Here's what I'd like you to do. Before you come to the next class, make sure you do the next set, Pern and Scroll. It's a good set. It's a set of two questions. Your assignment is to have those done before you come to the next class. I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on the elimination entries that you make in a consolidation, specifically eliminating intercompany activity. And in our last class, I asked you to do Pern and Scroll before coming to this class. So let's look at Pern and Scroll, and you see what it is. It's a little test on eliminating intercompany profits and eliminating intercompany sale of fixed assets. So we'll go to the first question. It says, in Pern's December 31 consolidating worksheet, how much intercompany profit would be eliminated from inventory? Well, as I said in our last class, when you see intercompany sales with profits, right away you think of the checklist. Three things I have to do. Eliminate the intercompany sales, eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable, and eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. So that checklist is in your head. Now, how about the intercompany sales themselves? Well, notice the sales to scroll from Pern were 100,000. So the first elimination entry that you'd make, you would debit sales 100,000 and you'd credit cost of goods sold 100,000. Now that's not going to affect your answer to this question, but I'd like you to be disciplined. You know, what, what is it, you know, in total I have to do? Because depending on the question, it can matter. And as I say, as a student, you want to be disciplined and you get in the habit of what is, what is the, what is the grand total of what I have to do when I see intercompany sales with profits. So that's the first thing I'd have to do, eliminate the sales themselves. I would have to debit sales 100,000, credit cost of goods sold 100,000. If I were doing a consolidating worksheet to Pern and Scroll, that's the first adjustment I'd make. The second thing I would do is I would eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. Apparently, there isn't any. We're not told of any. We don't have balance sheet accounts. But you think of it. I want you to think of it because it's something that could be there. Now, the third thing is to eliminate the intercompany profit. Did you notice they said in the additional information that the sales by Pern to Scroll are made on the same terms as they make the third parties? So the parent is selling to the sub here on the same terms they sell to anybody else. So if you look at the income statement for Pern, the parent's Pern is showing total sales, 500000 cost of goods sold, three fifty, gross profit, one fifty. So didn't the parent make $150,000 gross profit on 500,000 of sales? If you take 150,000 over 500,000, the gross profit percentage for Pern is 30%, 150 over 500. And if Pern is selling to Scroll on the same terms they sell to anybody else, Pern must have sold to Scroll at a 30% gross profit margin. So if we know 100,000 of merchandise went from Pern to Scroll times 30%, that's answer A, and a lot of students would pick that. You take, oh, the gross profit percentage is 30%. Take 30% of the sales, 100,000, hell, low A. So many students go for A. What did that student forget? You don't eliminate all the profit. You only eliminate profit if it's still in inventory. So what you had to figure out is how much of this intercompany merchandise is still in the sub's inventory. 100,000 of merchandise went from the parent to the sub, from Pern to Scroll. 
but how much is still on hand? Look at scrolls cost of goods sold. Notice 80,000 of scrolls cost of goods sold is from the merchandise that came from the parent. Do you see that? 80,000. 80,000 of the goods they sold came from the merchandise that came from the parent. So 100,000 of merchandise went from the parent to the sub, but then the sub turned around and sold 80,000 outsiders in their cost of goods sold. So how much intercompany merchandise is still on hand? 20,000 times 30% gross profit margin. The answer is D. You'd have to eliminate 6,000 profit from inventory. You'd credit, if you were consolidating this enterprise, you'd credit inventory 6,000, and you would debit cost of goods sold 6,000. Because if ending inventory is overstated by this profit, cost of goods sold is understated by this profit. The answer is D. Remember, you only eliminate profit if it's still in inventory. Now the next question says, what amount would be depreciation expense in the consolidated income statement? Well, if you look at the income statements about halfway down, notice the total depreciation for the parent is 40000 For the sub 10, add it up, 40 plus 10, hello, A. You know it's not that simple because there's an intercompany sale of fixed assets. The second bullet of additional information says that equipment purchased by the sub from the parent for 36000 on January 1 is depreciated using straight line over four years. Well, we have an intercompany sale of fixed assets, so what, you, what is your checklist? Eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. Was there any intercompany gain or loss? Sure, look at the income statement. Towards the bottom, you'll see gain on sale of equipment to, the, to scroll, 12000 You might want to circle that. There was a $12,000 intercompany gain. So that's point number one. You have to eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. You have to adjust the asset. It's either over or stated. It's either over or understated, and you have to adjust depreciation. Like I say, that checklist, if you get it down, helps you get organized. Eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. You have to adjust the asset. It's either over or understated, and you have to adjust depreciation. All right, so we know from looking at the income statement, there was a $12,000 gain on the sale of the equipment to the sub. So what's the first adjustment I would make? I would debit gain 12000 There can't be an intercompany gain. You can't earn a gain with yourself. It's all one company. So I would debit gain 12000 and I would credit equipment 12000 because it's overstated on the parent's books. The parent has it on the books at 36000 Should be at the parent's. Excuse me. The parent has, has it on the books at 36000 Should be on the books at what it cost the sub, which must have been 24000 It's overstated. So notice that entry takes care of the first two problems. If I debit gain 12000 because you can't earn a gain with yourself, it's all one company, and I credit equipment 12000 then I've eliminated the intercompany gain, and the asset is no longer overstated. Now what's left? I have to adjust depreciation. I have to take that $12,000 gain, divide by four straight line years, and I have to debit accumulated depreciation 3000 and credit depreciation expense 3000 they took too much. The parent would have based depreciation on $36,000. they are ignorant. They don't know any better. We consolidate the enterprise. We say, no, depreciation should have been based on the sub's cost, which would be $24,000. Depreciation is overstated. So I would have to credit depreciation expense $3,000. Again, that's the $12,000 gain over four straight line years. Credit depreciation expense $3,000. Debit accumulated depreciation $3,000. So when they ask us, what is depreciation expense? In the consolidated income statement, it's the 40 on the parents' books plus the 10 on the subs' books, 50, minus our consolidating adjustment, 3, 47,000. Answer B. Now, there's one more intercompany activity item that the exam really likes, and that's intercompany bonds. If you look at illustrated problem number one, it says the sub had... 6% bonds outstanding. They pay interest semi-annually July 1 and January 1. And on July 1, the parent bought 100,000 of the sub's bonds. And we have to make our consolidating adjustments. Well, I have another checklist for you. You knew I would. And I love threes. Let's go over the checklist. I don't care whether the parent buys the sub's bonds or the sub buys the parent's bonds. Don't get hung up on that. It doesn't matter whether the parent buys the sub's bonds, sub buys the parent's bonds. You've got three things you have to do. First, you have to eliminate the investment and the debt. That's number one. Eliminate the investment and the debt. Number two, eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. So again, step one, 
eliminate the investment and the debt. Step two, eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. You memorize that checklist. All right, so let's go through it. How would I eliminate the investment and the debt? Well, if the parent buys 100000 of the sub's bonds, remember, bonds are a debt security. These are bonds payable on the sub books. So we'd have to eliminate the bonds payable to ourselves. See, the problem with intercompany bond holding is this entity, it's all one entity, has a debt to itself now. So I'm going to debit bonds payable 100000 This entity cannot have a debt to itself. That's the problem with intercompany bond holding. So I'm going to debit bonds payable 100000 And trust me, on the parents' books, you'd see investment in bonds, 100000 You can't invest in your own securities either. So credit investment in bonds, 100000 That's your first adjustment. That's eliminating the investment and the debt. If I debit bonds payable 100000 that eliminates the debt. You can't have a debt to yourself. And if I credit investment in bonds, 100000 that eliminates the investment problem because you can't invest in your own security. Now, notice this came out nice and even. I have to show you this. Notice the bonds payable was 100000 The investment in bonds was 100000 But let me show you what could happen. Let's say you're in the exam and you say, all right, Bob said eliminate the investment and the debt. So I debit bonds payable for the 100000 I eliminate the debt. But when I look on the spreadsheet, investment in bonds is at 105000 So I credit investment in bonds 105000 It doesn't balance. Well, I want you to know if it doesn't balance, it's because there's discounts and premiums in there somewhere. The parent must have had to pay a $5,000 premium to get the bonds back. Well, the way we do this, it almost really doesn't matter. You would just plug a loss on retirement of bonds. You would just simply plug a loss on retirement of bonds of 5000 And that loss would go to the consolidated income statement. All right, let me show you another possibility. You're in the exam and you say, well, Bob said eliminate the investment and the debt. So you debit bonds payable 100000 You get rid of the debt. But when you look on the spreadsheet, investment in bonds is at 96000 See, the parent must have got the bonds back at a discount. So you would debit bonds payable 100000 get rid of the debt, credit investment in bonds, 96000 If it doesn't balance, it means there's discounts and premiums there somewhere, you would just plug a gain on retirement of bonds, 4000 Let me summarize my point. What I always tell my students is this. When you're doing a consolidation, get rid of the debt, whatever the balance is, because you can't have a debt to yourself. Get rid of the investment, whatever the balance is on the spreadsheet, because you can't have an investment in yourself. And if it doesn't balance at that point, there's got to be some discounts and premiums in there, and it's no big deal. If you need a debit to balance the entry out, it's a loss on retirement. If you need a credit, it's a gain on retirement. It really is that simple. I'm trying to sh show you a simple way out of a tricky little problem. So if you need a debit to balance the entry out, it's a loss on retirement of bonds. If you need a credit to balance the entry out, it's a gain on retirement of bonds. Now, in this, pro in this problem, it was nice. In this illustrated problem, we just debited bonds payable 100000 credit investment in bonds 100000 and it all evened out, no problem. There were no discounts and premiums. But you know what the bottom line is? And I, I know you already see it. For consolidation purposes, intercompany bond holdings are retired. That's what you're seeing in this entry for consolidation purposes. Intercompany bond holdings are retired. All right, now the second thing we have to take care of, we have to eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. Eliminate, number two, any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time interest was paid? July 1. When's it going to be paid again? Tomorrow morning, January 1. We're on December 31 doing consolidated statements. And I want you to know that's always how this calculation for crude interest is going to go. It's going to go from the last time interest was paid, in this case July 1, up to the day of your consolidation, December 31. What we're dealing with here is six months of accrued interest. It always goes from the last time interest was paid, July 1, up to the day you're consolidating, in this case December 31. So what we're dealing with here is six months of accrued interest. The math's not bad. We're going to take 6% of 100000 That's 6000 of interest for a full year. But I don't want a full year. I want a half year, six months. It's $3,000. So what's my entry? Debit, accrued interest payable, $3,000. Credit, accrued interest receivable, $3,000. Why? Because this entity cannot have any kind of payables and receivables with itself. You're going to debit 
interest payable 3,000. Why? Because there's an interest payable on the sub book. You're going to credit interest receivable 3,000. There's an interest receivable on the parent's book. But it's an intercompany payable receivable. And this entity is all one entity now. You cannot have payables and receivables of any kind, payables and receivables of any kind with yourself. So debit accrued interest payable, credit accrued interest receivable, 3000 Now the third thing you take care of would be any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. So now I make another entry where I debit interest revenue 3000 You can't earn revenue with yourself and credit interest expense 3000 You can't incur expenses with yourself. So now you deal with the income statement problem. So I'm going to debit interest revenue 3000 because the parent made revenue here. You can't make revenue with yourself. I'm going to credit interest expense 3000 That's an expense on the sub book. You can't incur an expense with yourself. So debit interest revenue, credit interest expense 3000 and that'll take care of it. Let's go to a problem. If you go to the next problem, Wagner. Wagner, a holder of a million dollars of Palmer's bonds, collected the interest on March 31 and then sold the bonds to Seal for 975000 On that date, Palmer owned 75% of Seal. Palmer owned 75% of Seal. So you see what happened. When Wagner sells a million dollars of Palmer, let's call it parent, when instead of Palmer and Seal, let's say parent and sub, maybe that'll make it clearer. When Wagner sells a million dollars of the parent, Palmer's bonds, to the sub, Seal, well, now the sub is holding the parent's bonds. There's an intercompany bond holding. They say, on that date, Palmer, a 75% owner of Seal, had a million and seventy-five thousand dollar carrying value for the bonds. What was the effect of the sub's purchase of the parents' bonds on retained earnings and minority interest when we do the March 31 consolidated statements? Well, we go through our checklist. The first thing we have to deal with is eliminate the investment and the debt. And by the way, that's all we have to deal with here. We don't have to worry about the second step. Eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable, or the third step, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. There's been no intercompany interest because Wagner sold the bonds to the sub, SEAL, on March 31, and we're doing the consolidated statements on March 31, the same day. So the sub has not earned any interest from the parent. So I hope you see that we don't have to worry about intercompany interest payable, interest receivable, intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. We don't have to worry about that. All we have to worry about here is the first step. Eliminate the investment and the debt. So let's do it. If we were consolidating Palmer and Seal, we're going to debit bonds payable a million, and we're going to debit unamortized premium 75000 Didn't they say that Palmer had a million and $75,000 carrying value for the bonds on the parents' books, on Palmer's books? So to eliminate the debt, we're going to debit bonds payable a million, debit unamortized premium 75000 because the bonds have a carrying value on the parents' books of a million and seventy-five thousand. There must be a seventy-five thousand dollar premium on those bonds. So debit bonds payable a million, debit unamortized premium seventy-five thousand. The point is, you can't have an outstanding debt to yourself. Now what do we do? Get rid of the investment. Credit investment in bonds for nine hundred and seventy-five thousand. Didn't Seal buy the bonds for nine seventy-five? So Seal has an investment in bonds at nine hundred and seventy-five thousand. So credit. Investment in bonds, 975000 because you can't have an investment in yourself. So we get rid of the debt, we get rid of the investment. Now, what did I say before? Get rid of the debt, whatever the balance is. Get rid of the investment, whatever the balance is. And when it doesn't balance, as it does not here, it's because you got discounts and premiums in there. No big deal. To balance the entry out, I need a credit of 100000 That's a gain on retirement of bonds. That is a gain on retirement of bonds. All right, now, we've got the entry. Now let's look at the answers. It's a little tricky. Remember I said for consolidation purposes, intercompany bond holdings are basically retired. Whose bonds are being retired here? Notice it's the parent's bonds. It's Palmer's bonds being retired. So that gain would go really belong to the parent because it's the parent's bonds being retired. That gain on retirement really belongs to the parent. Minority interest would have nothing to do with it. And the answer is A. Again, because it's the parent's bonds, because it's Palmer's bonds that are being retired, that gain really belongs to the parent. Minority interest would have nothing to do with that gain. And the answer is A. Now, you have to be careful. What if Palmer, same facts, 
What if Palmer had bought Seals bonds for 975? Same facts. If Palmer had bought Seals bonds for 975, I do the same entry. Remember, it doesn't matter whether the parent owns the sub's bonds, sub owns the parent's bonds. You go through the same steps. But if the, if the parent had bought the sub's bonds here, if, pa if Palmer had bought Seals bonds for 975000 the entry would be identical. But now that $100,000 gain would belong to the sub and minority interest, 25%, would pick up their share. And the answer would be B. The answer would be B if it was parent buying the sub's bonds. So minority interest can come into it. But because this is Palmer's bonds being retired, minority interest has nothing to do with it. And the answer is A. Make sure you know those checklists. Make sure you know the checklist on how to deal with intercompany sales with profits, intercompany sale of fixed assets, intercompany bonds. Be ready for those three intercompany types of transactions. And of course, be able to do the main elimination entry in your sleep. And I know you will. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. I'll see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on consolidated financial statements. And you remember that in our previous classes, we've said that if you get a simulation on consolidation with a spreadsheet, there are really two major steps to breaking that simulation down. You have to, number one, eliminate the investment account. And number two, eliminate all the intercompany financial activity. Eliminate the investment account and eliminate all the intercompany financial activity. What we're going to do in this class is apply what we've learned to a simulation. And if you look at your viewer's guide, you'll see Jared and Munson. So just imagine that you're in the exam. You've done testlet number one. You've finished testlet number two. You've finished testlet number three. You've done all the multiple choice. And then you open up your first simulation and what you're faced with is Jared and Munson, and typical of many simulations, there's a lot of information. It says, on April 1 of the current year, Jared purchased 80% of the common stock of Munson Manufacturing for $6 million. At the date of purchase, the book and fair values of Munson's and the assets and liabilities were as follows. So they give us a list of Munson's book values, fair values on the day of purchase for all the assets and liabilities. And then it says by year end, December 31, the following transactions had occurred during the year. The first bullet says the balance of Munson's net accounts receivable at April 1 had been collected. The inventory on hand April 1 had been charged to cost of sales. Munson does use a perpetual inventory system when accounting for inventory. Prior to this year, Jared had purchased at face value 1500000 of Munson's 7% subordinated debentures or bonds. These debentures mature in seven years on October 31 with interest payable annually on October 31. As of April 1, the day of purchase, the machinery and equipment had an estimated remaining life of six years. Munson uses straight line. Munson's depreciation expense calculation for the nine months end of December 31 was based on the old depreciation rates. The other assets consist entirely of long-term investments made by Munson, do not include any investment in Jared. And then they say, during the last nine months of the year, the following intercompany transactions occurred between Jared and Munson. And you can see that we have one of the situations the exam likes the most, intercompany sales with profits. Jared's been selling merchandise to Munson. Munson's been selling merchandise to Jared. Some of that intercompany merchandise is still included in the purchaser's inventory. December 31, there's also a balance unpaid. Jared sells merchandise to Munson at cost, so there's no profit in the Jared to Munson column. But Munson sells merchandise to Jared at a regular selling price, and that includes a normal gross profit margin of 35%. There were no intercompany sales between the companies prior to April 1. So we've got intercompany sales, intercompany profits. There's a balance unpaid. Then they have an odd point. Accrued interest on intercompany debt is recorded by both companies in their respective accounts receivable 
and accounts payable accounts. Just something odd we have to keep in mind. That if there's any interest payable, it's in accounts payable. If there's any interest receivable, they have it in, in they have it in accounts receivable. Who knows why? This business combination is being accounted for under the acquisition method. And that's a very good thing because it's the only acceptable method. So it's good that they did that. Now, on the next page, you can see that we were given the spreadsheet on December 31. Remember, our job in this simulation is, con is to consolidate Jared and Munson on December 31. And they gave us, you know, you click on the spreadsheet, it comes up, and a couple of things I'd like you to notice. About halfway down, you can see big as life, investment in Munson Manufacturing. It's on Jared's trial balance at $6 million. And that makes sense because Jared purchased 80% of the shares for $6 million. Just below there, investment in Munson Bonds for $1.5 million. Five. That makes sense because Jared did purchase Munson Bonds for $1.5 million. Five. All right, so we've clicked on to this simulation. We're faced with this massive problem we have to deal with, but I don't care how massive it is. The minute you see a consolidation simulation that has a spreadsheet, you know right away two huge steps must be done to break it down. Eliminate the investment account, eliminate the intercompany activity. Eliminate the investment account, eliminate the intercompany activity. So we'll start together by eliminating that investment account. And you know the way I like to do this. Let's start with a couple of preliminary calculations. Don't I know that Jared purchased 80% of Munson shares for $6 million? So we're going to set up an equation. 80% of X. X stands for what? The value of 100% of Munson shares. That's what X stands for. 80% of X. What would be a value, the value of 100% of Munson shares? Equals $6 million. So we divide both sides by 80%. So what it comes down to is that X, the total value of 100% of Munson shares, equals that 6 million divided by 80%. And if you take 6 million and divide by 80%, it comes out to 7,500,000. So we've inferred, haven't we? We've inferred that the total value, the total fair value of 100% of Munson shares must be 7,500,000. Now, once we have that number, we can, we can figure out a couple of important points. If someone had purchased 100% of Munson shares, theoretically, they would have had to pay 7500000 What are the net assets worth? Well, if you look at the problem, look at the fair value column. The fair value of the assets add up to $10,715,000. The liabilities are $5,515,000. So the fair value of the sub's net assets on the day of purchase comes out to 5 million two. 10 million 715 minus 5 million 515. 5 million two. So you see my point. If someone had purchased 100% of Munson shares, they would have had to pay 7,500,000 for net assets that are worth 5 million two. So the total goodwill in this acquisition comes out to 2,300,000. 2,300,000. We can also figure something else out. We know that if Jared owns 80% of Munson shares, then the minority interest or the non-controlling interest owns the other 20% of Munson's outstanding shares, the other 20% of Munson's net assets. So since under the acquisition method, our job is to value that non-controlling interest at its full fair value, we can figure that out now, can't we? Because if the total value of 100% of Munson shares equals 7,500,000 ,000, and the non-controlling interest shareholders own 20% of that stock. You take 20% of 7 million five, it comes out to 1,500,000. So don't we know that as of the day of purchase, as of April 1, the total value, the total fair value of the non-controlling interest shares comes out to 1,500,000. I think it's just good to know these numbers. Before you begin, figure out the total goodwill, figure out the value of the non-controlling interest because you can use that as a way to check your work. All right, so now with that preliminary analysis out of the way, let's get to our main job. Step one, eliminate the investment account. And I gave you a checklist on this. And eventually you've promised me that you're going to memorize this checklist. Remember, there are three steps to getting rid of the investment account. What are they? You know them. 
record the goodwill, write the sub's net assets to fair value, eliminate the capital structure of the sub, record the goodwill, write the sub's net assets to fair value, and eliminate the capital structure of the subsidiary. So let's do our first entry. Let's record the goodwill. We know the goodwill adds up to 2300000 as of the day of purchase, as of April 1. So we're going to debit goodwill, 2300000 And that goodwill, we're, we're actually establishing the goodwill account. If you look on your spreadsheet, goodwill is on there for you to fill in. Goodwill will be carried over to the consolidated balance sheet. If you do a formal consolidated balance sheet, you show the goodwill as an intangible asset. It's the goodwill in the purchase. It has to be recorded. So we're going to debit goodwill, 2300000 We're going to credit the investment account. Now we're starting to eliminate the investment account. We're going to credit investment in Munson for 80% of that goodwill or $1,840,000. And we're going to start to build our non-controlling interest account, credit non-controlling interest for 20% of the goodwill, 20% of $2 million three, or 460000 So we recorded the goodwill. We started to lower the investment account and we're starting to build our non-controlling interest account. Now, step two, we have to write the sub's net assets to fair value. This is an important adjustment that must be made in the acquisition method. The sub's net assets must be written to fair value. So if you go back to the simulation and you go to the book value and the fair value column, obviously there's no difference between book value and fair value for cash, accounts receivable, but look at the inventory. The inventory has a book value of 828000 But on the day of purchase, the fair value of the inventory was only 700000 So we have to adjust that. And remember, in the additional information, it said that the inventory on hand April 1 had been charged to cost of sales. That's the second bullet in the additional information. Furthermore, Munson uses the perpetual inventory system in accounting for inventory. So the point is that if we want to adjust that beginning inventory, we're going to have to do it through cost of sales. If you look on your spreadsheet, cost of sales is there. And if the beginning inventory was overstated, which it was, they charge beginning inventory to cost of sales at 828000 The entity should have charged beginning inventory to cost of sales at its fair value, 700000 So beginning inventory was overstated, therefore cost of sales is overstated. I'm going to credit cost of sales. Cost of goods sold, 128000 Then we know land has a book value of one million five sixty and a fair value of $2,000,001. i am going to debit the land, 540000 I have to write the subs net assets to fair value. Machinery and equipment. We, ha we have to write that from a book value of seven million eight fifty. To a fair value of $10,600,000, i am going to debit machinery and equipment, $2,750,000. Also, we're going to write accumulated depreciation from book value $3,250,000 to fair value $4,000,000. i am going to credit accumulated depreciation, $750,000. Now, it's odd how they did this, coming up with the fair value of accumulated depreciation. But the objective, however they, however they decided to approach this, the objective was to write the machinery and equipment to its fair value, which must be what? 10 million six minus 4 million, 6 million six. So there's a number of ways you could do that. They chose to come up with an estimated fair value of accumulated depreciation. But however you do this, your job here was to write the machinery and equipment up to its fair value, which must be 6 million six. The other assets will be written from a book value of 140,000 to a fair value of 50,000. So I'm going to credit other assets, 90,000. On the day of purchase, you have to write the subs net assets to fair value. It's a major adjustment that you make in the acquisition method. All right, now think what we've done here. Look at the totals. Didn't we just, in this entry, write the subs net assets from a book value of 8,393 to a fair value of 10,715? Didn't we just write the subs net assets up 2,322,000. Again, that's 10,715 minus 8,393. We just wrote the subs net assets up 2,322,000. So I'm going to credit investment in sub for 80% of 2,322,000 or 1,857,600. Credit investment in sub for 1,857,600.
and I'm going to credit the non-controlling interest for 20% of 2322 or 464,400. So we've written the subs net assets to fair value. And now our third step, we have to eliminate the capital structure of the subsidiary. Notice on April 1, the sub Munson is showing common stock of a million, additional paid in capital of 872,000, and retained earnings of a million and 6,000. And if you look on your spreadsheet, which is dated December 31, look at common stock, APIC, and retained earnings for the sub Munson, same numbers. Notice we have the beginning balances because we have trial balances here. These numbers haven't been adjusted yet for the current net income. That will happen after we make our adjustments to the trial balance. But we know that in consolidation, we always eliminate 100% of the capital structure of the sub. So I'm going to debit the sub's common stock for a million. I'm going to debit the sub's APIC for 872000 I'm going to debit the sub's retained earnings for a million and 6000 We always eliminate 100% of the capital structure of the sub because there is no sub. You know that. Munson has been consumed by Jared. Munson no longer exists. So we debit the sub's common stock, a million. We debit the sub's APIC, 872000 And we debit the sub's retained earnings, a million and 6000 As you know, there's only one capital structure that we'd ever carry over to the consolidated balance sheet. And that's the capital structure of the parent. Parent is the surviving entity. Now what do I do? Well, the net assets of the sub, if you add up a million plus 872,000 plus a million and 6,000, the net assets of the sub add up to what? 2,878,000. I'm going to credit the investment account, investment in Munson, for 80% of 2,878,000 or 2,302,400. Credit investment in Munson for 80% of 2,878,000, the net assets of the sub. So credit investment Munson, 2,302,400, and I'll credit the non-controlling interest for 20% of the net assets, 20% of 2,878,000, or 575,600. Now look at the three entries that we just made. Does everything reconcile? Well, look at the three credits to non-controlling interest. Didn't we credit non-controlling interest for 460000 when we recorded the goodwill? Didn't we credit non-controlling interest for 464400 when, when we wrote the sub's net assets to fair value? And didn't we credit the non-controlling interest for 575600 when we eliminated the capital structure of the sub? If you add it up, if you add up 460000 plus 464400 plus 575600, it adds up to one million five, and doesn't that make sense? Because didn't we know when we started that the non-controlling interest account on April one, the day of acquisition, should add up to twenty percent of seven million five? The total value of all the sub stock is seven million five. Non-controlling interest has a twenty percent interest in those shares. Twenty percent of seven million five is one million five. How about the credits to investment in sub? Well, there's three of them. We credited investment in Munson for 1840000 dollars when we recorded the goodwill. We credited investment in Munson for 1857600 dollars when we wrote the subs net assets to fair value. And we credited investment in Munson for 2302400 when we eliminated the capital structure of the sub. If you add that up. If you add up 1,840,000 plus 1,857,600 plus 2,302,400, what's it add up to? Six million. The balance in the investment account. That's been written down to zero because you can't invest in yourself. How many companies are there? One. There's only one economic entity. How does this account make any sense? Investment in myself. It's nonsense. And the investment account has to be eliminated. And that's the first major thing you do in any simulation on consolidation. And it takes those three entries. It takes those three steps. So you memorize that checklist. And I think you'll be ready for any simulation they give you on consolidation. Because you have to be ready for the acquisition method. And you have to be ready to eliminate that investment account. All right, now that we've eliminated the investment account, 
all that's left is what? You go through the additional information and eliminate any intercompany financial activity that must be eliminated. And if you do that, you've done the problem. That's our second major step in any simulation on consolidation. Go through the additional information. Go through the remaining tabs, one tab at a time. Look for any intercompany financial activity that must be eliminated. And if you eliminate all that intercompany financial activity, there's nothing else to do. What I'd like you to do is this. I'd like you to shut the class down. And before you come to the next class, promise me now, before you come to the next class, see if you know how to eliminate. Test yourself here. See if you know how to eliminate all that intercompany financial activity. You know, give yourself 20 minutes. But do it before you come to the next class. And in the next class, we'll go through the elimination entries together. I'll look to see you there. Welcome back. I hope you tried going through the additional information, looking for the intercompany activity, making the elimination entries, because I think you need practice like this. Let's now do it together. It says by year end, December 31, the following transactions had occurred. First, the balance of Munson's net accounts receivable on April 1 had been collected. Nothing there. The inventory on hand April 1 had been charged to cost of sale. We needed that information to write the beginning inventory to fair value. We have dealt with that. First thing you had to think about is the third bullet down. Prior to this year, prior to this year, when they were not apparent and sub, Sharad had purchased at face value 1,500,000 of Munson's 7% subordinated debentures, or bonds. The debentures mature in seven years on October 31, with interest payable annually on October 31. So here's what you had to think about. Since these bonds were purchased before they were apparent and sub, do they have to be retired? Remember we said in our previous class that for consolidation purposes, intercompany bondholdings have to be retired. But how about if the bonds were purchased way before they were apparent and sub? Do I worry about them? Of course we do. Doesn't matter when they bought the bonds. Now, when they bought the bonds could affect our interest calculations, but it doesn't matter when they bought the bonds. You cannot publish, you cannot publish consolidated statements and show that you have a debt to yourself, show that you have an investment in your own securities whenever they were purchased. So don't let that bog you down. They still have to be eliminated. So our first entry, you know what to do because you go back to the checklist. Eventually, you have to memorize these checklists. You might not be there yet, but when you take the exam, you've got these checklists down. When I see intercompany bonds, what are the three things I have to do? There's always three things on my checklist. Eliminate the investment and the debt. Eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. Eliminate the investment and the debt. Eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. That's what's reverberating in your head when you're in the exam because you memorize that checklist. And as I've said to you before, the reason I give you a checklist is a way to be sure you're doing everything you have to do with these bonds. All right, so let's eliminate the investment and the debt. If you went to the spreadsheet, you saw that Munson is showing subordinated debentures, basically bonds payable, of $5 million. Do I eliminate all $5 million? No, just the intercompany portion. So we're going to debit subordinated debentures. Same thing as bonds payable. These are, the, these are debentures, though. They're unsecured. Notice they're subordinated to other claims. In other words, they're junk bonds. That's what these are. Debentures, junk bonds. They're not secured debt. So if the corporation were to liquidate, this debt would be subordinated to claims by other debt holders. So they're junk bonds, not very good bonds. But anyway, we're going to debit subordinated debentures. Same thing as bonds payable. One million five hundred thousand. And we're going to credit in and why are we debiting subordinated debentures? One million five? Because this entity is not allowed to have an outstanding debt to itself. That's the problem with intercompany bond holdings. Jared and Munson are now one economic entity. Don't forget that single entity concept. And the bottom line is this entity is not allowed to have an outstanding debt to itself. So we're going to debit subordinated debentures, basically bonds payable, a million five. And we're going to credit investment in Munson, credit investment in Munson bonds, one million five. And why am I crediting? 
investment in Munson Bond, a million five, because this entity cannot invest in its own securities. And notice the entry balances. There are no discounts and premiums to worry about. And that's always something to be grateful for. Just debit subordinated ventures and credit investment in Munson Bond, a million five. We've eliminated the investment and the debt. Let's go to step two. We're now going to eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. What's the first question on this? When was the last time interest was paid? When was the last time interest was paid? October 31. Remember, the interest is paid annually on October 31. So the last time it was paid is October 31. What's the date of our spreadsheet? December 31. So as of the date of our spreadsheet, there's accrued interest for what? November, December. We're talking, about, we're talking about two months of accrued interest. It always goes, this calculation for accrued interest always goes from the last time interest was paid, in this case, October 31, up to the day of your consolidation, December 31. So as of the day of our consolidation, December 31, there are two months of accrued interest for November and December. So let's work it out. I'm going to take the interest rate, 7%, times a million five. What is that? That's 105,000 of interest for a full year, but I don't want a full year. I just want November, December, two twelfths, one-sixth of 105,000 or 17,500. We're going to debit what? We're going to debit accounts payable, 17,500. We're going to credit accounts receivable, 17,500. Remember that odd point towards the bottom. It said accrued interest on intercompany debt is recorded by both companies in their respective accounts receivable and accounts payable accounts. Who knows why? So with that in mind, we have to debit accounts payable. I think you know we're really debiting interest payable, 17.5. And we're going to have to credit accounts receivable. I think you know we're really crediting interest receivable, 17.5. But you have to eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable, and you know why it has to be done. Because Jarrett and Munson are one economic entity, and this entity cannot have any type of payables and receivables with itself. And then finally, step three, we have to eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. Now you have to think about this. When did Jared acquire Munson Bonds? Prior to this year. So didn't Jared own Munson's Bonds for all 12 months of the current year? We all agree on that, right? That Jared owned Munson's Bonds for all 12 months of the current year. But let's agree on this too. Any interest revenue earned by Jared from Munson for January, February, and March is not a problem because that was before they were a parent and sub. That was before they were one economic entity. That was an arm's length transaction. But all the intercompany interest revenue and expense for April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December for the last nine months is a problem because you're earning interest revenue, you're incurring interest expenses with yourself. So it's the last nine months that's a problem. So we're going to take the interest rate 7% times a million five. That's 105,000 of interest for a full year, but I don't want a full year. I just want April 1st to December 31, nine twelfths of that. Nine twelfths of 105,000 or 78,750. We're going to debit interest revenue, 78,750. Why? Because you can't earn revenue with yourself. We're going to credit interest expense, 78750 Why? Because you can't incur expenses with yourself. And that'll take care of it. You do that checklist, you've taken care of the bonds. That's why you've promised me you're going to memorize these checklists. I really think they help. All right, so we've taken care of the bonds. Let's read on. As of April 1, the machinery and equipment had an estimated remaining life of six years. Munson uses straight line. And Munson's depreciation expense calculation for the Nine months end of December 31 was based on the old rates. So if you look on the spreadsheet and you find depreciation expense, machinery and equipment, it's 588750 That's what the sub took. Question is, what should the entity take? And I think you see the problem. The problem is that we wrote the machinery and equipment to its fair value. What's the fair value of the machinery and equipment? Well, it's $10 million six minus accumulated depreciation of $4 million. There's that odd thing where they worked out the fair value of accumulated depreciation, but the fair value of the machinery and equipment would be 10 million six minus 4 million, 6 million six. The point is that as of April 1, 
Who owns that machinery and equipment? The entity does. Munson no longer exists. Munson has been consumed by Jared. So as of April 1, the entity owns these fixed assets. So the entity should take nine months depreciation, April 1 to December 31, nine months depreciation based on their cost, which is fair value, six million six. So let's work it out. We're going to take that fair value, six million six, divide by six straight line years. This machinery and equipment still has a remaining life of six years. So divide by six straight line years. What is that? That's 1,100,000 of depreciation for a full year. Do we want a full year? No. Just April 1st to December 31. That's how long the entity has owned the fixed assets. So multiply by 9 twelfths. What the entity should take for depreciation is 825000 Now look at what the sub took on the spreadsheet, 588750 Your job is to adjust that depreciation from 588750 up to the depreciation the entity should take. That's 700, excuse me, that's 825,000. That's your job in this adjustment to adjust what the sub took based on the old rates, however they figured that out, which was 588,750, adjust that up to 825,000. The true depreciation expense for the entity based on fair value. That's the entity's cost for these assets. So we're going to debit depreciation expense, 236,250. And we're going to credit accumulated depreciation. 236250 We're going to adjust that depreciation up to 825000 based on fair value. This adjustment has to be made anytime in a consolidation. You have written depreciable assets from book value to fair value. That's going to require a depreciation adjustment. Let's go back to the additional information. It says the other assets consist entirely of long-term investments made by Munson and do not include any investment in Jared, so there's nothing there. And then they say, during the last nine months of the year, the following intercompany transactions occurred. We've got intercompany sales with profits, and you've got another checklist, which I hope you thought about. Remember, it doesn't matter whether the parent is selling merchandise to the sub, the sub selling merchandise to the parent. You see this, you got to do three things. Eliminate the intercompany sales. Eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still an inventory. Always remember, you only eliminate the profit if it's still an inventory. So you got your checklist. So let's look at this thing. Let's go to the sales. Jared sold 158,000 of merchandise to Munson. Munson sold 230,000 of merchandise to Jared. Just add it up. Add up 158 plus 230, we're going to debit sales, 388,000. We're going to credit cost of goods sold, 388,000. And you know why? You cannot have sales with yourself. That's the problem on the sales side. You can't purchase your own merchandise. That's the problem on the purchaser side. Purchases are overstated. Therefore, cost of goods sold is overstated. So that's why we debit sales, 388,000, and credit cost of goods sold, 388,000. Because you can't have sales with yourself and you can't purchase your own merchandise. So sales are overstated. Purchases, therefore, cost of goods sold is overstated. Hopefully, you got that entry done right away. Now, the second thing on your checklist, you have to eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. And notice there's a balance unpaid at December 31. So you look at the Jared to Munson column. If there's a balance unpaid, there must be, what, 16,800 of an accounts receivable on Jared's book, right? There must be a 16,800 accounts receivable on Jared's books and a $16,800 account payable on Munson's books. Same thing in the Munson to Jared column. There's a balance unpaid, so there must be a $22,000 receivable, an accounts receivable on Munson's books, a $22,000 accounts payable on Jared's books. So you just add it up. Add up 16,800 plus 22,000. There's 38,000. 800 of intercompany accounts, payable accounts receivable. You know what to do. Debit accounts payable, 38,800. Credit accounts receivable, 38,800. Because you cannot have any type of payables and receivables with yourself. And now the third and final step. We have to eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still an inventory. Always remember, you only eliminate profit if it's still an inventory. And notice the second line down in this section. What's included in the purchaser's inventory? 
at December 31. Well, there's still 36,000 of this intercompany merchandise in Munson's ending inventory. Munson's the purchaser. Do I worry about that? No, because Jared sells merchandise to Munson at cost. So there's no profit in the 36,000. But look at the Munson and Jared column. Jared's the purchaser, and there's 12,000 of this intercompany merchandise in the purchaser's inventory. Jared's inventory, and Munson sells to Jared at a regular selling price. That includes a normal gross profit margin of 35%. So we're going to have to take 35% of 12,000. There's 4,200 of intercompany profit in the ending inventory of Jared, which is going to become the ending inventory for the consolidated entity. So take 35% of 12,000, and we're going to credit what? Inventory, 4,200. I always hope the credit makes a lot of sense, because our job in this adjustment is to get that intercompany profit out of inventory. And what do we debit? Well, if ending inventory is overstated by, by that profit, cost of goods sold is understated by that profit, and cost of goods sold or cost of sales is on your spreadsheet, and it's understated. So you're going to debit cost of sales, 4200 Only eliminate profit if it's still in inventory. And again, you might not be there yet, but eventually you memorize that checklist. All the checklists I've given you. And I think you'll really find they make it so that you're meticulous. You're doing everything you have to do if you get a big simulation on consolidation or you get multiple choice on consolidation. You're probably going to get one or the other or both. So you've got to be ready. Now, there's nothing else to worry about here. There's no other intercompany activity. So the problem is done. Just remember, in any simulation on consolidation, those are the two big steps you always have to do to break it down. Eliminate the investment account. You have a checklist on that. And then eliminate any intercompany transaction. Eliminate the investment account. Eliminate any intercompany transaction. You'll break it down. Now, before I see you in the next class, you'll see when you get to the next module that in your viewer's guide, there are six multiple choice at the beginning of the next module. Six multiple choice. Promise me, you'll get those done. Get those six multiple choice done. Get your six answers before you open the class. Because I'm going to start by going over those questions. And it's very important that you get your answers first. So get those answers, and I'll see you in the next class. Welcome back. As you know, in our last class, I asked you to do the six questions at the beginning of this module, before coming to the class. I wanted you to get your six answers before we went through the questions together, and I know you've done that, so let's look at the six questions. Number one says that Penn paid $300,000 for the outstanding stock of Star. So apparently, Penn purchased 100% of Star's shares. And as you know, that means there's no non-controlling interest, and if there's no non-controlling interest, that does simplify the problem. At that time, the sub-star had the following condensed balance sheet. The sub is showing current assets, 40000 plant and equipment, net, 380000 liabilities, 200000 and notice the sub-stockholder's equity adds up to 220000 You might want to circle that. There's the book value of the sub's net assets. Assets minus liabilities gives us total stockholder's equity, or the net assets in the corporation, 220000 Let's go right to the bottom. What amount of goodwill related to Star's acquisition would Penn report in the consolidated balance sheet? Well, they paid $300,000 for 100% of the stock. The net assets have a book value of $220,000. $300,000 minus two twenty. dollars There's 80000 of goodwill. Hello, answer D. And you know D is wrong. Because goodwill is not defined as what someone's willing to pay over book value for net assets. It's defined as what someone's willing to pay over fair value for net assets. And they went on to say that the fair value of the subs plant and equipment was 60000 more than it's recorded carrying them out. The fair value and carrying them out were equal for all other assets and liabilities. So if the book value of the subs net assets on the day of acquisition totaled 220000 total stockholders' equity, the fair value must have been 280000 When you write that plant and equipment up 60000 up to fair value, the fair value of the subs net assets, 280000 Now you can solve it. If the parent paid $300,000 for 100% of the stock and acquired net assets only worth fair value, 280000 
The rest must be goodwill. There's 20,000 of goodwill in that acquisition. And the answer is A. Same thing with number two. On November 30th, Parler purchased for cash at $15 a share all. There's no non-controlling interest here. None. They bought all 250,000 shares of the outstanding stock of Shaw. So if you take the 250,000 times 15, Parler paid 3750 for the stock. They say at November 30th, Shaw, the sub, has a balance sheet showing a carrying amount of net assets of $3 million. Now, here again, if you stop there and say, well, they paid $3,750,000 million for the stock, net assets of a book value $3 million, hello, A, goodwill is seven fifty, But goodwill is not defined as what someone's willing to pay over book value for net assets. It's defined as what someone's willing to pay over fair value for net assets. And they went on to say, at the time of acquisition, the fair value of Shaw's property, plant, and equipment exceeded its carrying amount by 400000 So if the book value of the sub's net assets on the day of acquisition totaled $3 million, when we write the equipment up 400000 the fair value of the sub's net assets on the day of acquisition must have been $3 million four, and then you can solve it. What happened in this problem is that Power paid $3,750,000 for net assets that have a fair value, three million four, there's three hundred and fifty thousand of goodwill in that acquisition, and the answer is C. As I say, when there's no non-controlling interest, that just makes the problem a lot easier to deal with. Let's do three and four. It's a set. On December thirty-one of the current year, Penny purchased eighty percent. So now there is a non-controlling interest. They purchased eighty percent of the outstanding stock of Sutton for one million one. On the purchase date, the book value of Sutton's net assets equaled a million. We don't care about the book value. And the fair value equaled one million, too. The business combination is accounted for under the acquisition method, and they want two things. Number one, in the current year consolidated balance sheet, what amount would be reported as goodwill? And number two, excuse me, number four, in the current year consolidated balance sheet, what amount would be reported as non-controlling interest? Well, let's do some calculations. We know that Penny purchased 80% of the substock for one million one. So can't we set up our equation? Can't we say 80% of X equals one million one? 80% of X, X would stand for the value of 100% of the substock equals one million one. We divide both sides by 80%, so you end up with X. The total value of 100% of the substock equals that one million one divided by 80%. If you take one million one divided by 80%, we infer that the value of 100% of the substock, X, equals 1375000 So the bottom line is, if someone had purchased 100% of Sutton stock, they would have had to pay $1,375,000 for net assets that have a fair value of one million two. The rest must be goodwill. There must be 175000 of goodwill. And the answer to number three is B, 175000 of goodwill. And as you know, that goodwill would be carried over to the consolidated balance sheet and would be, in t be tested for impairment annually, at least annually. Then in number four, in the current year consolidated balance sheet, what would be reported as non-controlling interest? Well, the acquisition was on December 31, and we know on December 31, the fair value of 100% of the substock would be 1375000 We just calculated that. The non-controlling interest owns 20% of that stock, take 20% of 1375000 the answer is D. The full fair value of the non-controlling interest we infer must be worth 275000 20% of 1375000 $1, Hopefully you do well on a set like that because you're getting more and more comfortable with the acquisition method. I just know you are. Number five. In, the December, in December 31 of the current year, Paxton purchased 80% of the outstanding stock of Small. On the purchase date, the book value of Small's net assets equaled 1800000 As you know, we don't care about the book value of the net assets. They also tell us the fair value of the net assets equal $2 million. That's what we care about. In the current year consolidated balance sheet, non-controlling interests were reported at 425000 Under the acquisition method, what amount would be reported as goodwill in the current year consolidated balance sheet? Now, again, 
The acquisition took place on December 31. We're doing a consolidated balance sheet immediately. What is the goodwill on that consolidated balance sheet? Well, the tricky thing in this problem is we don't know what Paxton paid for 80% of the stock. We don't know that. But we do know that in the current year consolidated balance sheet, non-controlling interests were reported at 425000 Don't the non-controlling interests own 20% of the capital stock of small? So we can set up the equation. 20% of X equals 425000 X would, again, stand for the value of 100% of the stock. So what you end up with is that X, the value of 100% of the sub-stock, equals that 425000 divided by 20%. If you divide it out, X equals 2125000 The value of 100% of the sub-stock must be worth, we infer, 2125000 $2, If somebody purchased 100% of the stock, they'd have to pay $2,125,000. And the net assets have a fair value of only $2 million. So there is. 125,000 of goodwill on the consolidated balance sheet on December 31. And the answer is C. Let's go to number six. On December 31 of the current year, Polly purchased 80% of the outstanding stock of Sachs for 480,000. On the purchase date, the fair value of Sachs's net assets equals 500,000, and the fair value of the non-controlling interest was determined to be 115,000 under the acquisition method. What amount would be reported as goodwill in the current year consolidated balance sheet? Well, if the parent paid 480000 for 80% 80 of the stock, wouldn't we assume that 100% of the stock is worth the 480000 divided by 80% or 600000 If somebody bought 100% of the stock, they'd have to pay 600000 for net assets worth 500000 so goodwill is 100000 right? But that's not an answer choice. I want you to see the difference in this question. Up till this point, we've had to infer what the value of 100% of the stock turns out to be. We've had to infer the fair value of the non-controlling interest. But here we're told that the fair value of the non-controlling interest was determined to be $115,000. we are given that value. So we have to look at it this way. The parent bought 80% of the stock for $480,000, and we're told that the fair value of the non-controlling interest shares was determined to be 115000 So add up 115000 plus 480000 We're told that the value of 100% of the stock is 595000 So if somebody bought 100% of the stock, they'd have to pay 595000 and receive net assets that have a fair value of 500000 The rest must be goodwill. There must be 95000 of goodwill in that acquisition. I've got to warn you that you may not have to infer the full fair value of the non-controlling interest. The exam may give it to you. If the exam gives it to you, you have to work with it. Maybe, the, maybe what was known is what the non-controlling interest shares were trading for on the, on the acquisition date, or maybe other, other valuation techniques were used, but somehow they were able to determine the full fair value of the non-controlling interest on the acquisition date was 115,000. If the exam gives you that number, then you don't infer it. You have to work with that number. And it's very possible the exam could go that way. So be careful. You don't always have to infer it. Not if the exam gives you the full fair value of the non-controlling interest. You work with that number, plus what the parent paid for the 80% of the shares. Then you know the value of 100% of the stock, and you can work out goodwill. Now, as we've said time and again, in these classes and in these problems, if the fair value of 100% of the stock is more than the fair value of the sub's net assets, the rest must be goodwill. What if the fair value of 100% of the stock is less than the fair value of the assets? This is what they would call a bargain purchase. If the fair value of 100% of the stock is less than the fair value of the assets, that means the acquisition was at a bargain. So what do you do then? Let me give you an example. It's in your viewer's guide. Let's assume that the parent purchased 90% of the sub-shares for $630,000. And on the acquisition date, we're given the sub-stockholders' equity section. 
The sub is showing common stock, 300000 Additional paid in capital, 100000 Retained earnings, 400000 So add it up. What is the book value of the sub's net assets? 300000 plus 100000 plus 400000 Let's agree that the book value of the subsidiary's net asset on the acquisition date total 800000 And then they go on to say that there's no difference between the book value and the fair value of the sub's net assets. So the fair value of the sub's net assets is 800000 So let's figure out what 100% of the stock is worth. We're going to set up our equation. 90% of X equals 630000 X, again, stands for the value of 100% of the sub shares. So wouldn't X equal the 630000 divided by 90%? X, the value of 100% of the sub stock, equals 700000 So you see the problem here. If somebody purchased 100% of the sub stock, they would have paid 700000 But they're acquiring net assets with a book and fair value of 800000 They got a bargain. So when you think about how you do a problem, we know we have to eliminate the investment account. The investment account in this case is 630000 I gave you a checklist. Three steps. First, we'd have to record the goodwill, but there's no goodwill here. Second, we'd have to write the sub's net assets to fair value. There's no difference between book and fair value. So let's go right, away, right to step three, where we eliminate the capital structure of the sub. So we're going to debit the sub's common stock, 300000 We're going to debit the sub's additional paid in capital, 100000 We're going to debit the sub's retained earnings, 400000 As you know, in consolidation, we always eliminate 100% of the capital structure of the sub, because there is no sub. It doesn't exist. The sub has been consumed by the parent. Now we're going to credit investment in sub 630000 We get that account down to zero because you can't invest in yourself. We're going to credit the non-controlling interest for 10% of the full fair value of the stock or 70000 We worked out that X, the full value of 100% of the sub stock, equals 700000 The non-controlling interest shareholders own 10% of that stock. Take 10% 10 of 700,000, aren't we going to credit non-controlling interest for 70,000? And as you can see, the entry doesn't balance. I need a $100,000 credit to balance the entry out. Why do I need a credit? Because it's a bargain. 100% of the stock is only worth 700,000. And yet, by buying 100% of the stock, you would acquire 800,000 of net assets. I need a $100,000 credit to balance the entry out. That's just an ordinary game. Not an extraordinary game, just an ordinary game. You got a pretty good deal. Now, we would credit gain for the 100000 That's how you finish that entry. Now, if we were told, for example, that land is overstated on the sub's balance sheet by 10000 you would debit that gain, 10000 and credit land, 10000 You would write the land down to fair value. You would. So sometimes in bargain situations, there are overvalued assets. So if that's thrown in, you have to deal with that too. So if they added that the land has a fair value, 10000 less than book value, the land is overvalued on the sub's balance sheet, well, then I would add another entry where I would debit that gain. I'd lower it by 10000 and credit land, 10000 I'd write the land down to fair value. I wouldn't knowingly overstate the land on the consolidated balance sheet. And as I say, a lot of times in a bargain situation, there would be overvalued assets. If you're told there's overvalued assets, you would make another entry and write those assets down to fair value. If you look at multiple choice number seven, it says in a business combination accounted for under the acquisition method, the appraised values of the identifiable assets acquired exceed the acquisition price. It's a bargain. If the appraised values of the identifiable assets acquired exceed acquisition price, you have a bargain. How would this excess of appraised value be reported? A, is it goodwill? No, it's no goodwill. Goodwill is what, what you have if the fair value of the stock exceeds the fair value of the net asset. Here, it's less than. Is it additional paid in capital? Answer B, no. Is it C, a reduction of the values assigned to non-current assets and then an extraordinary gain for any unallocated portion? No. It's answer D. It's an ordinary gain. When you have a bargain purchase, you're going to end up reporting an ordinary gain. Now, before you come to the next class, I have another assignment for you. When you go to the next module, you'll see that we're going to do one more simulation on consolidation. 
and I'd really like you to give this a try. It's the best thing for you. It's Poe and Shaw. It's a good problem. It'll put you through your paces. And I think it's a good summary of everything we've learned in these classes. And let's be honest, you've got to be ready for simulation on consolidation. And the, the, the way to be sure that you're ready is by doing one. So before you come to the next class, get, give yourself about 30, 40 minutes. You know, give yourself a time limit. Answer all the questions. Don't leave anything blank. And then open the class, and we'll go through it together. I'll see you then. Welcome back. As you know, what we're going to do in this class is a simulation on consolidation. And I asked you to try the simulation before coming to this class. I hope you did that. It's the best way to learn. Take this simulation, get all your answers down, and see where it leads. Let's take a look at this simulation together. It says, presented below are selected amounts from the separate, unconsolidated financial statements of Poe and its 90% owned subsidiary, Shaw, at December 31. So notice all these numbers, selected amounts from the separate statements, are dated December 31. We have selected income statement amounts. We have selected balance sheet amounts. We have selected statement of retained earnings amounts. And then some additional information. On January 2nd, a year ago, Poe purchased 90% of Shaw's 100,000 outstanding shares for cash of 270,000. On that date, the sub stockholders equity equaled 150,000 and the fair value of Shaw's assets and liabilities equaled their carrying amounts except for land, for which fair value exceeded carrying amount by 100,000. On September 4th, the sub paid a cash dividend of 30,000. On December 31, the parent recorded its equity in Shaw's earnings. The business combinations being accounted for under the acquisition method. The first two questions, they say, for items one and two, using the table of selected information from the consolidated and, and unconsolidated financial statements, determine the dollar amount to be reported in the December 31 consolidated balance sheet for the following listed accounts. Ignore tax considerations. We have to figure out the non-controlling interest. We have to figure out the goodwill. Well, you know me, I like some preliminary calculations just to get myself organized. Don't we know that back on January 2nd, 90% of X equals 270,000, right? X, again, standing for the value of 100% of the substock. So X, the value of 100% of the substock, must be that 270,000 divided by 90%. X, the value of 100% of the substock, must be worth 300,000. So if somebody had purchased 100% of the substock, they'd have to pay 300000 to get net assets with a fair value of what? Well, the stockholder's equity of the sub adds up to 150000 on January 2nd, but that's the book value of the net assets. They say fair value of assets and liabilities equal to carrying amounts except for land, for which fair value exceeds carrying amount by 100000 Land is undervalued on the, on the sub's balance sheet. So as you know, in the acquisition method, that land would have to be written up to fair value. That land would have to be written up 100000 So if the book value of the sub's net assets on January 2nd was 150000 the fair value must have been 250000 once we write that land up to fair value. So what do we know now? We know that if someone bought 100% of the shares, they'd have to pay 300000 for the stock and acquire net assets with a fair value of only 250000 there is 50,000 of goodwill. There is 50,000 of goodwill. Now, that's back on January 2nd. They're asking for goodwill a year later, December 31. Would it still be 50,000? It would. That's not going to change unless there's, an, there's been an impairment because it is tested for impairment. But they said nothing about an impairment loss, nothing about an impairment of goodwill. So as far as we know, a year later, December 31, it would still be 50,000. Now, we also know that if 100% of the sub stock is worth 300,000, non-controlling interest owns 10% of those shares, so take 10% of 300,000, so the non-controlling interest is worth 30,000, right? No. That's back on January 2nd. A year has gone by. I don't know if you did this. I hope you did. But one way to get this answer 
is if you just followed my checklist. If you're consolidating Poe and Shaw on December 31, which is the premise of these questions, you've got your checklist. Record the goodwill, write the subs net assets to fair value, eliminate the capital structure of the sub. Record the goodwill, write the subs net assets to fair value, eliminate the capital structure of the sub. So let's do that. Why don't we, why don't we make our three entries? Don't we know that goodwill, we've worked it out, is 50000 So we know that the first entry, the first adjustment is to debit goodwill, 50000 credit investment and sub for 90% of that, or 45000 and credit the non-controlling interest for 10%, or 5000 So we recorded the goodwill. And then the second adjustment, I write the sub's net assets to fair value. So I would debit the land, 100000 I'd actually write the sub's land up to fair value. I would debit the land, 100000 I'd credit investment in sub for 90% of that increase, or 90000 and I'd credit the non-controlling interest for 10% or 10,000. And then finally, my third adjustment, I would eliminate the capital structure of the subsidiary company. If you go to the selected balance sheet accounts, remember these are dated December 31. The sub is showing common stock 10,000, additional paid in capital 40,000, retained earnings 140,000. So let's eliminate it. I'm going to debit the sub's common stock for 10,000. I'm going to debit the sub's APIC for 40,000. I'm going to debit the sub's retained earnings for 140,000. Because as you know, in consolidation, we always eliminate 100% of the capital structure of the subsidiary company. Always. Now I'm going to credit investment in sub for 90% of the capital structure of the sub. Add it up. Capital structure of the sub was common stock 10, additional paid in capital 40, retained earnings 140. The net assets of the sub on December 31 add up to 190000 I'm going to credit investment in sub for 90% of 190,000 or 171,000. I'm crediting investment in sub for 90% of 190,000 or 171,000, and I'll credit the non controlling interest for 10% of 190,000 or 19,000. So let's think what we've done here. Let's reconcile. Have I eliminated the investment account? Well, if you go back to the selected balance sheet amounts about halfway down. I want you to find investment in Shaw. Isn't investment in Shaw at December 31 being reported on the parent's balance sheet at 306,000? 306, you might want to circle that just to draw your eye to it. Well, let's look at my adjustments. I credited investment in sub for 45,000 when I recorded the goodwill. I credited investment in sub for 90,000 when I wrote the land of fair value. I credit investment in sub for 171,000 when I eliminate the capital structure of the sub. So add it up. Add up 45,000 plus 90 plus 171. Yes, I have credited investment in sub for 306,000. It's written to zero. What have I credited to non-controlling interest? Well, I credited non-controlling interest for 5,000 when I recorded the goodwill. I credited non-controlling interest for 10,000 when I wrote the land of fair value. And I credit non-controlling interest for 19,000 when I eliminate the capital structure of the sub. So add up 5,000 plus 10,000 plus 19,000. Non-controlling interest on December 31 would be reported at 34,000. So the answer to number one, question number one, is 34,000. Question number two, goodwill, is still 50,000. I hope you got that. Can I reconcile that? Can I prove that must be true? Sure, because don't I know that non-controlling interest a year ago, January 2nd, was 30,000, right? A year ago, non-controlling interest was 10% of 300,000 or, three, or 30,000. What's happened in the last year? In the last year, go to selected statement of retained earnings amounts. The sub's income for the year was 70,000. Non-controlling interest would get 10% of that or 7,000. So the non-controlling interest would go from 30,000 up 7,000. But there was also 30,000 of dividend. Non-controlling interest shareholders would get 10% of that dividend. So non-controlling interest would drop 3,000. So take 30 plus seven minus three, it makes perfect sense. That non-controlling interest is now 34000 Now we have another set of questions. Items 3, 4, and 5 represent transactions between Poe and Shaw during the year. Using the table of selected information from the consolidated and unconsolidated financial statements, determine the dollar effect, the dollar amount effect of your consolidating adjustment on consolidated net income. So they want the dollar effect of your consolidating adjustments on consolidated net income 
before considering non-controlling interest. They don't want us to consider non-controlling interest at all in any of these. Ignore taxes, and you have to state whether the change is an increase, a decrease, or not considered. So, as you know, in our classes, we've been saying that in terms of intercompany transactions, the exam really loves three in particular. Intercompany sales with profits, intercompany sale of fixed assets, and intercompany bonds. Those are the three they ask the most. What do you have in number three? An intercompany sale of fixed assets. What do you have in number four? Intercompany sales with profits. What do you have in number five? Intercompany bonds, no big surprise. Number three says, on January 3rd, the sub sold equipment with an original cost of 30,000 and a carrying amount of 15,000 to the parent for 36,000. The equipment had a remaining life of three years. They used straight line. Both companies use straight line. All right, now, you might not be ready for it yet, but there's a checklist on this. Remember, it doesn't matter whether the parent sells fixed assets to the sub or the sub sells fixed assets to the parent. You've got to do three things. You have to eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. You have to adjust the asset. It's either over or understated. And number three, you have to adjust the depreciation. Eliminate any intercompany gain or loss. Adjust the asset. It's either over or understated. Adjust depreciation. Now, in this case, what happened? Didn't the sub, Shaw, take a piece of equipment with a carrying value of $15,000, sell it to the parent for $36,000? Wasn't there a $21,000 gain in that transaction? So what are we going to do? We're going to debit gain, $21,000. We can't allow that gain because you can't earn a gain with yourself. Poe and Shaw are now one economic entity. So we're going to debit that gain, $21,000. We're going to eliminate it. And also, the asset is overstated. We're going to credit the equipment, $21,000. It's overstated because the parent now has the equipment on the books of $36,000. It should still be on the books for the entity at the true cost to the entity, which is the carrying value of $15,000. It's overstated. Again, the parent has that equipment on the books of $36,000. That equipment really should be on the financial statements at its true carrying value for the entity, which is still $15,000. So we're going to credit equipment, 21000 Now, we also have to adjust depreciation. Why? Because the parent is ignorant. They don't know. The parent based depreciation for this full year on their cost, 36000 But the depreciation st still should have been on the original carrying value, 15000 So the problem is that $21,000 gain. If you take that $21,000 gain, divide by three straight line years, you're going to debit accumulated depreciation, 7000 and you're going to credit depreciation expense, 7000 They took too much depreciation. Parent doesn't know. Parent bases depreciation on $36,000. they are ignorant. They don't know. We come in to consolidate the entity, and we say, no, that equipment should still be depreciated on the original carrying value. This transaction can't take place. This entity cannot sell itself its own fixed assets and change its carrying value and change the depreciation. Makes no sense. So debit accumulated depreciation, 7000 and credit depreciation expense, 7000 All right, now we haven't answered the question yet. What's the question? They said, determine the dollar effect of your adjustments on consolidated net income. Well, if I eliminate that gain, consolidated net income goes down 21000 But if I credit depreciation expense, 7000 look at that second adjustment. I debit accumulated depreciation, and I credit depreciation expense, 7000 if I lower an expense, that increases consolidated net income seven. So the net effect of my adjustments is a $14,000 decrease. If I eliminate the gain, consolidated net income goes down 21,000. But if I lower depreciation expense 7,000, consolidated net income goes up 7,000. The net effect of my adjustments is a $14,000 decrease to consolidated net income. Number four, during the year, the sub sold merchandise to the parent for 60000 and that included a profit of 20000 At December 31, half the merchandise remained in the parent's inventory. Well, once again, we have a checklist. It doesn't matter whether the parent sells merchandise to the sub or the sub sells merchandise to the parent. Doesn't matter. You've got to do three things. You eliminate the intercompany sales. You eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable. And number three, you eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still an inventory. 
you got your checklist. Those are the three things that you have to do. So let's eliminate the intercompany sales. Step one, I'm going to debit sales 60000 Why? Because this entity cannot have sales with itself. So I'm going to debit sales 60000 and I'm going to credit cost of goods sold 60000 Why cost of goods sold? Because purchases on the other company's books is overstated, therefore cost of goods sold is overstated because you can't purchase your own merchandise. So debit sales 60000 credit cost of goods sold 60000 you've eliminated the sales themselves. Step two, we eliminate any intercompany accounts payable, accounts receivable, as far as we know there isn't any. We weren't told there was any balance unpaid. If you look at the selected balance sheet amounts, there's no accounts payable, accounts receivable. So we don't have to worry about that. But what I'm hoping is the checklist makes you disciplined so that you're looking for everything you may have to deal with. Finally, we eliminate any intercompany profit if it's still in inventory. Now, the sub made a $20,000 profit on these sales, and they said at December 31, half the merchandise is still on hand. Well, if half the merchandise is still on hand, we have to eliminate half the profit, or $10,000. So we're going to credit inventory $10,000. Get that intercompany profit out of inventory, and then we say, if ending inventory is overstated by this profit, cost of goods sold is understated by this profit. So we're going to debit cost of goods sold, 10000 Those are my adjustments. Now let's answer the question. What is the net effect on consolidated net income? Well, your first entry. My first entry, if I lower sales and I lower cost of goods sold, 60000 there's no effect on the bottom line. But in my second adjustment, if I increase cost of goods sold 10, I lower consolidated net income 10,000. So the answer is a $10,000 decrease. The effect of my consolidating adjustments to consolidated net income, because I increase cost of goods sold 10,000, I decrease consolidated net income 10,000. It's a $10,000 decrease. Finally, in number five, we have some intercompany bonds. You knew they were coming. On December 31, Poe paid $91,000 to purchase 50% of the outstanding bonds of Shaw. There's some intercompany bond holdings. And we know the bottom line. For consolidation purposes, intercompany bond holdings have to be retired. The bonds mature in six years on December 31 and were originally issued at par, so there's no discount or premium there. The bonds pay interest annually on December 31 of each year, and the interest was paid to the prior investor immediately before post purchase of the bonds. And you have another checklist. It doesn't matter. It does not matter whether the parent buys the sub's bonds, sub buys the parent's bonds. You got to do three things. You have to eliminate the investment and the debt. You have to eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. Hopefully you get that checklist down. Eliminate the investment and the debt. Eliminate any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable. And step three, eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. Let's do, this, let's do the second step. Is there any intercompany interest payable, interest receivable? You know what my next question is going to be. When was the last time interest was paid? Today. It's paid annually on December 31. So there is no accrued interest. Nothing to worry about there. Let's go to step three. Eliminate any intercompany interest revenue, interest expense. Let me ask you, when did the parent acquire the sub's bonds? Today, December 31. So the parent hasn't earned any interest from the sub. There is no intercompany interest revenue and expense. So we have nothing to worry about with steps two and three. Nothing to worry about there. Let's, all we had to do to solve this particular simulation on the bonds is the first step on the checklist. Eliminate the investment and the debt. So you had to go back to the selected balance sheet amounts. And I want you to find bonds payable. I'm sure you did. Shaw is showing bonds payable, 200000 There's the debt. Should I debit bonds payable, 200000 No. The parent only bought 50%. You're only eliminating the intercompany portion. So I'm going to debit bonds payable, 100000 Why? Because you can't have a debt to yourself. Now, if you, find, if you go to that same section of the problem, Selected balance sheet amount. Notice that Poe is showing investment in bonds of 100000 with a discount of nine. Remember, they paid 91000 So we're going to credit investment in bonds, 100000 and debit discount, 9000 Now, you could have just credited investment in bonds, 91000 That's fine. But I'm doing it more formally. I'll credit 
Investment in bonds, 100000 And debit the discount, 9000 But The point is, you cannot invest in your own securities. Poe and Shaw are one economic entity. You cannot invest in your own securities. It has to be eliminated. Now, the entry doesn't balance. What did we say in an earlier class? Get rid of the debt, whatever the balance is. Get rid of the investment, whatever the balance is. And if the entry doesn't balance at that point, it's because there's discounts and premiums in there. What do you do to finish this entry off? You credit what? A gain on retirement of bonds of 9000 Just to balance the entry out, you plug that in there. Credit, gain on retirement of bonds, 9000 And that gain would go to the consolidated income statement. So what is the net effect on consolidated net income? For my adjustments, a $9,000 increase because that gain would go to the consolidated income statement. So the net effect on consolidated net income from all my adjustments for the bonds, a $9,000 increase. And then finally, there's one last section. Items 6 through 17 refer to accounts that may or may not be included in Poe and Shaw's consolidated financial statement. And here are your list of possible responses. Is it A, just sum the amounts on Poe and Shaw's separate books? Is it B, less than the sum of the amounts on the separate books, but not the same as the amount on either? Is it C, same as the amount for the parent only? D, same as the amount, same as the amount for the sub only? E, eliminate entirely in consolidation? F, shown in the consolidated statements only, not in anybody's separate statements? Or G, neither in the consolidated or the separate statements? These are your choices. How about number six, cash? Is it A, just sum the amounts on the separate books? It is. Cash, you would just merge the amounts on the separate books. Answer A. Seven, how about equipment? Is it A, just sum the amounts on the separate books? No, you had to be careful because you had to look back on the consolidating adjustments that you made. In one of our consolidating adjustments, we did credit equipment. We did credit equipment for 21000 We lowered it because of one of our consolidating adjustments. So it's B, less than the sum of the amounts on the separate books, but not the same as the amount on either. If you didn't get number eight, I could get very upset. Investment in sub, you know, is eliminated entirely. You know that. I hopefully, hopefully you didn't even hesitate on that. Investment in sub, always eliminated entirely. How about nine, bonds payable? Is it A, just sum the amounts in the separate books? No, because if you look back at our consolidating adjustments, we did lower bonds payable, 100000 so it's another B. Less than the sum of the amounts in the separate books, not the same as the amount on either. Ten, non-controlling interest. We do have a non-controlling interest. At December 31, it's at $34,000. It'll be on the consolidated balance sheet, so what's the right letter? I hope you got it. It's F. That's an example of something that's in the consolidated statements only. That non-controlling interest will be down in stockholders' equity in the consolidated balance sheet. But that's not in anybody's separate books. That non-controlling interest is the result of all our consolidating adjustments. So that's an example of an F, something that's in the consolidated statements only. It's not in anybody's separate books. Eleven. Common stock. You know, we always, in consolidation, eliminate the capital structure of the sub. So the only capital structure that's carried over to the consolidated balance sheet is the capital structure of the parent. So common stock, parent only. Common stock would be parent only, letter C. Same as the amount for the parent only. Now, 12 and 13 may have bothered you, but when you hear this, it'll make perfect sense. In 12 and 13, they're making you think about what you do when you prepare a consolidated statement of retained earnings. When I say it, it'll make perfect sense to you. The big thing to remember when you do a consolidated statement of retained earnings is the sub is gone. The sub has been consumed by the parent. It doesn't exist. There's only one economic entity. The parent is the surviving entity. So when I do a consolidated statement of retained earnings, I start with the beginning retained earnings of the parent only. 12 is C. There is no sub. It doesn't exist. I start with the beginning retained earnings of the parent only. 12 is C. Then I add consolidated net income, and then I subtract any dividends paid by the parent only. There is no sub. So 13 is also C. 
Dividends paid by the parent only. The parent is the entity. How about gain on retirement of bonds, number 14? Well, when we, when we did our consolidating adjustments, turns out there's a $9,000 gain on retirement of bonds. What letter? Very good. It's F. It's another F. We got that. That's an example of something that's in the consolidated statements only. That's not in anybody's separate books. That's the result of our consolidating adjustments. How about cost of goods sold? Number 15. Well, if you go, go back to our elimination entries, go back to our adjustments. When I eliminated the sales, I debited sales 60000 credit cost of goods sold 60000 When I eliminated the profit, I credited inventory 10000 and I debited cost of goods sold 10000 But it was a net decrease, wasn't it? It was a net decrease to cost of goods sold of 50000 So it's another letter B. Less than the sum of the amounts on the separate books, not the same as the amount on either. Interest expense. Well, you may have noticed if you looked at the statements, only Shaw has interest. So it'll be letter D. Same as the amount for the sum only. Now, if you picked A, that would be acceptable too. Because if you just say sum the amounts on the separate books, if I add zero on the parents' books to what's on the subs' books, I get the same answer. A or D would be acceptable there. And then finally, depreciation expense. You know from our earlier adjustments, we had a lower depreciation expense, 7000 didn't we? So it's another B, less than the sum of the amounts on the separate books, but not the same as the amount on either. I hope you did real well on that simulation. And if you got some questions wrong, hopefully it tells you where to target your studying and your review in this area, especially when you get down to crunch time. And if you're, say, two or three days from the exam and you're cramming your brains out, you know, knowing where your weak spots are really helps a lot. And that's what you're going to focus on in that final cram period. But I hope you did well on that simulation. And don't fall behind. Keep studying. And I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion of international financial reporting standards, or IFRS. And the best approach with IFRS is to first get a solid foundation in U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. And then you can study the differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. And hopefully, that's where you are in your preparation. You have a solid foundation in U.S. GAAP, so now we can talk about the differences with IFRS. In general, it has to be said that U.S. GAAP is a rules-based approach. U.S. GAAP sets precise rules, bright line rules, in regard to recognition, measurement, financial statement presentation. IFRS is considered to be a principles-based approach, principles-based. IFRS sets general principles for recognition, measurement, financial statement presentation, and allows more judgment in applying the principles. But it needs to be said also that the focus of U.S. GAAP and IFRS, of course, is the fair representation of financial information. That's always the focus. Let's talk about the IFRS reporting model. Under IFRS, an entity has to report a statement of financial position, basically a balance sheet, a statement of financial position. An entity has to provide a statement of comprehensive income, a statement of changes in equity, a statement of cash flows, and, of course, notes to the financial statements. That's the international fra framework. That's the IFRS reporting model right there. That's what an entity, has to, an entity has to provide, a statement of financial position, a statement of comprehensive income, a statement of changes in equity, a statement of cash flows, and appropriate disclosures. Let's go to the second question in your viewer's guide. Second question says, on August 1st, year two, Lex Company decided to adopt IFRS. The company's first IFRS reporting period will be for the year ended December 31, year two. Lee, Lex will present year one statements for comparative purposes. What is Lex's date of transition to IFRS? Now, this is a technical point. What would be the date of transition? The answer is A, January 1st, year one, because the date of transition 
is the beginning of the earliest period for which you will present comparative information under Eifert's. And that, in this case, would be January 1, year 1. And what you're required to do in the year of transition is to present three statements of financial position. They're going to have to show a statement of financial position January 1, year 1, the date of transition. January 1, year 1, December 31, and December 31, year 2. Three statements of financial position. They have to present two statements of comprehensive income, one for year 1 and one for year 2. Two statement of changes in equity, one for year 1, one for year 2, and two statements of cash flows, one for year 1 and one for year 2. Those are the requirements. If they elect to use the revaluation model for something like, say, property, plant, and equipment, under the revaluation model, the property, plant, and equipment would be adjusted to fair value. And that and the increase or decrease would be reflected in retained earnings. The gain or loss would be included in retained earnings. But if they elect to use the revaluation model, something like property, plant, and equipment would be adjusted to its fair value. And that fair value would be the asset's deemed cost going forward. Another point I wanted to make. U.S. GAAP has no requirement regarding comparative information. No requirement at all. But under IFERS, you are required to present comparative information for the prior year. That is a requirement under IFERS. Let's go back to the IFERS reporting model. And I want to talk about the statement of cash flows. Now, under IFERS, a statement of cash flows can be done under the direct method or the indirect method. That's true. Now, if you go back in your mind to the class we had on statement of cash flows, we know that in the GAAP model, there are three sections. Operating, investing, and financing activities. Operating activities, that's our income statement section, as I know you remember. Investing activities... Investing always makes us happy, right? Buy or sell, held to maturity. Buy or sell, available for sale. Buy or sell, PP&E. Buy or sell, equity investments. That's investing activity. How about financing activity? In the U.S. GAAP model, we're financing for Prince Divots. Prince is debt principal. Div is pay dividends. I is issue stock. And TS is treasury stock transactions. We know that. Well, those memory tools will still work for you. When you do a statement of cash flows under the IFERS model, it's going to be operating, investing, and financing. The operating section is still, you know, your income statement section. Investing will still make you happy. Your financing for Prince Divots, all that will still work for you. A couple little differences, though. When you talk about Interest paid or interest received? Where would I find interest paid, interest received in the U.S. GAAP model? That's on the income statement. It's in operating. Well, under IFERS, interest paid or interest received can either be in operating or financing. You have to apply it consistently, but you make a choice whether you want to include interest paid, interest received in operating activity or financing activity. And, of course, be consistent about it. Same thing with dividend income. Dividend income would be in operating activity in the U.S. GAAP model. In IFERS, you make a choice, whether it's going to be in operating or financing activities, and, of course, apply it consistently. Also, in our class on cash flows, we talked about non-cash investing and financing activities. Remember, preferred stock converted to common stock. Bonds converted to stock. A straight exchange of, of debt for property. A straight exchange of stock for property. These are non-cash investing and financing activities. Now, in the U.S. GAAP model, the non-cash investing and financing activities are a supplemental disclosure in the statement of cash flows. In the IFERS model, the non-cash investing and financing activities are not a supplemental disclosure on the statement of cash flows. They're in the notes to the financial statements. 
They would be in the notes to the financial statements. Let's talk about the statement of comprehensive income. IFRS requires a statement of comprehensive income. Remember, there's the one statement approach where you do a combined statement of income and comprehensive income. There's the two statement approach where you have an income statement and a separate statement of comprehensive income. Well, notice in IFRS, you are required to present a statement of comprehensive income. So in IFRS, it's either going to be the one statement approach or the two statement approach. In IFRS, you're either going to have a combined statement of income and comprehensive income or the two statement approach where you have an in, a separate income statement and a separate statement of comprehensive income. That's required in IFRS, either the one statement approach or the two statement approach. That's required. Either a combined statement of income and comprehensive income or an income statement with a separate statement of comprehensive income. Now we also do also what's required is a statement of changes in equity and in the statement of changes in equity there'll be a reconciliation of total comprehensive income as well. Now on the income statement itself under IFRS of course we're going to use accrual accounting but there is a difference. Remember in US GAAP if we're accounting for a long-term construction contract we can either use the percentage of completion method or completed contract. Please remember that under IFRS, completed contract is not allowed. Under IFRS, completed contract is not allowed. Under IFRS, if you have a long-term construction contract, under IFRS, you're going to either account for it under the percentage of completion method, or if you can't reasonably estimate the degree of completion each year, you'll only be allowed to recognize revenue to the extent of the cost incurred. Now, another point. I know you remember that under U.S. GAAP, we report on an income statement, income from continuing operations, discontinued operations, extraordinary items. You're never going to forget that basic C, D, E presentation, alphabetical. Well, under IFRS, you still present income from continuing operations, you still present discontinued operations, net of tax, but there are no extraordinary items. Remember that. Under IFRS, extraordinary items are not reported. All gains and losses are up in continuing operations. There are no extraordinary items under IFRS. We'll continue this in our next class. Don't fall behind. Keep studying. I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of IFRS, and what we have to get into is the statement of financial position. We have a lot to say about the statement of financial position. I want to start with investments. We know that under U.S. GAAP, there are trading securities. Trading securities are accounted for at their fair market value. Any unrealized holding gains and losses go to the income statement. There are held to maturity securities accounted for under amortized cost. And there are available for sale securities accounted for at fair value, but unrealized holding gains and losses do not go to the income statement. They go to OCI. That's U.S. GAAP. Now in IFRS, trading securities defined the same way are accounted for under what they call fair value through profit and loss. Fair value through profit and loss. Same basic idea that we adjust trading securities to their fair value and any gains and losses would go to the income statement. Fair value through profit and loss. Now with held to maturity and available for sale, a company can elect to account for those securities under fair value through profit and loss if there's a, an active market for the securities. There has to be an active market, but under IFRS, with held to maturity and available for sale, you can elect to account for those securities under fair value through profit and loss. So the gains and losses would go to the income statement. Now, if they do not elect fair value through profit and loss, or if there's not an active market, then held to maturity would be accounted for under amortized cost, and available for sale securities would be adjusted to fair value, but the gains and losses would go to 
OCI. If you have significant influence over another company, we know in U.S. GAAP, you have to use the equity method. Under IFRS, if you have significant influence over another company, you can either use the equity method or fair value through profit and loss. Another difference, under U.S. GAAP, if a company issues convertible bonds, if a company issues convertible bonds, they just debit cash and credit bonds payable. In other words, under U.S. GAAP, when we issue convertible bonds, we don't try to separate the debt component from the equity component. Well, in IFRS, you are required, when you issue convertible bonds, to separate the debt component from the equity component. So you're going to debit cash, credit bonds payable for the debt component, and credit stockholders' equity for the equity component. You have to divide it up. Let's talk about deferred taxes. We know in U.S. GAAP, we use the liability method to account for deferred taxes. Under U.S. GAAP, we have to be able to calculate a deferred tax asset and a deferred tax liability. And that's true in IFRS as well. In IFRS, deferred taxes are accounted for under the liability method. So under IFRS, we're going to have to calculate a deferred tax asset, a deferred tax liability. But there are some differences. Remember under U.S. GAAP, we said that if a temporary difference is caused by a current asset or current liability, then the deferred tax account is current. If a temporary difference is caused by a non-current asset or a non-current a non-current deferred a non-current liability, then the deferred tax account is non-current. That's how U.S. GAAP works. If a temporary difference is caused by a current asset or current liability, then the deferred tax account is current. If a temporary difference is caused by a non-current asset or non-current liability, then the deferred tax account is non-current. Well, in IFRS, deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities are always non-current. Always non-current. There's no current. All doesn't matter what causes them. In IFRS, deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities are always non-current. Now let's go back to U.S. GAAP. Remember in U.S. GAAP, what we report on the balance sheet is net current amount, net non-current amount. So let's go to IFRS. Since it's always non-current, if I have a non-current deferred tax asset and a non-current deferred tax liability, in IFRS, can I net them and just report net non-current amount? Yes, if it relates to the same taxing authority. In other words, under IFRS, if I have a non-current deferred tax asset that relates to France and a non-current deferred tax, a non-current deferred tax liability that relates to France, the same taxing authority, I'll net them and report on the statement of financial position net non-current liability, net non-current deferred tax liability, or net non-current deferred tax asset. I will net them. But if I have, under IFRS, a non-current deferred tax asset that relates to Britain and a non-current deferred tax liability that relates to France, I can't net them. I can only net if it relates to the same taxing authority. One other small difference. Under U.S. GAAP, remember, we have to use future tax rates when we calculate, calculate our deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. We have to use future tax rates if those future tax rates have been enacted into law. Under IFRS, we also use future tax rates if they've been enacted into law or substantially enacted. Again, you get to use more judgment. So under IFRS, if I were preparing my financial statements and there was an imminent change in tax rates and you know both houses of Congress had passed the legislation by overwhelming majorities, but there hadn't been a final vote taken yet. Well, it's substantially enacted. It's another example of how in IFRS you use more judgment. So you would be able to use a, a future tax rate if it's been substantially enacted. Let's talk about leases. You remember that in U.S. GAAP, if we're just renting, we have an operating lease. That's true in IFRS as well. If you're just renting, it's an operating lease. But in U.S. GAAP, if I'm using the lease in substance to purchase the asset, if I'm the lessee, or if I'm a lessor and I'm using the lease 
to sell my property, then it's a capital lease. Well, it's the same idea in IFRS, but in IFRS, a capital lease is called a finance lease. You should be aware of that. So again, in IFRS, the term is to call it a finance lease. If you're the lessee and the lease is in substance a way to purchase the asset, it's a finance lease. If you're a lessor and the lease is in substance a way to sell your property, it's a finance lease. Now, in U.S. GAAP, how do we know if you're a lessee in substance, the lease is a way to purchase the asset? Remember the criteria to BOP 7590, right? We know that. Any of those criteria are met to BOP 7590. There's a transfer of ownership. There's a bargain purchase option. If the term of the lease is equal to or greater than 75% of the remaining life of the asset, or if the present value of the lease payments are equal to or greater than 90% of the fair value of the asset, it's a capital lease. Well, it's the same idea in IFRS, but there's more criteria. In IFRS, here's the criteria. You have a finance lease. It is a finance lease. If there's a transfer of ownership or if there's a bargain purchase option or if the term of the lease is a major part of the economic life of the asset. Notice not equal to or greater than 75%. No, the term of the lease has to just be a major part of the economic life of the asset. Again, it's another example where U.S. GAAP sets bright line rules. IFRS is more principles based. and You're allowed to use more judgment. But in IFRS, if the term of the lease is a major part of the life of the asset, it's a finance lease. Also in IFRS, if the present value of the lease payments are substantially all of the fair value of the asset, not equal to or greater than 90%, if the fair value of the lease payments, if the present value of the lease payments are equal to substantially all of the fair value of the asset, it's a finance lease. So again, more judgment is involved. But there's more criteria. If the asset is of such a specialized nature that only the lessee could use the asset without modification, that would indicate it's a finance lease. If the lessee cancels the lease, any losses that the lessor would suffer would be borne by the lessee, that would indicate it's a finance lease. Again, if the lessee were to cancel the lease and any losses sustained by the lessor would be borne by the lessee, that would indicate it's a finance lease. Any gains and losses from fluctuations of the value of the asset would accrue to the lessee, that would indicate it's a finance lease. And if the lessee can continue the lease under lower than market rate terms, if the lessee has the option to continue the lease at lower than market rate terms, indicates it's a finance lease. So there's more criteria and more judgment involved under IFRS. Let's talk about inventory. We know on U.S. GAAP, the primary basis of accounting for inventory is historical cost. And we know in, in U.S. GAAP, we capitalize to inventory all the costs we incur to bring the merchandise into a condition and location for sale. We know that. We also know that we have different methods of valuation for inventory under U.S. GAAP. There's specific identification. There's the gross profit method. We can make an assumption about the way inventory costs are flowing, first in, first out, last in, first out, weighted average. That's U.S. GAAP. Under IFRS, here again, the primary basis of accounting for inventory is historical cost. And in IFRS, we are going to capitalize the inventory, all the costs we incurred to bring the merchandise into a condition and location for sale. How do we value inventory under IFRS? Well, under IFRS, you have to use specific identification when the goods are not interchangeable. Under IFRS, you are required to use specific identification if the goods are not interchangeable. If the goods are interchangeable, if they're fungible, then you are allowed to use FIFO or weighted average, but not LIFO. LIFO is prohibited under IFRS. Remember that. LIFO is prohibited under IFRS, but you would be allowed 
if the goods are fungible, interchangeable, to use FIFO or weighted average, but never LIFO. You can use the retail method in IFRS in certain industries. You can use the gross profit method if a physical account is not possible under IFRS. Now, we agree that under both U.S. GAAP and IFRS, the primary basis of accounting for inventory is historical cost. But ultimately, under both IFRS and U.S. GAAP, inventory would be carried on the balance sheet on the statement of financial position at its original cost or its market value, whatever's lower. My point is, both U.S. GAAP and IFRS apply lower of cost of market to inventory, but it's done differently. Let's go to a problem. If you go to your viewer's guide and look at questions one and two, we're given some information about Ames Company. Ames Company determined the following values for its inventory as of December 31. We know the historical cost, 200000 Replacement cost is 160000 The sales value is 190000 Cost to complete and sell, 10000 a normal profit margin is 8000 and the fair value is 194000 Question number one says, under U.S. GAAP, what amount should Ames report for its inventory at December 31? Well, let's have a little review. How do we apply lower of cost of market to inventory under U.S. GAAP? Well, remember, first you have to calculate the ceiling called net realizable value. The ceiling is defined as the selling price, 190000 minus disposal costs, the normal cost to complete and sell, 10000 So the ceiling, net realizable value, would be 180000 The floor, remember, market can never be higher than the ceiling, and then the floor is defined as that net realizable value, 180000 minus a normal gross profit on sale, 8000 The floor would be 172000 that's how the floor is defined, as the net realizable value, the ceiling, 180000 minus the normal gross profit on sale of 8000 The floor would be 172000 Market can never be below that. All right, so we figure out the ceiling. We figure out the floor. Now we look at three numbers. We look at the replacement cost, 160000 the ceiling, net realizable value, 180000 and the floor, 172000 And remember, what's your market? The middle number. Middle number is always market. Now, the number that's in the middle is the floor, 172000 There's your market. So now your final step is to say it's the lower of cost, 200000 That's historical cost. Or market, which I now know is 172000 Because market's lower, I use market. And the answer is C. So I know you remember that Applying lower of cost of market to inventory under U.S. GAAP is complicated. Now, number two says, under IFRS, what amount would Ames report for inventory at December 31? Well, here's, here's a place you're going to love IFRS, because lower of cost of market under IFRS is much easier. Under IFRS, you carry inventory at the lower of its cost, 200000 or net realizable value. You don't have to worry about the floor and replacement cost. No, it's the lower of its cost, in this case 200000 or its net realizable value, defined exactly the same way. The selling price, 190000 minus the cost to dispose, 10000 Net realizable value is 180000 Since net realizable value is lower, I'll use answer B, 180000 That's IFRS. Inventory is carried at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Another difference... What if it recovers in value? GAAP would not allow a recovery in value. IFRS would. If it recovers in value, you would debit inventory and credit income. It would be permissible to record a recovery in value for inventory under IFRS, but not U.S. GAAP. We'll continue our discussion on IFRS in our next class, and I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS. When we left off in our last class, we were talking about the differences in IFRS when you're dealing with the statement of financial position. Let's continue our discussion on the statement of financial
financial position. And let's talk about fixed assets. We know in U.S. GAAP, fixed assets are fairly simple. We capitalize to fixed asset accounts all the costs we incur to bring a fixed asset into a condition and location for use. And after we've done that, we carry the fixed asset on the balance sheet at its capitalized cost minus accumulated depreciation minus any impairment loss. And of course, if the asset recovers in value under U.S. GAAP, we do not record any reversal of impairment loss. We do not. Well, in a statement of financial position, there are different classes of long-lived assets. There's property, plant, and equipment. There's investment property. And there's biological assets. So that's a difference right off the bat, where in IFRS, in the statement of financial position, you're going to have different classifications of long-lived assets, property, plant, equipment, investment property, and biological assets. Let's start with property, plant, and equipment. Now, very similar to U.S. GAAP, property, plant, and equipment under IFRS would be initially recorded at all the costs that are incurred to bring the property, plant, and equipment into a condition and location for use. Now, subsequently, the property, plant, and equipment can either be accounted for under the cost model, which is very similar to U.S. GAAP, or the entity can elect to use the revaluation model. So you have a choice, either the cost model or the revaluation model. Under the cost model, the property, plant, and equipment would be carried at its cost minus accumulated depreciation minus any impairment loss. But of course, if there's a reversal of impairment loss, it would be recorded under IFRS. It would be recorded. Uh, you'd, you'd increase the, the carrying value of the asset, and the gain would go to the income statement. But a reversal of impairment loss would be recorded under IFRS. Now, in the revaluation model, in the revaluation model, the property, plant, and equipment would be adjusted to its fair value on the date of revaluation. This is the revaluation model where we adjust the property, plant, and equipment to fair value on the date of revaluation. And basically, any gain or loss would go to stockholders' equity in a revaluation surplus account. It's part of other comprehensive income. But when you adjust property, plant, and equipment to its fair value, you would basically debit property, plant, and equipment and credit revaluation surplus. And again, that's an element of stockholders' equity. It's part of other comprehensive income. Then you would subtract any subsequent accumulated depreciation. You would subtract any subsequent impairment loss. And here again, if the impairment loss were to reverse, a reversal would be recorded. You would write the asset up if the impairment loss were to reverse. That is allowed under IFRS. Now, what if you sell a piece of property, plant, or equipment that's been accounted for under the revaluation model? Well, if you sell a piece of property, plant, or equipment that's been accounted for under the revaluation model, you're going to debit revaluation surplus and credit retained earnings. Notice the revaluation surplus that's in stockholders' equity, part of OCI. The revaluation surplus that relates to that asset you're going to transfer it to retained earnings. So you would debit revaluation surplus and credit retained earnings and then just handle the sale as a normal sale. Debit cash, credit the asset for its carrying value, and recognize any gain or loss. The gain or loss would go to the income statement. So it takes two entries when you sell an asset that's been accounted for under the revaluation model. Debit the revaluation surplus, credit retained earnings. You're going to transfer any revaluation surplus related to that asset to retained earnings, and then handle the sale in a normal way. Debit cash, credit the asset for its carrying value, and credit gain, or debit loss. And that gain or loss would go to the income statement. 
Let's talk about investment property. Investment property would be property that's held to earn rentals or property held for capital appreciation or both. That's called investment property. Remember, under U.S. GAAP, all we have is held for use, held for sale. Those are the categories in U.S. GAAP, held for use, held for sale. But in IFRS, we have a category, investment property, property held to earn rentals or for capital appreciation or both. Now, this can be property in this category, investment property can be property that's owned by the entity, owned by the corporation, or leased under a finance lease. And it could even be property that's leased under an operating lease if you can determine the fair value of that operating lease. Let me say that again. The property in this category would be property that's either owned by the corporation or leased under a finance lease or even leased under an operating lease if you can determine the fair value of that operating lease. And here again, you have a choice. How do you account for investment property? Well, you can use the cost model. Cost model would simply mean that the property would be on the statement of financial position at its cost, minus accumulated depreciation, minus any impairment losses. The fair value model, you would adjust the asset to fair value. No depreciation is taken. You would simply adjust the asset to its fair value, and any gain or loss would go to the income statement. That's the fair value approach, where you adjust the investment property to its fair value. Any gain or loss would go to the income statement, and no depreciation is taken. And then finally, there's a category in IFRS for long-lived assets that we do not have in U.S. GAAP, and that's biological assets. Biological assets are basically agricultural, agricultural assets. You know, living animals, plants. These are disclosed separately on the balance sheet. These will be disclosed separately on the statement of financial position, assuming they have future economic benefits. Future economic benefits must be probable. And the corporation can elect here again to use the cost model. So this, this biological asset would be on the statement of financial position at its cost, less accumulated depreciation, less impairment losses, or the fair value model, where the biological asset would be on the statement of financial position at its fair value, minus any costs that will be required to sell it at the point of sale. That would be the fair value approach, where the biological asset would be on the statement of financial position at its fair value, minus any cost to sell at the point of sale. Let's talk about intangible assets. Well, you know that in U.S. GAAP, intangible assets are divided into different categories. There are intangibles with a finite useful life, a copyright, a patent, a leasehold improvement. But there are intangibles with an indefinite life, goodwill. You have those categories. Now, under U.S. GAAP, the intangible initially gets recorded at the cost of acquisition, plus you'd also add any cost to register the copyright, the patent, the trademark, whatever it is, plus you also add any legal costs that were incurred in successful defense of the copyright, the patent, the trademark, whatever it is. Well, the basic, this is basically true in IFRS as well. In IFRS, Intangibles are initially recorded at their acquisition cost, plus the cost to register, plus legal fees and successful defense. That would all apply. But, of course, in terms of how you account for intangibles, this is where there's a difference. As I said, under U.S. GAAP, we start with what do we do with intangibles with a finite useful life? Well, if it had, if it's U.S. GAAP, and the intangible has a finite useful life, like a copyright. It'll be on the, on the balance sheet at its cost, minus accumulated amortization, minus any impairment loss. And under U.S. GAAP, if that impairment loss were to reverse, we don't record it. Now, under IFRS, if we have an intangible with a finite useful life, it'll be on the statement of financial position 
at its cost minus accumulated amortization. We will amortize the intangible over our best estimate of its useful life minus any impairment loss. But of course, if it recovers in value under IFRS, the recovery would be recorded. The recovery would be recorded. That's a difference in IFRS. Now, how about an intangible with an indefinite useful life, like goodwill? Well, remember in U.S. GAAP, if you have an intangible with an indefinite useful life, like goodwill, it's not amortized. It's tested for impairment at least annually. Well, in IFRS, if a corporation has an intangible with an indefinite useful life, like goodwill, they use the cost model. If they use the cost model, it will not be amortized. It'll be tested for impairment. What if it reverses? It's not recorded. It's not goodwill. If it's goodwill, a reversal of impairment loss is not recorded. It's not goodwill. Even in IFRS. Now, there is another choice in IFRS for intangibles. Whether it's an intangible with a finite useful life or an indefinite life. Under IFRS, you could also choose the revaluation model. So again, whether it's an intangible with a finite useful life or an indefinite life. Under IFRS, you could choose the revaluation model, where you basically adjust the intangible, whether it's finite life or indefinite life, adjust the intangible to its fair value, and any gain or loss from the adjustment goes to stockholders' equity in a revaluation surplus account, part of OCI. Let's do a couple of questions. Number one, it says Murray Company maintains its records under IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. During the current year, Murray sold a machine that had been accounted for using the revaluation method. So they, they are using, they elected to use the revaluation model. Here are the details. The sales price is 150000 The machine's book value or carrying value is 80000 And notice there's a revaluation surplus found in stockholders' equity. Part of OCI, 9,000. Which of the following is correct regarding the sale? Well, let's put the entries down. There are two entries that are made. When you sell a long-lived asset that's been accounted for under the revaluation model, you're going to start by debiting that revaluation surplus. Take that revaluation surplus that relates to this asset out of stockholders' equity, out of OCI, and you'll credit retained earnings. That'll be transferred to retained earnings. And then just handle the sale as a normal sale. You'll debit cash, $150,000, credit the asset for its carrying value, $80,000, and credit a gain of $70,000, and that gain would go to the income statement. So it's not answer A. A says the gain of $70,000 would go to OCI. It would not. B says a gain of $79,000 would be recorded in profits and losses on the income statement. That's not true. Answer C is true. The gain of 70000 would be recorded in profits and losses. It's a gain on the income statement. And the 9000 revaluation surplus would be transferred to retained earnings. The answer is C. Watch out for that. It's tricky. Number two. Number two says on January 1st, Pax Company acquired for 18000 a new piece of equipment with an estimated life of 10 years. The equipment required the addition of a custom-made component costing $3,000 that must be replaced in four years. PAX uses straight line. And by the way, under IFRS, you can use any systematic basis of depreciation. IFRS would allow straight line, double declining balance, some of the years, some of the years digits. Any systematic approach is allowed, so straight line is okay. PAX uses straight line. Under IFRS, what is the depreciation expense for the year end of December 31? Well, the point that's being raised in this question is that if a component of a fixed asset has different periods of benefit, under IFRS, you are required to depreciate that component as a separate asset. You are required to. You're not required in GAAP to do this. GAAP permits it. But IFRS requires it. Again, GAP would permit this, but IFRS requires it. So we're going to take the 18,000 machine, 
over 10 straight line years. That's 1,800 of depreciation. But we have a component here that has different periods of benefit. IFRS would make us depreciate that separately. We'll take the 3,000, divide by four straight line years. That's another 750 in depreciation. So the answer is D. 1,800 plus 750, 2550. As I say, U.S. GAAP permits this, but it doesn't require it. IFRS requires it. Another point, if you change depreciation methods, just like U.S. GAAP, IFRS treats that as a change in estimate. It's accounted for as a change in estimate. Prospective only. You don't do anything retroactive if there's a change in depreciation methods. So IFRS and U.S. GAAP are the same in that regard. I want to talk for a minute about the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. I think you know that if a corporation is an issuer of publicly traded securities, if a corporation has securities that are traded on a national stock exchange or an over-the-counter market, if a corporation has had an initial public offering of securities, they have to file reports with the SEC. Also, if you're a corporation that has assets greater than 10 million, 500 or more employees, even if you're not trading securities in the open market, but you're a corporation with more than 10 million in assets, 500 or more employees, you have to file reports with the SEC. And I think going into the exam, you have to know the, re the type of reports that are filed with the SEC. Make sure you're aware of these. And, of course, the most important ones, first of all, we'll start with the 10-K. The 10-K is filed annually, and it's a very comprehensive snapshot of, of a company's performance. It's filed annually. And the 10-K includes financial statements audited by an independent public accountant. So the 10-K does include financial statements that have been audited by an independent public accountant. And as I say, it's very comprehensive. The 10K includes a business description, risk factors, legal proceedings, management discussion and analysis, very comprehensive. The 10Q is filed quarterly. The 10Q is very similar to the 10K, but less detailed. And the 10Q includes quarterly statements that have been reviewed, not audited, reviewed by a public accountant. And if you are submitting a 10Q to the SEC, it's going to include, you're going to have to submit three 10Qs per year. So if you're filing reports with the SEC, you're going to have to submit three 10-Qs per year, and then your 10-K, your annual report to the SEC, will include your fourth quarter information. That's how it works. You should also be aware of the 8-K. The 8-K, these are information statements that report on significant events, material events. These are 8-Ks. These are information statements. These report on significant events, material events, mergers, acquisitions. You change directors. You change the CEO. You change auditors. You have to file an 8K with the SEC within four days of the event, within four days. And then finally, I think you should be aware of Regulation SX. Regulation SX describes in detail the content of financial statements that are filed with the SEC. That's Regulation SX. Describes in detail the content of financial statements that will be filed with the SEC. So make sure you know these reports and Regulation SX. And I'll be, look to, I'll be looking to see you in the next class. Keep studying. Don't fall behind. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to begin our discussion of other nonprofit organizations, ONPOs. 
Now, when we talk about other nonprofit organizations, we're talking about private not-for-profit colleges or universities. We're talking about private not-for-profit hospitals or healthcare entities. We're talking about voluntary health and welfare organizations. And let me add one more category. Any other nonprofit you can think of would fall in this category. Uh, a church, a labor union, any other nonprofit the exam mentions, you know, other than state and local governmental units, which we've discussed, fall into this area, ONPOs, other nonprofit organizations. Now, I want to begin our discussion by talking about some things that all of these nonprofits have in common. First of all, all of these nonprofits carry their own fixed assets, and they depreciate their own fixed assets. So you would see depreciation expense in all these nonprofits. They carry their own fixed assets, all of them. They depreciate their own fixed assets, all of them do. Also, all these nonprofits carry their own long-term debt. So you would see accounts like bonds payable, long-term notes payable in all these nonprofits. Also, all these nonprofits service their own long-term debt. So you would see interest expense in all these nonprofits. The bottom line is all of these nonprofits use normal accrual accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. All these nonprofits follow the FASB. They don't follow the GASB. Remember, the GASB is for governmental. So all these nonprofits follow the FASB. They use normal accrual accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. Also, another thing that all these nonprofits have in common, they all have the same measurement focus. You know, the exam likes that. They like to get into that. What is the measurement focus of all these nonprofits? It's providing information for the entity as a whole. That's their focus to provide information for the entity as a whole. Now, another thing that all these nonprofits have in common is that all these nonprofits have to deal with restricted money. And this is very important. Remember, in nonprofit accounting, the word restricted has a very particular meaning. Remember, in nonprofit accounting, the only way money can be restricted is by an outsider. In other words, it has to be somebody outside the hospital. It has to be somebody outside the college. It has to be somebody outside the health and welfare organization that says, look, you can only spend my money on this item. In nonprofit accounting, that is the only way money can be restricted. It has to be by a third party. It has to be somebody outside the hospital, outside the college, that says, you can only spend my money on this item, on this project. In nonprofit accounting, that's the only way money can be restricted. And you want to keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, another thing that all these nonprofits have in common is that all these nonprofits have to deal with gifts, bequests, pledges, donations. Let's get into how these nonprofits handle donations. Let's say, for example, that one of these, one of these nonprofits could be a hospital, could be a university. Let's say one of these nonprofits receives a $100,000 gift and the money is restricted. The donor says they can only use this $100,000 to purchase equipment. So one of these nonprofits, again, a hospital, a university, whatever it is, gets a $100,000 gift, and the money is restricted to the purchase of equipment. Now, you know that when the nonprofit gets this gift, you know they're going to debit cash $100,000. We know that. Now I want to talk about this. Before we get into what they credit, let's go back to governmental for a minute. Remember we said in modified accrual, if a governmental unit receives any kind of restricted money, like a grant, in modified accrual, the governmental unit is not allowed to recognize that restricted money as revenue until when? That's right, until they spend it, until they spend it for the intended purpose, until they meet the terms of the grant. I know you remember that. But I want to remind you that that's a rule in modified accrual. These nonprofits aren't following modified accrual. These nonprofits don't follow the GASB. So this is a, a major difference. When one of these nonprofits receives restricted money, it's revenue immediately. 
its revenue immediately when they collect it or even when it's promised, when it's pledged. So we're going to debit cash 100000 and the nonprofit is going to credit temporarily restricted revenue 100000 But notice the revenue is, is recognized immediately. These, when these nonprofits receive, restri receive restricted money, any kind of restricted money, it is recognized as revenue immediately when it's collected or even when it's promised, when it's pledged. It's revenue immediately. So notice the credit is to temporarily restricted revenue, 100000 Now, let's say that at y by year end, the nonprofit has still not purchased the equipment. So what they basically do at year end, if they haven't purchased the equipment, they would debit temporarily restricted revenue, 100000 close that out, and credit net asset temporarily restricted. And that account, net asset temporarily restricted, that's a balance sheet account. And we'll look at the balance sheet in a little bit. But that's basically what they do. If they haven't spent the money for the intended purpose, then they'll debit temporarily restricted revenue, 100000 close it out, and credit net asset temporarily restricted, a balance sheet account, 100000 Now, let's say the following year, they go out and they purchase the equipment. Well, we know that all these nonprofits carry their own fixed assets, so if they purchase the equipment, they'll debit equipment, 100000 credit cash, 100000 and now that they have used the money for the intended purpose, they will debit, basically, that net assets temporarily restricted, that balance sheet account, debit net assets temporarily restricted, 100000 and credit net assets released from restriction, 100000 And that account, net assets released from restriction, that is an income statement account. That's a revenue-type item on the income statement, and we'll look at that income statement in a moment. But they credit net assets released from restriction. And as I say, that account is an income statement account, a statement of activity account, which we will look at. I just think that that is a very important sequence of entries because all the nonprofits deal with gifts, bequests, pledges, money that's promised to them, and it's revenue immediately when it's collected or even when it's promised, when it's pledged. Let's get into pledges. Because all these nonprofits, remember, we're still talking about what all these nonprofits have in common. And another thing that all these nonprofits have in common, they deal with pledges. So let me give you an example. Let's say that a private not for profit hospital could be a college, could be health and welfare, any nonprofit. But let's say that a private not for profit hospital has a pledge drive. And on December 31, the hospital receives $500,000 worth of pledges. 200,000 of the pledges have some sort of restriction. The person says, you can only use my money to buy kidney dialysis machines. Or the person says, you can't use my money till 2034. Oh, they'll love you for that. But it could be a time restriction. You can't use my money till 2057. Could be a time restriction. But 200,000 of those pledges have some sort of restriction. 300,000 of the pledges have no restriction whatsoever. Now, based on past experience, They've had pledge drives before, and based on past experience, they expect to collect 100% of the restricted pledges, but they expect 50,000 of the unrestricted pledges to be uncollectible. So again, they've had, pledge drives, they've had pledge drives in the past. Based on past experience, they do expect to collect 100% of the restricted pledges, but 50,000 of the unrestricted pledges they expect to be uncollectible. Well, here's the point. Bottom line is this. Pledges must be recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. Again, pledges must be recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. In the year the pledge is made. So on December 31, when the hospital receives those pledges, they'll debit pledges receivable, 500000 If you think some of the pledges... Is if you think some of the pledges are not collectible, no big deal. You would credit allowance for uncollectible pledges for the 50000 So if you think some of the pledges are not going to be collected, set up an allowance for uncollectible pledges. So we'll credit allowance for uncollectible pledges, 50000 credit unrestricted revenue for the 250000 and credit temporarily restricted revenue for the 200000 That would be the entry that would be made because pledges must be recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. And as I say, all these nonprofits have to deal with pledges. 
Another thing that all these nonprofits have in common is that all these nonprofits sometimes have to deal with donated services. You know, for example, let's say a group of nuns donated donated nursing services to a private not-for-profit hospital. This can happen in nonprofits. What the exam is going to ask you is, would the nonprofit, would the hospital record that donation? The answer is yes if it meets the following criteria. Make sure you know the criteria. So again, the answer is yes, donated services would, should be recorded by a nonprofit as a donation if it meets the following criteria. Number one, the fair market value of the service can be determined. So that's number one. The fair market value of the service has to be determined. And either, and either, the skills that are being donated are skills the nonprofit would have had to pay for otherwise, or non-financial assets have either been created or enhanced. I'll go over that again. They ask you, would donated services be reported by a nonprofit as a donation? Yes, if it meets this criteria. First, the fair market value of the service can be determined. So the fair value of the service has to be determinable. And either, either the skills that are being donated are skills the nonprofit would have had to pay for otherwise, or non-financial assets have either been created or enhanced. Make sure you know the criteria for donated services. Another thing that all these nonprofits have in common is they all follow the basic same reporting model. Let's go over the reporting model that all these nonprofits have to follow. All these nonprofits have to do a statement of financial position, basically a balance sheet. And what I want to look at with you is just a very simplified version of this. We don't have to look at a really elaborate, detailed example of this. Let's just break it down. When you do a statement of financial position for any of these nonprofits, as I say, it's basically a balance sheet. And what you'll do is take all the assets, and let me say, including fixed assets with accumulated depreciation. Remember, all these nonprofits carry their own fixed assets and they depreciate their own fixed assets. So the assets would include fixed assets with accumulated depreciation. Also, the assets would include the nonprofit's investments, all recorded at fair value. And by the way, a nonprofit is not drawing a distinction between held to maturity and available for sale and trading. All the investments are recorded at their fair market value, carried at fair market value. So you take all their assets minus all their liabilities, and the liabilities would include bonds payable, long-term notes payable. We know they carry their own long-term debt. So you take all their assets minus all their liabilities. But I want you to remember that the basic thrust of this statement, the focus of this statement, is to show at year end what is the balance in three net asset positions? What is the balance in net assets unrestricted? What is the balance in net assets temporarily restricted? And what is the balance in net assets permanently restricted? That's really the focus of this statement now, to show at year end, you know, at December 31, what is the balance in those three net asset positions? What is the balance in net assets unrestricted? What is the balance in net assets temporarily restricted? And what is the balance in net assets permanently restricted? What you're already seeing is that really all of nonprofit accounting is organized around one principle. Is the money restricted or is it unrestricted? That's really, that's really the case. All of nonprofit accounting gets organized around that, that one guiding principle. Is the money restricted or is it unrestricted? And you can see it in the statement of financial position. Now, all these nonprofits have to do a statement of activity, basically an income statement. Let's look at a very simplified version of it. When you do a statement of activities for any of these nonprofits, you start with all their revenues, that unrestricted revenue and restricted revenue, you take all their revenues, unrestricted and restricted revenue, then you would add any net assets released from restriction. Remember, that's a revenue type item. And we looked at the entries in terms of how that account comes into being. But 
you would take all their revenues, restricted and unrestricted, you would add any net assets released from restriction, you would add up all the revenue items, you would deduct all the expenses, and the expenses would include depreciation expense, interest expense, right? They depreciate their own fixed assets, they service their own long-term debt, so expenses would include depreciation expense, interest expense, you basically deducting any expense that a profit-making company would deduct. But here's the point of this statement. The focus of a statement of activity is to show for this accounting period what was the net change in those three net asset positions. What was the net change in net asset unrestricted? What was the net change in net asset with a temporary, uh, with a temporary restriction? And what was the net change in net asset with a permanent restriction? That's the thrust of this statement. Yeah, you take all the revenues minus all their expenses, but the real focus of this statement is to say for this accounting period, what was the net change in those three net asset positions? What was the net change in net assets unrestricted? What was the net change in net assets temporarily restricted? And what was the net change in net assets permanently restricted? Then finally, all these nonprofits have to do a statement of cash flows. And of course, they don't follow the GASB format. Forget that. They don't follow the GASB. They follow the FASB format you know so well. Operating, investing, and financing. Just a couple little wrinkles. When all these nonprofits do their statement of cash flows, it is the direct method. And your operating activity, just one little wrinkle, operating activity would include agency transactions. When the hospital, when the nonprofit is acting as an agent for somebody. So operating activity would include agency activity, agency transactions. Investing activity would, all, would include the purchase or sale of works of art. A couple little wrinkles you don't normally see. So again, it's the format, it's the FASB format you know so well. Operating, investing, and financing. But as I say, investing activity would include the purchase or sale of works of art. And financing activity, the one thing that's a little different there, financing activity would include any contributions that were restricted to the purchase of assets. So financing activity would include any contributions that were restricted to the purchase of assets. But all these nonprofits follow this reporting model. They have to do a statement of financial position, a statement of activity, and a statement of cash flows. And as I say, the statement of cash flows is really the FASB format that you know very, very well. We'll continue our discussion on all these nonprofits in our next class. See you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion of ONPOs, other nonprofit organizations. Let's start with a couple of questions. And number one, they say a storm damaged the roof of a new building owned by K9 Shelters, a not for profit organization. A supporter of K9, a professional roofer, repaired the roof at no charge. In K9's statement of activities, the income statement, the damage and the repair of the roof would be reported how? Well, of course, what you're dealing with in this question is something that the exam loves, and that is donated services. Remember, we talked about this. You have to remember the criteria. First, the fair market value can be determined. And either the service that's being donated or services the nonprofit would have paid, had to pay for otherwise, or non-financial assets have either been created or enhanced. You have to know the criteria. You know, we talked about the nuns donating nursing services to a private not-for-profit hospital. Your analysis would be, well, is the fair value of that service determinable? Of course it is. You know the fair value of nursing services. Are these services that the hospital would have had to pay for otherwise? Well, of course. If the nuns don't donate the nursing services to the hospital, the hospital is going to have to hire more nurses. So you would record that donation. How is it recorded? Well, basically, it's a debit to salaries and wage expense for the fair value of the services and credit revenue. It gets booked as both a revenue and an expense. In other words, in the statement of activities, it's all going to wash out. It's going to show up as both a revenue and an expense. It all washes out, but they make nonprofits do this. Why? Because of full disclosure. It's all about full disclosure. And the same thing applies to this problem. Would the fair market value of the roofing services be determinable? Of course. You could figure out the fair value of what you'd normally pay a roofer. Are these skills that the nonprofit would have had to pay for otherwise? Of course they are. 
if the member doesn't donate the roofing services, the nonprofit's going to have to hire a roofer. So how would this get booked? It would be booked as both revenue and an expense. So once again, on the statement of activities, it's just all going to wash out. But they make nonprofits do this for full disclosure. The answer here is B. This is going to be both an increase to expense and to contributions. It's an expense and revenue. All about full disclosure. Number two, December 30th, Lee Museum, a not-for-profit organization, received a $7 million donation from Day. And it says the donor stipulated the following requirements. Shares valued at $5 million are to be sold with the proceeds used to erect a public viewing building. Shares valued at $2 million are to be retained with the dividends used to support current operations. As a consequence of the receipt of day shares, how much would Lee report as temporarily restricted net assets on the statement of financial position? As we've said already in these classes, nonprofit accounting is really structured around this one basic concept. Is the money restricted or is it unrestricted? And if there is a restriction, is it a temporary restriction or is it a permanent restriction? The first shares valued at $5 million are to be sold with the proceeds used to erect a public viewing building. This item brings up a concept that you have to be aware of. I want you to listen carefully. If a, this is in the exam a lot. If a nonprofit gets any kind of donation that's restricted to the purchase of an asset or the construction of an asset, in almost all cases, almost all cases, with very rare exceptions, once the nonprofit you know, buys the asset, once the nonprofit buys the building, erects the building, in almost all cases, at that point, the restriction's off. Because at that point, the nonprofit can use the asset, sell it, give it away, in almost all cases. You know, once you actually acquire the asset or construct the asset, the restriction will be off. Because as I say, at that point, the nonprofit can use the asset, give it away, sell it. So that would represent temporarily restricted net assets. But of course, the shares valued at $2 million, Notice you can only use the interest and dividends to support operations. You can never touch the principal. That's a permanent restriction. So the answer is C. We're talking about net assets with a temporary restriction would be $5 million. The $2 million would be in the statement of financial position of as net assets with a permanent restriction. Net assets permanently restricted. And while we're on a museum, there's a special rule dealing with gifts of art or antiques. You have to be aware of this too. If a nonprofit like a museum receives a gift of art or antiques, it doesn't have to be recorded at all if it meets the following criteria. Again, if a nonprofit like a museum gets a gift of art or antiques, it doesn't have to be recorded if it meets the following criteria. If first, the art or antiques are part of a collection, Number two, the collection is held for the public's benefit. And very important, number three, the intent of the nonprofit is that if any items from the collection are sold, they will use the proceeds to purchase additional items for the collection. That's the criteria you have to meet. So, again, the, the art or antiques must be part of a collection. Number two, the collection must be held for the public's benefit. And then number three, the nonprofit's intent is that if any items from the collection are sold, they will use the proceeds to purchase additional items for the collection. If you meet that criteria, a gift of art or antiques doesn't have to be recorded at all. Number three, a not-for-profit organization received $150 from a donor. The donor received two tickets to a theater show and an acknowledgement in the theater program. Tickets have a fair market value of $100. What amount would be recorded as contribution revenue? This one will make more sense if you see an entry. In this case, what entry does the nonprofit make? Well, when the nonprofit gets the donation, you know, they'll debit cash, $150. But remember, the nonprofit went out and purchased, you know, a huge group of tickets to this program, this theater show, whatever it is. So they're going to have an inventory of theater tickets. So when they get this donation, they debit cash, $150, but they'll credit their ticket inventory. 
you know, for the fair market value of the tickets, 100, and credit contribution revenue for just $50? The answer is B. That's the entry that the nonprofit has to make there. Debit cash, 150, credit their ticket inventory for the tickets worth $100, and credit the contribution revenue, just $50. In other words, the answer is not D. They don't let the nonprofit gross up their contribution revenue up to 150. No, the real revenue is just $50. Now, to this point of our discussion, what we've been talking about are things that are true in any nonprofit. We've talked about things that apply to all the other nonprofit organizations, and now I want to get more specific. Let's talk about private not for profit hospitals or healthcare entities. Now, we know that for external reporting, private not for profit hospitals, healthcare entities, have to follow the reporting model we went through in our other class. They have to do a statement of financial position, they have to do a statement of activities, they have to do a statement of cash flows. We know that. But for internal reporting, a private not for profit hospital can still use funds. And that's what I want to get into next. What I want to get into next are the funds that a private not for profit hospital can use for internal reporting. Now, before we go through the funds, let me just say what is probably obvious. All these funds are organized around one principle. Is the money restricted or is it unrestricted? Let's start with the unrestricted funds. In a private not-for-profit hospital, there's only one unrestricted fund. It's called the general fund. So again, in a private not-for-profit hospital, there's only one unrestricted fund. It's called the general fund. The general fund of a hospital accounts for money that's not restricted in any way, and what this fund does is account for the day-to-day -day operations of the hospital. So that's the general fund. It accounts for money that's not restricted in any way, and it accounts for the day-to-day -day operations of the hospital. Just a quick point. How would a hospital get unrestricted money? How does that happen? Well, of course, they get tons of it. All that money coming in for lab tests, x-rays, CAT scans, private rooms, wards, surgery, you know, all that money coming in for health care is unrestricted. You know that. You can't pay your hospital bill and say, now you can only use my money to buy bandages. Of course, you can't do that. You know, lots, all that money coming in for health care is unrestricted. So you need this general fund. Now, something I always worry about. In your mind, don't confuse the general fund of a hospital with the general fund in governmental because the names are the same, but they're very different. Let me give you some things to remember about the general fund of a, of a hospital. First of all, in the general fund of a hospital, this is where the hospital would carry its fixed assets with accumulated depreciation. So again, in the general fund of a hospital, this is where the hospital would carry its fixed assets with accumulated depreciation. Also, in the general fund of a hospital, this is where the hospital would carry its long-term debt. So you'd find accounts like bonds payable in the general fund of a hospital. Now, another point, and the exam loves this. In the general fund of a hospital, this is where you would find board-designated assets. Be careful of board-designated assets. The exam really likes this. Let's get into this for a minute. Here's what's going on with this. The governing board of a hospital can set aside assets for some project. They might want to start pregnancy counseling in the neighborhood. They might want to start nutrition counseling for new mothers, anything they want. So what the governing board of the hospital will do is set aside these assets. They'll make investments, but all the interest and dividends they make on those investments will only be used for this project, whatever it is. Nutrition counseling for new mothers in the neighborhood, whatever it is. So they set aside money, they make investments, but all the interest and dividends that they make from those investments can only be used for this project, whatever it is they have in mind. So let me ask you a question. If the interest and dividends can only be used for this project, is the money restricted or is it unrestricted? Listen very carefully. This money is restricted, but it's internally restricted by the board. They can change their mind. Remember, internally restricted money is technically unrestricted. The exam loves this game. Internally restricted money is technically unrestricted because remember, in nonprofit accounting, the only way money can be restricted is by an outsider. Don't forget that principle. In nonprofit accounting, the only way money can be restricted is by a third party, somebody outside the hospital. 
This money is restricted by the board. And as I say, they can change their mind. So let me make my point. If the hospital has any board-designated assets, they're just carried in the general fund. Notice the unrestricted fund. Also in the general fund of a hospital, you'd find agency activity. You know what that is. The hospital's acting as an agent for somebody. And if the hospital's acting as an agent, you're going to find the cash and the liability, you know, due to cardiologists, just carried in the general fund. So if the hospital's acting as an agent for somebody, if there's agency activity, you're going to find the cash and the liability, you know, due to Manette Clinic, whatever it is, just carried in the general fund. Now, another thing to keep in mind, all these funds have net asset positions. They don't have fund balances. They have net asset positions. And I'm sure you're with me. There's three possible net asset positions. There's net assets unrestricted, net assets temporarily restricted, net assets permanently restricted. What would the net asset position for the general fund be? You know, it's the unrestricted fund. So it would be net assets unrestricted. All right, now that's the only unrestricted fund that a hospital would use. Now let's get into the restricted funds. And more specifically, they're called donor restricted funds. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because the only way money can be restricted is by a donor, by a third party. So these are called donor restricted funds. The first donor restricted fund is called a specific purpose fund. The specific purpose fund accounts for gifts, bequests, grants, donations, that are restricted for operational purposes. That's, what I, that's how I would think of this. You know, gifts, donations that are restricted for operations. That's the specific purpose fund. It accounts for gifts, donations that are restricted for operations. And remember, all these funds have net asset positions. This fund would be net assets temporarily restricted. The second donor restricted fund is the plant replacement and expansion fund. The Plant Re Replacement and Expansion Fund accounts for gifts, grants, donations that are restricted for capital additions. So just think of it as grants, you know, gifts, donations that are restricted for capital additions. And again, it would have a net asset position, net assets temporarily restricted. And then finally, you have the endowment funds. And of course, the endowment funds account for money donated to the hospital. And what you have to remember here is that there are two types of endowments. The first type of endowment is called a permanent endowment or a pure endowment. Just remember with a permanent endowment or pure endowment, you can never touch the original principle. It's permanent. Let the name help. With a permanent endowment, you can never touch the original principle. You can only spend the interest and the dividends on some specified purpose. So you're talking about what? Net assets permanently restricted. That's a permanent restriction because you can never touch the original principle. And then finally, you have a term endowment. With a term endowment, after a term, after a period of time, you can spend the principle. That's a term endowment. After a term, after a period of time, you can spend the principle. So these are the funds used by a not-for-profit hospital for internal reporting. We'll continue our discussion of not-for-profit hospitals in our next class. I'll see you then. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to continue our discussion on accounting for private not-for-profit hospitals or healthcare entities. And as we said in our last class, for internal reporting, internal reporting, private not-for-profit hospitals or healthcare entities can still use funds. And in our last class, we went over the, the funds that a private not-for-profit hospital or healthcare entity can use for internal reporting. But I remind you, for external reporting, private not-for-profit hospitals still have to follow the FASB nonprofit model. So that means that they're going to have to do a statement of financial position, basically a balance sheet. And by the way, a private not-for-profit hospital does call it a balance sheet. It's called a balance sheet. And the whole point of the balance sheet is to show at year end what was the balance in those three net asset positions. What was the balance in net assets unrestricted? What is the balance in net assets temporarily restricted? And what is the balance in net assets permanently restricted? Now, 
private, not-for-profit hospitals have to do a statement of cash flows. And we know that they follow the FASB nonprofit model for external reporting. So when a private, not-for-profit hospital does their statement of cash flows, they're going to follow the FASB nonprofit model, which is the model we know and we love. Operating activities, investing activities, financing activities, right? It's the, it's the format we know so well and we're really comfortable with and we're, we, we are really used to. But I should warn you, just in case, if this were a city hospital, I'm not trying to drive you crazy, but if this were a city hospital, now wait a minute, a city hospital is connected to a governmental unit. So a city hospital, because it's connected to a governmental unit, wouldn't follow the FASB model. It would follow the GASB model. So when a city hospital does their statement of cash flows, they have to use the GASB model, the GASB format for cash flows. So, you know, it's still operating activities, investing activities. But remember, financing activities get divided into two. There's non-capital and related financing activities and capital and related financing activities. I know I'm driving you crazy, but that complication is, is there. If it's a city hospital, it's connected to a governmental unit. So city hospitals don't follow the FASB model. They follow the GASB model. So when a city hospital does the statement of cash flows, it would be the GASB format, drawing that distinction between non-capital-related financing activities and capital and related financing activities. Now, do I think the exam will try to get you on that? I actually don't. I think from the kind of feedback I've gotten from my students, I think that the CPA exam tends to draw a pretty bright line that they have all of governmental accounting to test you on the GASB. Their only chance to test you on the FASB nonprofit model is with hospitals and universities and voluntary health and welfare. So I think generally speaking, in the exam, they'll draw that bright line difference. So don't worry about it too much, but it's, it is there, and I think it's something that should be mentioned. Now, private, not-for-profit hospitals have to do a statement of activities, basically an income statement. But what's a little different is that hospitals actually turn the statement of activities into two statements. It's actually two. They do a statement of operations and then a separate statement showing the changes for the year in the net asset positions. They actually turn it into two statements, a statement of operations and then a statement showing the changes in net assets unrestricted, net assets temporarily restricted, net assets permanently restricted. So they actually divide it into two statements. Now, a little tricky thing here. And the exam tends to hit this. When a private not-for-profit hospital does that statement of operations, don't forget they divide their revenue in a statement of operations. They divide their revenue into three categories. First, there's patient service revenue. All right, now what's patient service revenue? Well, patient service revenue is what you think it is. It's all the revenue coming in for patient care. It's all the revenue coming in for lab tests, x-rays, CAT scans, surgery, outpatient, wards, anything you can think of. It's all the revenue coming in for patient care. It's patient service revenue, but this still gets tricky. You know why? Because a lot of hospitals, when they provide charity care, now what's charity care? It's providing health care without charge, say to a street person, an indigent. Some hospitals provide health care without charge. They never get paid for it. A street person comes in and they're ill. A street person, an indigent. It's called charity care. And some hospitals, just as a policy, will just bill charity care at their normal billing rate, even though there's no anticipation of getting any money for that care. So you've got to be careful. If you're in the exam and they say that in the patient service revenue, there, that does include charity care. You have to back it out because that, that's just a hospital policy. They just bill charity care at the normal billing rate, but there's never any anticipation of receiving money for that care. So it doesn't belong in there. That's what I'm saying. So if you notice charity care is inpatient service revenue, you have to back it out. Then you would also back out bad debt expense for the year. If you're going to back out bad debt expense for the year, you also back out third-party contractual adjustments. Now, what do I mean by third-party contractual adjustments? Let's say Blue Cross will pay $800 for a CAT scan. The hospital normally charges $1,000. So the hospital normally charges $1,000 per CAT scan. Blue Cross will only pay $800, and the hospital accepts that in full payment. That $200 difference would be a third-party contractual adjustment. So you'd also back out third-party contractual adjustments. So let me 
Let's, let me just give you an example to show you what I mean. Let's say a hospital's patient service revenue is $800,000. So you're in the exam, they say, patient service revenue is $800,000, but that includes $75,000 of charity care. Well, you see that charity care, back it out. There's no anticipation of ever receiving any money for that care. So you back out the charity, so that would give you patient service revenue of $725,000. Now, if they have bad debt expense for the year of $50,000, back out the 50,000, third party contractual adjustments of 150,000, back that out. When you back out the bad debt expense of 50,000 and the third party contractual adjustments of 150,000, that brings you down to 525,000. That would be called net patient service revenue. Be careful in that exam whether they just want patient service revenue. In my example, patient service revenue would be 725,000 because the charity doesn't belong in there. So they ask me in the exam for patient service revenue, it's 725000 But if they ask you for a net patient service revenue, they are picky. Well, net patient service revenue would be 525000 because I have to back out the bad debt expense for the year, and I have to back out the third-party contractual adjustments. All right, now, second category of revenue. We know the first category is patient service revenue, and you see how they can be tricky in those questions. The second category is other operating revenue. For a private not-for-profit hospital, what's considered other operating revenue? Well, if they have educational programs. Let's say they're a teaching hospital. They hold nursing classes. Let's say they hold CPR classes. Not CPA classes now. CPR classes. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation classes. You know, if they're a teaching hospital, they have educational programs. That becomes part of the normal operations of the hospital. That's other operating revenue. If they have a cafeteria, a gift shop in the lobby, a paid parking lot, other operating revenue. These become part of the day-to-day -day operations of the hospital. Don't forget specific purpose grants. Remember what those are from our last class? What are specific pur purpose grants? Grants for operations. Grants for operational purposes. That's other operating revenue. Here's where donated services would come in, right? We know the criteria. Is the fair value of the service determinable? Are these services the hospital would have had to pay for otherwise? Or are non-financial assets either created or enhanced. You apply the criteria. So, you know, you go back to those, you know, nuns that donate nursing services to a private not-for-profit hospital. Is the fair value of that service determinable? Yes. Are these services that the hospital would have had to pay for otherwise? Yes, because if the nurse, if the nuns do not donate these services, the hospital is going to have to hire more nurses. So that would be recorded as a donation. But remember how it's recorded. It's going to be a debit to salaries and wage expense and a credit to revenue. As we said in our other class, on the statement of activities, it's all going to wash out. It's not going to have any effect on the bottom line, but we have to do this for full disclosure. But my point is, yes, we debit salaries and wage expense and credit revenue. What kind of revenue is it? They can ask you that. It's other operating revenue. It's other operating revenue. Also, in this category, the fair market value of donated medicine, linen, supplies. You know, let's say a pharmaceutical house donates $100,000 worth of medicine to a hospital. This happens in nonprofit the hospital would basically debit an expense and credit revenue. It's booked as both a revenue and expense. It'll wash out in terms of the bottom line, but it must be done for full disclosure. What kind of revenue is it? Other operating revenue. Also in this category, any gifts you receive for charity. You know, if somebody actually, if somebody actually gave you money as a gift for charity care, now you're getting money. If you get a gift for charity care, that would be other operating revenue. And then finally, the third category, non-operating items. What's a, what's, what are non-operating gains and losses? Well, any unrestricted gifts, bequests, contributions, pledges. Any unrestricted gifts, bequests, contributions, pledges. That's non-operating. Any gains or losses from the sale of assets. Non-operating. You know, a hospital sells off an old x-ray machine at a gain. It's a non-operating item. Any unrestricted endowment income, that's, that's non-operating. Any term endowments that have expired, remember after a term, you can use the principal. If a term endowment has expired, that's a non-operating item. Any unrestricted interest, dividend income, investment income, non-operating. So just remember those different categories because the exam seems to, touch, seems to touch on that a lot. Let's do a couple of questions. Question number one. An organization of high school seniors performs services for patients at Lear Hospital. The patients, excuse me, the students are volunteers 
and perform services that the hospital would not otherwise provide, such as wheeling patients in the park and reading to patients. Lear spent $1,500 on a recognition banquet and awards for the volunteers. Lear has no employer-employee relationship with these volunteers. They donated 4,000 hours of service. At minimum wage, that comes out to 20600 We don't care about minimum wage. What's the fair value of that service? 25000 In Lear's statement of activities, you know, statement of operations, what amount would be reported for this donation? Well, you just go through the criteria. Is the fair value of the service determinable? It is. 25000 Are these services the hospital would have had to pay for otherwise? No. It's a very nice thing to do. Wheeling patients in the park and reading to patients, it's a wonderful thing to do. But if the volunteers didn't do this, the hospital just wouldn't have time, just couldn't possibly do it. So that, this is not recorded at all. It's not a donation. It's not recorded as a donation. The answer is D. And of course, the $1,500 recognition banquet is an expense. But there's no, there's no donated services here. In number two, Terry, an auditor, performed test work for a not-for-profit hospital. Here are the components of their operations. And at the bottom they say, what amount would be reported as total revenues, gains, and other support in the statement of operations? Remember, private not profit hospitals divide the statement of activities into two statements. There's a statement of operations and there's a statement of changes in net assets. So you're doing the statement of operations section, you're doing that part, what would be total revenues, gains, and other support? Well, you start with your net patient service revenue of 500000 but notice that, in, that includes charity care. There's $100,000 charity care in there because they just bill it at the normal rate. It's a policy. They're never going to receive money for that charity care. Back it out. The 70000 of bad debt expense. Back it out. Doesn't belong in there. So really, your net patient service revenue when you really work it out, is 330000 But they want to know total revenue, gains, and other support. So we're going to pick up the 80000 of other revenue, and we're going to pick up the 50000 of net assets released from restriction. Remember, we went over how that account comes into being. We have net assets released from restriction. That's a revenue-type item. So total revenue, gains, and other support would be 460000 Answer A. Number three, Hospital Inc., a not-for-profit hospital with no governmental affiliation. So no governmental affiliation tells you clearly they follow the FASB nonprofit model. And they give us a list of their situation and what amount would the hospital report as net patient service revenue. They want net. So to get net patient service revenue, start with the gross patient service revenue of 775000 but wait a minute, that included 25000 of charity. Back it out. Really, your gross patient service revenue here is 750000 Then you back out the bad debt expense of 15000 back out the third-party contractual adjustments of 70000 and net patient service revenue is 665000 Answer A. And then finally, number four. Typical question they'd ask in the exam. Which of the following normally would be included as other Revenues. What are other operating revenues for a hospital? And if you study the list we went over, you don't have to memorize it, but I think as long as you look at it a couple of times before you take the exam, you'll recognize it when you see it, that revenue from grants specified by the donor for research. Well, that's grants for operational purposes. That is a specific purpose grant. That's other operating revenue. Pick it up. Yes. A gift shop in the lobby. That's other operating revenue. They both are. And the answer is D. Double yes. Keep studying, and I'll look to see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this class, we're going to finish our discussion of other nonprofit organizations. And what I want to talk about next is private not for profit colleges or universities. Now, we know that for external reporting, Private, not-for-profit colleges, universities have to follow the model that we've talked about. They're going to have to do a statement of financial position, basically a balance sheet. And the whole point of that balance sheet, that statement of financial position, is to show at year end 
What is the balance in net assets unrestricted? What is the balance in net assets temporarily restricted? What is the balance in net assets permanently restricted? Private not-for-profit colleges, universities have to do a statement of cash flows. And of course, they don't follow the GASB, they follow the FASB. So when they do their statement of cash flows, it'll, it will, of course, be the FASB format that we know and we love, operating, investing, and financing. But be careful. What if it's a state college? Well, now see, if it's a state college, then it, again, it's connected to a governmental unit. No doubt it would be operated as an enterprise fund. But because it's a state college and it's connected to a governmental unit, when a state college does their statement of cash flows, they're going to follow the GASB and use the GASB format. But as I pointed out in another class, I just don't think the exam will go that way. That complication is there. That's why I feel I should mention it. But as I said in our previous class, they've got all of governmental accounting to hit you on the GASB. So I think that they pretty much split it that way. They hit you hard on the GASB in governmental accounting, and when they hit other nonprofit organizations, they're into the FASB. So when private not-for-profit colleges, universities do their statement of cash flows, we assume in the exam it would be the FASB format that we know so well. And of course, a private not-for-profit college or a university has to do with their statement of activities, their income statement, and a lot of the questions in the exam on private not-for-profit colleges have been on the statement of activities. A couple things to watch out for. When you're doing a statement of activities for a private not-for-profit college, how do you handle tuition waivers? What are tuition waivers? Well, they're cases where the university is waiving the tuition. So we're talking about scholarships, fellowships, tuition remissions. These are tuition waivers. They're all cases where you're waiving the tuition. Now, I know you know what a scholarship is. I know you know what a fellowship is. You might not know what a tuition remission is. You may know what it is, but you might not know the term. It works like this. If you're on the faculty of a university, very often your children can go to that university without charge. That is a tuition remission. It's one of the great benefits that's out there. In fact, very often, you don't have to be on the faculty if you're any employee of a university. Your children could go to that university at a reduced rate or for free. That is a tuition remission. But again, scholarships, fellowships, tuition remissions, they're all cases where the university is waiving the tuition. They're called tuition waivers. And when you're dealing with tuition waivers, there's a rule. And the rule is this. Scholarships, fellowships, tuition remissions, any kind of tuition waivers are not revenue reductions. They're not revenue reductions. I'll give you an example. Let's say a private not-for-profit college gives out $200,000 worth of scholarships. Well, if a private not-for-profit college gives out $200,000 worth of scholarships, because they have this rule, they'll book this entry. They'll debit scholarship expenditures $200,000, and they'll credit revenue $200,000. You see how weird this is? Notice that the college has to record the revenue as if the people are going to pay their tuition, and they're not. The tuition's waived. But they have to record the tuition, they have to record the revenue as if the people are going to pay their tuition. Of course, they also have a corresponding expenditure, so on the statement of activities it all washes out, but they make universities do this, and you know why. Full disclosure. Now, on the other hand, refunds are a direct reduction of revenue. I'm sure you remember when you were in college. If you signed up for a course and you withdrew within 10 days, whatever the rule was, you got a refund. The way refunds are handled would be debit revenue, say 10,000 refunds, debit revenue 10,000, credit cash 10,000. Refunds are a direct reduction of revenue. So make sure you know that rule about tuition waivers and refunds. Now also in the statement of activities, a private not-for-profit college divides their expenses into three broad categories. I think you should know these. First, there's education in general. Education in general would be expenses for instruction, in other words, faculty salaries, research, student services. That's education in general. It's expenses for instruction, faculty salaries, in other words, research, student services. And then the second category would be auxiliary enterprise. Auxiliary enterprise would be expenses for the cafeteria, the dorms, bookstores, athletic programs. Again, those are known under the heading auxiliary enterprise expenses. Auxiliary enterprise, expenses for the cafeteria, the dorms, bookstores, 
athletic program. And then finally, the, there's the third category, support. Support expenses would be management, general administrative, and the big one, fundraising. Those are support expenses, management, general administrative, and fundraising. Let's do a couple of questions. Number one says, for the summer session, Unity University assessed its students $3 million for tuition and fees. However, the net amount realized was only $2 million nine because of the following. Notice they had tuition remissions of $30,000. Well, tuition remissions, you know what those are. That's a tuition waiver. We're going to record that revenue as if the people are going to pay their tuition, even though they're not. That's a tuition waiver. We don't touch that. But the, can the, the class cancellation refund, the $70,000, that's a, a direct reduction of revenue. You basically debit revenue, credit cash. So when they ask at the bottom how much unrestricted current funds revenue from tuition and fees would Unity, Unity University report, it would be the $3 million, the assessed tuition, $3 million, minus the refunds, which are a direct reduction of revenue, $70,000, million, The answer is B. As I say, the $30,000 in tuition remissions, that's a tuition waiver. We gonna, we're going to record that revenue as if the people are going to pay their tuition. That's just a rule we have. Now, just like with private not-for-profit hospitals, a private not-for-profit college or a university for internal reporting can use funds. So just like a hospital can use funds for internal reporting, private not-for-profit private not-for-profit colleges, universities can use funds for internal reporting. Now, I don't want to go over all the funds that a private not-for-profit college can use for internal reporting, but they're in your viewer's guide. If you look in your viewer's guides, you'll see, and I'm sure they, they're getting very familiar, the kind of funds that a private not-for-profit college can use for internal reporting. But I do want to cover a couple with you. I want to talk about the plant fund because these are mentioned a lot. In a private not-for-profit college, there are four plant funds. You have to be aware what they are. Four plant funds. Let's, go, let's, let's just go over them. The first plant fund is called, again, remember, this is for internal reporting. A private not-for-profit college or a university can use funds for internal reporting. And as I say, funds that are mentioned a lot in the exam are the plant funds. And there are four of them. The first one is called the unexpended plant fund. The unexpended plant fund accumulates the money to acquire fixed assets. In other words, the unexpended plant fund accounts for gifts, bequests, pledges, donations that are restricted for capital additions. That's what it's for, the unexpended plant fund. It accounts for gifts, bequests, grants, donations that are restricted for capital additions. And all these funds have net asset positions, so we'd be talking about net assets temporarily restricted. And as always, let the name of the fund help you. Notice the money hasn't been spent yet. It's called the unexpended plant fund. In other words, all the unexpended plant fund does is accumulate the money for the acquisition of fixed assets. But they haven't spent the money yet. It's called the unexpended plant fund. Always let the name mean something to you. So all this fund is doing is accumulate, accumulating the money for the acquisition of fixed assets. The second plant fund is called the investment in plant fund. Now, the investment in plant fund does two things. First, it carries the fixed assets. Again, the investment in plant fund does two things. First, it carries the fixed assets. So this is where the university would carry its fixed assets and it also carries any long-term debt secured by the fixed assets. So it does both. It carries the fixed assets and also any long-term debt secured by the fixed assets. Let's have a little pop quiz. What do you think the net asset position would be for this one? How about the investment in plant fund? It carries the fixed assets and also any long-term debt that is secured by the fixed assets. What do you think that the net asset position would be for the investment in plant fund? Very good. Unrestricted net asset. Remember, once you acquire a fixed asset, in almost all cases, the restrictions are. Remember, once you acquire a fixed asset or construct a fixed asset, in almost all cases, at that point, there is no restriction. The nonprofit can use the asset, give it away, sell it. So we'd be talking about net assets unrestricted. Third plant fund is called the Retirement of Indebtedness Plant Fund. It's just like the debt service fund in governmental. Here it's called the Retirement of Indebtedness Plan Fund. All it does is service debt. 
and its net assets temporarily restricted. But that's all it does. It services debt. It's just like the debt service fund in governmental, but here it's a plant fund, and it's called the Retirement of Indebtedness Plant Fund, net assets temporarily restricted. And then finally, the fourth and final plant fund is the Renewal and Replacements Plant Fund. The Renewal and Replacements Plant Fund accounts for major repairs and maintenance and refurbishing. That's the Renewal and Replacements Plant Fund. It accounts for major repairs, maintenance, refurbishing, and the net asset position would be net assets temporarily restricted. So you've got to know those four plant funds. And as I say, in your viewer's guide, you can see all the funds that are used by a university for internal reporting, and they'll seem very familiar to you. Look at question number two. A college's plant funds group includes which of the following subgroups? Well, you know that the renewal and replacements, that's a plant fund. The retirement of indebtedness, that's a plant fund, but not the restricted current fund, no. So just the answer is A, just the first two would be plant funds, answer A. Now, if you look at that third one, restricted current fund. Now, we didn't cover all the funds used by a university for internal reporting. As I say, they're in your viewer's guide. But even though we didn't cover it, what do you think that fund is used for? The name tells you everything. If it's called the restricted current fund, it tells you that it, the money's restricted and it accounts for current operations. You know, the names mean something. So even though you say, oh, I never, I've never heard of that fund, I don't know what it does, look at the name. It's called the Restricted Current Fund. Why? Because the money's restricted, and you have to use the money for current operations. So the names are very telling. Number three, the Board of Trustees of Rose Foundation designated 200000 for college scholarships. Now, notice what we're dealing with here is board-designated assets. Remember we talked about board designated assets in hospitals but i want you to know that any nonprofit can have board designated assets that's not unique to hospitals any nonprofit can have board designated assets in other words the governing board of a university can set, set aside assets for some project they might want to start tutoring on campus they might want to start counseling on campus for troubled students anything they want but just be aware that any nonprofit can have board designated assets. So the Board of Trustees of the Rose Foundation designated 200,000 for college scholarships. The foundation received a bequest of 400,000 from the estate of a benefactor who specified that the bequest was to be used for hiring teachers to tutor handicapped students. What amount would be accounted for as restricted resources? Well, the answer is C, just the 400,000 is restricted because that's by an outsider, by a third party. That's by a benefactor who said, you have to use the money to hire teachers. That's restricted. But of course, the board designated asset, board can change their mind. That's internally restricted money, and internally restricted money is technically unrestricted. So of course, it's answer C. Number four, what describes a private nonprofit university's internally designated assets? Once again, we're talking about board designated assets. I want to emphasize that to you, that any nonprofit can have board designated assets. Now, what they're asking here is the income from which will be used to, for some specified purpose, and they want to know where we'd find the board designated assets. And I just wanted to do this question to say to you that when a university has board designated assets, they're carried down in the endowment fund, and there's a special endowment for board designated assets. It's called the quasi endowment, answer C. So if a university has board designated assets, they, the, it's carried in the endowment fund, and there's a special endowment just for board designated assets, and that is the quasi endowment, answer C. Let's talk about voluntary health and welfare organizations. Now, first of all, what is a voluntary health and welfare organization? Well, rather than give you a big definition, just remember Red Cross. You know, the Red Cross is a voluntary health and welfare organization. That's one we all know. The United Way is a voluntary health and welfare organization. These are ones we all know. Now, one thing you'll like is that voluntary health and welfare organizations have to follow the FASB. There's no GASB possibility here. It's got to be the FASB. So we know that for internal reporting, for internal reporting, a voluntary health and welfare organization can still use funds, and they're in your viewer's guide. If you look in your viewer's guide, you'll see a list of the funds 
that a voluntary health and welfare organization can use for internal reporting. But for external reporting, a voluntary health and welfare organization still has to follow the FASB model, and we know what that is. They're going to have to do a statement of financial position, basically a balance sheet, showing at year end what is the balance in those three net asset positions. They're going to have to do their statement of cash flows. And when a voluntary health and welfare organization does their statement of cash flows, it has to be the FASB format. A GASB format's not even possible. It's got to be the FASB format, operating, investing, and financing. Now, we know that a voluntary health and welfare organization has to do a statement of activities, their income statement. And that's a lot of questions in the exam on voluntary health and welfare are on the statement of activities, the income statement. But I also want you to remember that a voluntary health and welfare organization has to do a fourth statement called the statement of functional expenses. So a voluntary health and welfare organization has to do a fourth statement called the statement of functional expenses. So what we're going to zero in on is the statement of activities and the statement of functional expenses. Let's talk about the statement of activities. When a voluntary health and welfare organization does their statement of activities, they draw a distinction between revenue and support. Make sure you know this, because the exam likes this. Again, a voluntary health and welfare organization, in their statement of activities, they draw a distinction between revenue and support. Let's go over it. To a voluntary health and welfare organization, what is revenue? Revenue would be, you know, program revenue, revenue from the program, membership dues, fees for services, dividend, interest, investment income. That's revenue. To a voluntary health and welfare organization, that's what revenue is. Program revenue, revenue from the program, membership dues, fees for services, interest, dividend, any kind of an investment income. That's revenue. Now, support is public support, contributions, gifts, bequests, pledges, and don't forget special events like a casino night. That's support. Just think of it as public support. Contribution, gi contributions, gifts, bequests, pledges. And as I say, don't forget special events like a casino night. It's public support. And then finally, a voluntary health and welfare organization has to do a fourth statement called a statement of functional expenses. And in the statement of functional expenses, they divide their expenses into two broad categories. First, there are program expenses. What are program expenses? Expenses to run the program. That's what program expenses are. Hey, what are the expenses to run the program? What's the program? Is it research? Is it education? Is it health? What were your expenses to do what you're there to do? What, it, what are the expenses to achieve your mission? Expenses to run the program. Those are program expenses. What is your, what is your program? What is your, what is your mission? Is it research? Is it education? Is it health? And then finally, there are support expenses. What are support expenses? General, administrative, and the big one, fundraising. That's the big one. Now, I know that you know, you're probably just trying to get used to all this, but that's a very important statement, the statement of functional expenses. For example, let's say you were thinking of making a contribution to a voluntary health and welfare organization. So you call up. And you say, would you please send me your statement of functional expenses? And it's public information. They'll send it. Oh, yeah, please send me your statement of functional expenses. So they do. And here's what you find. You find that 99% of their expenses are support, 1% of program. Okay? When you look on their statement of functional expenses, 99% of their expenses are support. 1% is program. You're going to make a contribution? I want to see if I understand this. 99 cents out of every dollar I give you, you're going to use to raise more money. Just a penny gets to the people I'm trying to help. No, it's a, no, you probably would not make a contribution. That's a very important statement. I want to make another point. If you're in the exam and they bring up any nonprofit that I haven't mentioned, in other words, you know, a church, you know, you never know what they're going to bring up. They make up some nonprofit, a church, a labor union, any nonprofit that's not governmental, if it's not state and local governmental units, which we talked about, then you assume it falls in this category. You, you, it's, an, it's an ONPO, it's other nonprofit organization, and just assume it follows the voluntary health and welfare model we just went through. So any other nonprofit I didn't mention, if, in other words, if, if it's not governmental, if it's not a hospital, if it's not a college, not a university, well, you just assume it's in this category. Voluntary health and welfare, and it just, you just follow this model. Let's do a couple of questions. 
Number five says a labor union, voluntary health and welfare. A labor union had the following expenses. They have expenses for labor negotiations, fundraising, membership, development, and admin. In the statement of activity, what amount would be reported under the classification of program services? What are program services? Expenses to run the program. If you're a labor union, what's your program? What's your mission? Is it labor negotiations? Yes. And the answer is D. Everything else is support. I hope you see that. That's what program expenses are. What is your program? What is your mission? Well, if you're a labor union, your program, your mission is labor negotiations. So that, that would be program services. Everything else would be support. Number six, during the current year, a voluntary health and welfare organization receives 300000 in pledges. Of this amount, 100000 has been designated by donors to be used next year. That's a restriction. It's a time restriction. You know, if I say you can't use my money till 2057, oh, they'll love me for that, but that, it's a time restriction. That is a restriction. They say that if 15% of the unrestricted pledges are, they say 15% of the unexpected pledges, 15% of the unrestricted pledges are expected to be uncollectible. What amount of unrestricted support would the organi organization recognize? Well, think about the entry. What do we know about pledges? We know that pledges must be recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. Remember, that's the rule. Pledges are recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. So when the Voluntary Health and Welfare Organization receives these pledges, think about the entry. They're going to debit pledges receivable for 300000 Now, if you, and you're going to credit, you're going to credit temporarily restricted revenue, 100000 Remember that 100000 has a restriction. It's a time restriction. Can't use the money until next year. So you're going to credit temporarily restricted revenue, 100000 That's a restriction. Now, of the unrestricted pledges, they expect 15% will be uncollectible. Well, you have to set up an allowance for uncollectible pledges. So take 15% of 200,000, credit allowance for uncollectible pledges, 30,000, and credit unrestricted support for 170,000. So that's the entry. Debit pledges receivable, 300,000. Credit the temporarily restricted revenue or support, 100,000, because there's a restriction there. If 15% of the unrestricted pledges are not going to be collected, Take 15% of 200,000, credit allowance for uncollectible pledges, 30,000, and credit unrestricted revenue or support, 170,000. So when they ask me here at the bottom, what is unrestricted revenue or unrestricted support? The answer is D. Remember, support is public support. Gifts, bequests, pledges, special events. So the answer is D. Watch out for restrictions. And remember, pledges are recorded at their fair market value and recorded as revenue in the year the pledge is made. Number seven, a voluntary health and welfare organization received a cash donation in year one from a donor specifying that they can't use the money until year three. It's a time restriction. The cash donation would be accounted for as what? Answer A, it's revenue in year one. Remember, restricted revenue. When money is restricted, it's recorded as revenue immediately when you collect it or even when it's promised, when it's pledged. So that would be revenue right away in year one. That concludes our discussion of nonprofit organizations. Don't fall behind. Keep up with your studying, and I'll see you in the next class. Welcome back. In this, our last class, I want to share a few final thoughts with you. And the first thing I'd like to get into is how you time the exam. And I get into this because how you time the exam is a critical part of your performance. And let's be honest, in any big exam like this, one of the things that's being tested is what kind of exam taker you are. It's unavoidable. And my point is, good exam takers, which is what I want you to be, of course, good exam takers have a game plan. Good exam takers think about how they're going to time the exam long before they take the test. As I say, they have a game plan. Bad exam takers get into the test and react to it. That's what we want to avoid. Now, timing is particularly critical with financial accounting and reporting because I really believe of the four parts of the exam, financial accounting and reporting, timing is the tightest. It's the sort of feedback 
you get from students. And let me get right to it. The big danger in financial accounting and reporting is that a student will not monitor, not monitor their time carefully, fall behind in the multiple choice, so that when they get to the last testlet with the simulations, they're behind their time, and that makes the simulations infinitely more difficult. If you're pressed for time, that last testlet where they have the simulations becomes a much bigger nightmare. So since it's so critical to have a game plan, let's think about a game plan. I suggest this. We know when you start the exam, you're going to have to deal with three multiple choice test lists. I say this. Plan on spending no more than 50 minutes on each test list. That's going to be your game plan. 50 minutes on each multiple, multiple choice test list. So if you work it out, testlet number one, it's got 30 multiple choice in it, 50 minutes, it's about 1.6 minutes, a little bit more than one and a half minutes per question. 10 questions every 16 minutes, basically. That's the pace you're working. And I don't know how that pace sounds, but it's a fairly rapid pace. But you're not trying to time each question. You don't have to time each 10. No, the real game plan is, at the end of 50 minutes, I'm done with the first test list. At the end of another 50 minutes, I'm done with the second test list. So another 30 multiple, multiple choice is done. At the end of the third test list, I'm done at the end of 50 minutes. Let me ask you this. Would I guess on some questions if I had to so that I'm done after 50 minutes? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. You, you have to stick to this guideline. That's going to be your game plan, and you're going to stick to it. Remember, there are experimental questions in the test. There are questions that they're trying out for future exams. They're not worth anything. You don't know which ones they are. You know, you're a guinea pig that day. You know, they're, they're testing questions out on you. So the ultimate insult would be to get all caught up in a multiple choice, spend 10 or 15 minutes on it, and even if you get the answer, it's not worth anything. If it's an experimental question, it doesn't even count towards your score. That's the ultimate insult. So, you know, if you're in that test and you see some question that, gee, I, I don't remember Bob talking about this. I don't remember this coming up in the homework. I've never seen anything like this before. You know what you do with that question? You guess and you move on. Now, obviously, I don't want guessing to get out of control. But if I had to guess on a few questions, because I had to, so that I don't go past 50 minutes for the first testlet, and I don't go past 50 minutes for the second testlet, and I don't go past 50 minutes for the third testlet. That's my game plan, and I stick to my game plan. So if you add it up, you see where we are. Financial is a four-hour exam. We have 240 minutes to play with. If we spend 50 minutes on each of the first three testlets, we've used 150 of those minutes. That means when I open the final testlet with the simulations, I have 90 minutes remaining. And that's really the game plan. When you open that last testlet, I want you to have at least 90 minutes remaining. A little bit more would be great, but no less than 90. Now, let's get into the last testlet. You open up the last testlet, there are seven simulations. One of those simulations will be a research question. The other six will be larger accounting type problems. Perhaps schedules you have to fill in, text you have to read. Anything is possible. So you open up that last testlet, you have 90 minutes, at least 90 minutes, and no less than 90 minutes remaining. So think how that works out. You start with the research question. That's what I would do. Start with the research question. You spend no more than, say, five or six minutes on the research question. So that leaves you. 84 minutes for the remaining six testlets, which are, again, larger accounting problems. That means you have 14 minutes for each of those simulations. You stick to that guideline as well. Don't get up. You have, your timing doesn't stop because you're in the last testlet. You don't want to spend more than 14 minutes on each of the remaining six simulations. 
Now, another point. Does it matter what simulation you do first? Again, I'd like you to do the research question first. But beyond that, does it matter which one you do next? It does matter. It matters a lot. There's something else I want you to do in the last test year. Before you work on the last six test years, excuse me, the last six simulations, before you work on those, I want you to scan them over. I want you to just quickly look at each one, get a sense of what each one is about. Maybe the first one's on consolidations. Maybe the next one's on inventory. Whatever. But you scan over the remaining six problems. And I want you to do an evaluation. I want you to divide them into three categories. The two that you feel the best on. This is a very personal thing. Maybe you feel really good on leaky. Maybe you feel really good on consolidation. It's individual. But you look at those remaining six simulations, and you isolate them into three categories. The two that you feel the best on. The two that you know from it, you, the, this is material you're very comfortable with. They don't look that bad. Looks like I'll be able to handle those two really well. That's the best category. Then the two you feel middle of the road on. They're not your best, but they're not your worst. You're in the middle somewhere. And then the two that scare you. The two that you're sort of dreading that you have to do. All right, so once you've decided how they break out, once you break them into those three categories, which ones do you do first? The ones you feel best on. Start with the ones you feel best on. Part of this thinking is that you get the grading points you know you can get. You've got to get those in your pocket before you deal with more difficult things. So you get those first two done that you feel best on. Now where would you go? The ones in the middle. Get those next two done. And then finally, you're going to finish the exam with the two that scare you the most. And you do a final breakdown there as well. Look at those final two when you get into the worst category, the final category. Decide the one you feel absolutely the worst on. Do the other one. Get the other one done. In other words, the thinking is, if time runs out on the, on the test, you should be working on the thing you feel the least comfortable with when time runs out. All the grading points that you were comfortable with, all the points you knew you could get, you got those long ago. They're in your pocket. Time runs out in that exam. You're working on what scares you, what you feel the least comfortable with. Now, you know what I hope. I hope you get the whole exam done, and time does not run out on you. You get the whole thing done. Time didn't turn out to be much of an issue. You got the whole thing done. You had a few minutes left over. That would be ideal. But it doesn't necessarily work like that. And if time does run out for you, I want you to be working on what scares you the most. This really matters. And I want to make sure that you're building into your game plan. Because good exam takers have a game plan. This is all thought through before you get there and you stick with it. I really want you to do that. There's another thing I worry about with my students. And that is that... There's a trap with the CPA exam that a lot of students fall into. And that trap is they don't take the test until they feel they're ready. I've got to warn you against that. Don't do that. Don't wait until you feel ready because you're never going to feel ready. With an exam like this, with this much material, there's, you always feel a little unsure. This, kind, this amount of material keeps you off balance. You never feel like, yes, I'm ready to tackle this thing. That feeling never comes, so don't wait for it. What you need to do with an exam like this is schedule it, set a deadline, and stick to it. Give yourself at least a week to cram. I don't think you need more than a week to cram. That's another, that's another thing I hear from my students. I hear some students talk like, oh, I'll need weeks. No, that's too much. No, you don't need weeks of cramming. You know, try this once. Try going to a library. You know, get out of your house. If you, if you try to do this in your house, the phone will ring. The TV will be on. It's not the same. Try to you know, go to a library. Put one good solid day in. You know, a good six, seven hours. You'll be amazed what you can, you can accomplish in a day like that. 
you don't need more than a good, solid week of training. Now, you know, you can't get out of work. You know, people have different situations. Maybe you might need a little more than a week if you're working long hours, something like that. But assuming that you're not swamped with work, that you can hopefully maybe even take a couple of days out of work, you don't need more than a week to cram this material. So give yourself about a week or so to cram, set the deadline, and then just go in and give it your best shot. That's how good things happen. So don't, don't talk yourself out of it. And as I say, don't wait till you feel ready. That just, that's something that will cause you to just keep postponing it. And that's not good for you. The best thing for you is to schedule it and stick to the schedule. And that's what I certainly want you to do. I know you want to get this exam out of the way. And from all of us at the BIST Review, we want to wish you the best of luck on the exam. Do a good job.